Okay, so uh, dear guests, uh, uh, domestic and foreign, uh, first of all, I wish to welcome you here in uh, Belgrade, at Belgrade at the Belvis meeting. A big thank to all of you that you have uh, come here. It's been the rough uh, and difficult last year and a half, and uh, seeing you all here face to face, it's, it, it's a great boost uh, um, in, in all ways that um, we are actually going back slowly, but going back to some normal life. So I hope um, <coughs> you will be all be satisfied. You will have uh, some great time at the, at, at the meeting, at the conference, and also in the Belgrade. And um, I wish you all a good conference and enjoyable time. And al also hope to see you in, in, in next year also. So thank you once again. And um, uh, I will start the, 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 the first lecture. I will speak in Serbian because the session is broadcasted live but any discussion or comments will be addressed in, in English also, and the slides will be in English. Okay. Uh, so, tema mog izlaganja je lečenje asimptomatskih pacijenata sa aortnom stenozom. Da li je to sljedeća ciljna grupa? Aortna stenoza je trenutno najčešća pojedinačna valvularna bolest, sa prevalencom najvećom među osobama starijih od 80 godina i nešto mređem procentu pojave kod žena u odnosu na muškarci. Najčešće pojedinačni uzrok je degenerativna aortna stenoza na terenu sistemske ateroskleroze. Značajno ređe je aortna stenoza na terenu bihuspitne aortne mavole i nakon prilažene reumatske groznice. Interesantna studija koja je publikovana pre par godina Engleska koja je pokazala da u starijoj populaciji osoba preko 65 godina praktično više ima više ima osoba sa hemodinamskim značinom valvularnom bolešću koji su nediagnostikovani odnosno na one koji su diagnostikovani. I ono što je posebno interesantno, dakle taj odnos se predikcija da će se taj odnos više nego udvostručiti u narednih 40 godina. Naravno što je značajno zbog toga što su u ovoj grupi nediagnostikovanih Najviše se nalazi pacijenata sa hemodinamskim značinim valvularnim manama, ali asimptomatski. Kratak podsjetnik samo, dakle, svi znate diagnostički algoritam, ekokardiografija, zlatni standard, radi procjene morfologije aortnog zaliska, površine aortnog ušće gradijenta, protoka preko aortne valvole i funkcije leve komore. Ako ovi parametri sami po sebi nisu dovoljni da definišamo težinu aortne stenoze, možemo koristiti ovaj integrisan imaging koji bi podrazumevao dobutamenski stres test, magnetnu rezonansu radi procene postojanja fibroze i miokarda i multislavisni skener za procenu stepena klasifikacije aortnog zaliska. Aktualni, još uvijek aktualni guidelansi za lečenje i diagnostiku valvalnih mana nam kažu da su upravo da je taj simptomatski status najvažniji za određivanje daljeg lečenja. Ako je pacijent simptomatski, onda je indikovana zamena aortnog zaliska, hiruška ili perkutana. Ako nije, onda je prvi sledeći parametri koji je precenjeno je ećena frakcija leve komore. I ako je ona sužena, a uzrokovana s aortnom stenozom, onda je to svakako opet indikacija za zamenu aortnog zaliska. Kod asimptomatskih pacijenata imamo još neke kriterijume kojima mogu pomoći da se eventualno odlučimo da pacijenta pošaljemo na zamenu aortnog zaliska. Dokazi nisu tako jaki, odnosno preporuka je 2, nima dokaza C ali svejedno da treba ih razmotriti. Dakle, to su pacijenti sa vrlo tesnom aortnom stenozom, pacijenti koji imaju brzu progresiju bolesti, pacijenti koji imaju značajno povećan BMP ili znake izdržene plućne hipertenzije. Američki preporuke su novije, izašle su krajem prošle godine, ali suštinski, sem nekih razlika u nivou preporuka, nemaju nikakve razlike odnosu na evropske preporuke, bar kad je u državanju reč o odluci za intervenciju kod asimptomatskih pacijenata. Ono što je interesantno jeste oni za ove pacijente, poput pacijenata koji imaju visok BMP, bez obzira što su oni klinički asimptomatski, oni ih nazivaju apparently asymptomatic, što znači na izgled asimptomatski, suštinski, verovatno simptomatski. U svakom slučaju, kad je aortna stenoza tesna i simptomatska, odluka je jasna šta se događa u slučaju da imamo tesnu izolavu na aortnu stenozu, koja je stvarno asimptomatska i sa normalnom medicinom frakcijom leve komore. Dakle, koji je to vremenski interval ako uopšte postoji kad je intervencija poželjna, kad nije prerano, a kad nije prekrasno? I sad, tokom 
toka bolesti koji je dosta dugačak ovih prvih nekoliko decenija, rizik od intervencije, ali i kvalitetne intervencije su zanemarljivi, tako da se naravno ne razmatra ništa. Ali daljom progresijom bolesti, dakle, benefit od intervencije raste i to eksponencijalno, u stvari, neproporcijalno su na porast rizika od intervencije. Nakon izvesnog vremena, postepeno, a to se poklapa sa pojemom fibroze u miokardu i popuštanjem leve komore, benefit od intervencije opada, rizik raste i u nekom trenutku sam rizik od intervencije postaje veći nego što je potencijalni benefit. U praktičnom smislu, koji je to optimalni trenutak za intervenciju, je dosta fino pokazan na ovom slajdu iz ovog editora od prošle godine, gde su, vidite, ovo levo je asimptomatska faza i podeljena na osnovu preporuka, odnosno na osnovu rada koji idešao pre par godina o staging aortic stenosis, dakle na tri dela, ovo desno je simptomatski period, ovaj asimptomatski, znači ovaj deo A označava pacijente koji imaju tjesnu aortnu stenozu, nemaju simptome i nikako funkcionalno i strukturno oštećenje srca, B1 su pacijenti koji imaju funkcionalno ili strukturne promene na levom srcu, a B2 su oni koji imaju na desnom srcu. Plava linija označava, znači ono što su nam sadašnje preporuke. I šta nam one kažu? One nam kažu da je najbolje za 50 pacijenta kad postane simptomatski i to neposredno pošto se pojave simptomi. Nakon toga korist od intervencije značajno pada. Ova dash line ili ova isprekidana linija, to je ono što je hipoteza. To je ono što je, pardon, to je ono što je predmet ispitivanja nekoliko studija, a to je da li je bolje intervenisati ranije. I po ovoj hipotezi i ovom radu, dakle, vidite, već kad počnu te funkcionalne alteracije u levoj komori, levoj predkomori ili limitarnom zalisku, već počinje da raste korist od potencijalne zamene aortnog zaliska i svoj pik dolazi ovde u ovoj fazi B2, znači kad je već postoji promene na desnom srcu, bez obzira što je pacijent cerem asimptomatski. I pik je ovde, vidite, prenom što se simptomi jave. Dakle, kad počnu simptomi, već je ovde rizik u prvoj ranoj asimptomatskoj fazi potencijalno je niži nego u ovoj kasnoj asimptomatskoj fazi. Naravno, to je lakše ovako teorisati nego što je u praksi, ali suštinski ima radova i studije koje bi nam mogu pomoći da baš ovaj period odaberemo. Što se tiče praktičnih parametara koje razmatramo kad odlučujemo o intervenciji, To je, kad govorimo o riziku, to je naravno operativni mortalitet koji je definitivno postojeći i mortalitet i morbiditet koji je vezan za sam veštački zalestak, pre svega za mehanički veštački zalestak. Benefiti se odnosi naravno na prevenciju nagle srčane smrti i istriženje mortaliteta i u srca i u drugih organa koji je povezan sa odbijanjem ili odlaganjem hirurgije. Ukoliko se odlučimo da pacijenta ne lečimo interventno, nego da ga pratimo, onda to više nije samo puko praćenje i čekanje simptoma. Imamo određene metode koje nam mogu pomoći u stratifikaciji rizika. Ono se odnose na test opterećenja, pre svega radi procene pojave simptoma, na biomarkere BMP, već pomenuti, troponin, napredne ekokardiologske tehnike poput strena ili myocardial work-a, magnetne rezonance u smislu procene postojanja i težine fizika, promeni fibroznih promena u miokardu i multislicing skener u smislu određivanja stepena klasifikacija aortnog zaliska. Ono što je interesantno jeste da nijedan od ovih parametara nije ispitivan u prospektivnoj studiji u smislu određivanja optimalnog vremena za intervenciju, bilo perkutarno, bilo hiruški, već samo u nekom prognostičkom smislu pojave nekih neželjenih događaja. Jedna od studija koja upravo treba da ispita da li je magnetna rezonanca ta koja nam može pomoći u optimalnom određivanju vremena za intervenciju kod asimptomatskih pacijenata, evo i VOLV studija, i vidite njenu schemu, dakle, oni skrivnuju pacijente asimptomatske sa umiranom ili tesnom aortnom stenozom, ukoliko postoji povičen troponin ili znaci opterećenja leve komore na EKG-u, idu na magnet, ukoliko na magnetu postoje znaci midvola fibroze, oni se randomizuju na ranu hirurgiju ili na watchful waiting strategiju. Takođe bih izdvojio, nedavno je jedan novi parametr ekokardiorovski prikazan, to je myocardial work, stepen rada koji je utroši leva komara da bi istisnula krv preko suženog aortnog zaliska. I ono je u stvari ništa drugo nego napredak u odnosu na postojeći ovaj global longitudinal strain kao senzitivni pokazatelj sistone funkcije leve komore, 
oni dosta dobro korelišu, ovo su slike pojedinačno iz rada izvojene i pojedinačni pacijent, ali generalno na grupu pacijenta koji je ispitivno u studiji dobra korelacija sa globalnog intunalnom stejnom, I vidite promjena značina, dakle, ovog parametra, ovaj miokardal rurk, i to ovaj korigovanje, objasnit ću znači korigovanje, koji se značajno poboljšava nakon tavija. Dakle, značajno manji rad troši leva komora nakon što se olakša, dakle, nakon što se zameni aortni zalistak. Korigovanje je onaj koji u suštini na sistemski krni pritisak koji se uzima kao surgat za ensistorni pritisak u leve komori, dodaje i srednji gradijent preko aortnog zaliska. I ovo lepe slike jednog pojedinačnog pacijenta, koliko se taj, znači ovo je pre tavija, ovo je posle tavija, dakle je značajno poboljšanje, dakle čisto kao naznaka da ovaj parametr ima smisla, a da on nije samo u smislu nauke, nego da ima svrhu i u klinici, ovaj prvi radovi su pokazali, jer u ovoj grupi autora koji su po publiku koji ovo radi, je pokazano da prema multivalentnoj analizi, dakle uz BMP, jedino je ovaj parametr se pokazuje kao nezavisni preditor kardiovaskularne smrti u tokom godinu dana praćenja. Šta nam kažu pojedinačne studije u odnosu na asimptomatske pacijente sa aortnom stenozom, da li ih intervenisati u asimptomatskoj fazi ili ne? Dakle, prvo ograničenje, sve su studije izuzev jedne retrospektine i ima nekoliko metaanaliza baziranih na tim retrospektivnim studijama. Ovo je studija koja je pokazala da je direktno, dakle, pražeđavanje asimptomatskih pacijenta je povezano sa godinama starosti, Pacijenti koji su mlađi od 70 godina imaju bolju prognozu u odnosu na one koji su stari. Ono što je posebno teško u ovoj grupi pacijenata je detekcija simptoma, prosto zbog sedentarnog načina života. Pacijenti mogu biti simptomatski da to i ne znaju, prosto zbog redukcije svoje fizičke aktivnosti. Takođe, dakle, stepen pojave neželjenja i događaja je direktno i proporcionalan težini stenoze. Što se tiče studija koji su poredili ranu zamenu aortnog zaleska, odnosno na konzervativno lečenje, najviše ih dolazi do japanske grupe Current Registry, koji su prvu veću studiju pokazali ovde 2015. godine, primarni endpoint all cause death, dakle značajno je bolji u onih pacijenata koji su peresani u ranoj fazi, u simptomatskoj fazi, odnosno na one koji su konzervativno praćeni. Nedavno je izašla njihova, znači, desetogodišnje praćenje, gde su rezultati nastavljeni, praktično u tom smislu, prilično su dobri, dakle, ove srčan kardijak mortaliti, olkoz mortaliti, oba idu značajno u prilog rane zamene aortnog zaliska. Nekoliko metaanaliza, dakle, prva ova je pre pet godina, dakle, četiri studije, zaključak je bio tri i po puta, dakle, veći olkoz det u pacijenata sa watchful waiting strategijom, odnosu na na konzervativno lečenje. Skorija metanaliza, opet isti radovi koji su uključeni u prethodnoj metanalizu, plus tri nova retrospektivna rada. Interesantno, znači svaki od tih radova pojedinačno je pokazao korist rane zamene aortnog zaliska, a i naravno u kompoziti, dakle, opet na uzorku od skoro 4000 pacijenata. Ipak ono što treba naglasiti, to su sve retrospektivne studije, pacijenti koji su bili uključeni u konzervativnu grupu su bili stariji, bili su bolesniji, stres test nije rađen kako bi stvarno se ustanovilo jesu li ti pacijenti bili stvarno asimptomatski ili su bili simptomatski, sistematski follow-up nije rađen i studije su imali veliku heterogenost kad je u pitanju metodologija. Nedavno je prošle godine izašla prva randomizivana studija, korejska studija, dakle recovery trial, primarni end point je bio operativni mortalitet ili death from cardiovascular causes i značajno je, dakle, ovaj grafikon ovde se vidi, dakle, ovo je rana hirurgija, ovo ovde je konzervativno lečenje. Dakle, interesantno, oni su praktično u ovom primarnom end pointu, u ovoj rani hirurgiji imali samo jednog jedinog pacijenta koji je imao događaj. Bez obzira što je bila randomizovana studija, ova studija ima neka ograničenja, dva pacijenta, po ovom mišljenju nekako najvažnija su to da opet nije rađen test opterećenja kao dokaz da li su ti pacijenti stvarno asimptomatski, već je dobar deo njih bio samo na osnovu anamneze. I drugo ono što je neobičajno, a svakako nije karakteristično za Evropu i Ameriku, to je da je više od 65% pacijenata u toj studiji imalo aortnu stenozu na terenu bivelarne aortne vavule. I profil ti pacijenata svakako se razlikuje od profila pacijenata koji ima aortnu stenozu degenerativnog tipa, dakle kao posljedice sistemske ateroskleroze ali u svakom slučaju, dakle, rezultati su jasni i idu u prilog rane hirurgije. Šta je ono što nam sledi, to je, imamo nekoliko studija koji su u toku, dakle, Avatar, Danska nacionalna studija, Early Tavi i Vold, već pomenuti, iz IAS, koja je najveća, koja je tek trenula najveća po broju pacijenata, svi oni ispituju 
dakle, hiruško ili perkutanu zamenu narodnom zalesku u asimptomatskoj fazi i rezultati se očekuju. Dok ne dođu ti rezultati, mi možemo samo da radimo, da predvidimo, ne možemo, teško je, ono što bi rekao Nils Bohr, ali imamo opciju za stratifikacije rizika, što nam može pomoći. Ono što je važno naglasiti jeste da do tada, dakle, za sve pacijente koji imaju hemodinomske značajne valvularne mane, pa javortnu stenozu, a pogotovo za one koji su asimptomatski, jer njima, bar u nekom kvalitativnom smislu, možemo najviše naškoditi, važno je da se svaki case obradi, dakle, u okviru CAR tima na individualnoj bazi, kako bi se donela najbolja odluka za pacijenta, naravno, uz poštovanje i odluke, odnosno želje samog pacijenta. Eto, hvala vam na pažnji. If there is any questions or discussion or whatever it's... We can... Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to ask if you know which... What type of population, how many patients are in this group of patients with severe non-symptomatic AS? Because if we... I like this idea of very uh, watchful waiting, active watchful waiting with, with screening and, and, and MRI, but how many patients you expect maybe within this, this, this group of patients? Uh, how many asymptomatic patients within severe arthritis stenosis patients? Uh, well, there, the different, yeah, 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 there are some data, they are, they are actually uh, uh, not uniform, but um, it's, it's, be it's between um, around 25 to 30% as, uh, as uh, I have read. But also, th there, are, there, are, there are data that, that, that is less than 15%, and there are data that there is uh, above 30%. So, but I think this is this is um, this shows the pictures quite quite good. So, if the study is positive, it means that we have a lot of work with the patients yeah. because many yeah, patients that, that will come that, for follow-up. That was one of the also issues when starting all the, the, the trials. If if trials uh, sh all the trials uh, or, or, or some of the trials shows the positive effect of early AVR in the asymptomatic phase then there will be a, a lot of patients who will be on the waiting list. And we already have patients on the waiting list, both, both for the surgical AVR and for the TAVI. But then again, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, the prognosis of these patients, essentially, I it's not good. I mean, it's not, we, we already knew that it, it wasn't good in symptomatic phase, but I think that the, the studies, that the asymptomatic trials that are ongoing will show that also these data are not so, not so uh, one way or, or clear as, as we thought uh, before. This is fine. Uh, always dobro, no? uh -huh, okay. Thank you for a very nice presentation, really, and clear. So can I ask you about the, these uh, studies and uh, how do you plan them? I mean, uh, from the design point of view. So you have the asymptomatic patients and then you randomize them to surgery on conservative uh, arm. Mm -hmm. And then in the conservative arm, the patients get symptoms. And then as you have showed this, they go to operation and they are doing fine. So how the, the, the studies are designed concerning the, the operation and the outcome in terms of the getting the operation in the quite good moment, as you've shown, you know, when you get the symptomatic, then you get the surgery, and then you are doing good. Yeah. Well, it's I'm just asking about the other designs yeah, well, of the study they're, and they're your study and all that. Yeah, after the, the, the majority of the studies, as I know, after the randomization, they have scheduled the, the surgery within, within two or three months, or, or, or TAVI, whatever, it's, uh, it's within, mostly within eight weeks. But those patients who randomize to, 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 to watchful waiting strategy, once they become symptomatic, they do not have the fast lane to the, to the aortic valve replacement. They go with the regular, regular pet. So because we, you have to compare the, 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 what, what do you, the thing that you expect is going to uh, bring the benefit and the, the regular practice. So uh, I don't know how, how much... Uh, how much is it going to be in all those studies, the, the, the uh, time from the symptom onset to the aortic valve replacement in the control groups, but in the, in the AVR groups, it should be, it should be soon. It, it's, it's known that once you become symptomatic, the desired time between the, the symptoms and the surgery should not, should not be above the three months, but in the majority of countries, it's impossible because of the long wait waiting list. 
And also here, the, the same problem now, especially in, in, in uh, I think, Great Britain. So they have also long waiting lists for, for TAVI. So um, we'll see how, 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 how goes that. But, and the important thing of, with regard to the design is to have the hard endpoints. So it's, it's, it's not easy to define them, especially there are a number of, uh, some, or a number of papers or studies that design the primary endpoint uh, article related to hospitalizations. But that's, that's, in my opinion, that, that's a bias. So it's, it's, it's not hard enough. It's not, it's not s same if you have severe heart failure and you have just, just chest pain or, or syncope and you go into the hospital, stay for two days and, and go out. So it's, it's not easy. Yeah. And one more question, sorry, about uh, um, fibrosis and the magnetic resonance. What is the definition of the significant fibrosis? And, uh, I, I don't know in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, regard, with regard to the amount of fibrosis, but yeah. the, significant, the significant is mid-wall fibrosis, not diffuse fibrosis. Any fibrosis? The diffuse fibrosis is re reversible. Is, so yeah, after okay. the surgery, it might, it might disappear. But mid-wall fibrosis, maybe you can uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but mid-wall fibrosis is pr practically irre irreversible. So that means if there is existing mid-wall fibrosis, the, the chance that it is going to disappear totally it's, uh, okay. it's, it's not high. Yeah. Well, this nice lecture, I think it's very useful for a clinical point of view, and yeah. the questions is not for you, because you nicely show for our guests. If you have asymptomatic aortic stenosis, which likes, looks severe, will you do any provocative test? Can you answer for that? Or do you think according to your experience and um, I, th I think that's a very good question because uh, being symptomatic or asymptomatic, we, are, we depend on what the patient tells us. So I think if the patient tells us he doesn't have any symptoms, uh, I think we should ask the patient about his lifestyle. What, what do you do in your daily life? If the patient is homebound and just moves between the kitchen and the living room, he may be not truly asymptomatic, but if the patient tells us he goes walking and hiking and, and, and cycling and he doesn't feel anything, I tend to believe him. So I think if we learn from the, uh, from the history of the patient that he doesn't move and exercise and doesn't provoke the symptoms, I think we should, and if it's severe aortic stenosis and maybe we already see some LV remodeling, I think we should go for an exercise test and, uh, and see if he's really exercising without uh, symptoms. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's the same strategy. I think many patients are simply not uh, doing their best. They are homebound, and that's 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 the that's the, the the problem. But stress test is probably something we we should consider very strongly in patients who can who can actually uh, complete the stress test because of other morbidities. But what, uh, thanks. Um, what will be the the point when you will suggest MRI? or CT for those patients? Is there any, any uh, like cutoff uh, when you see the asymptomatic patient in your echo cabinet or whatever, and when you will tell him, despite the fact that you don't have uh, symptoms, you need to go for MRI or uh, CT? Well, first, I, I, I try to start with, with uh, anti-pro BNP. I assess the LV hypertrophy if it's uh, severe, then it suggests higher degree of, of obstruction. So probably it's not for everybody, for, but for patients who uh, who have uh, echocardiographic uh, signs of uh, LV overload and, and hypertrophy, elevated anti-pro BNP, some uh, uh, ambiguity in the in the assessment of the symptoms. This probably uh, the the MRI would be. Consider, but it's not in our uh, in our practice. It's not routine. It's actually examined now, so it's a, it's this evolved trial. So that, that's the basic. They 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 stratify. They see the the, the signs of EKG hypertrophy um, uh, of LV, LV hypertrophy. And they see the increased levels of troponin in asymptomatic patients, and they say, okay, this is the time to send patients to the MRI. So and if there are signs of well, myocardial fibrosis. Then we will, then we will randomize patients and send him either to the artificial replacement, or watchful waiting. Probably one of the first steps would be to to consider the longitudinal strain because the MRI is not for every patient. It's not that much available, 
so so probably it would be useful to to have somebody experienced with the more advanced eco. Okay, thank you. Due to the sake of time, we have to move forward. Uh, do we have Giuseppe? And yes. Okay, so. Um, Next speaker is uh, Giuseppe Biondizokai from Rome. Giuseppe, do we, can we see you? Hello, Giuseppe. Hi. Hi, I was nice seeing the presentation and it's a, it's a pleasure being here. For the sake of time, I would uh, move on. I guess you can see my screen, am I right? Yeah, yeah. Fantastic, so I will move on now. So basically, uh, the, 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 the topic of the lecture is uh, the key comparison between uh, different Octavi devices uh, and the fact that we have a number of trials and studies uh, which provide uh, some heterogeneous results. So this is my disclosure. So there are a number of features. When we need to pick a given device for a given patient, we need to recognize that there are many features we should consider for the decision. For instance, the expansion mechanism, which may, which may be more or less forgiving for for example, an inexperienced operator, frame designing feature, position and reference to analogs, repositionability features, retrievability, range of sizes, uh, the presence or absence of a skirt for leak prevention, the features of the tissue, which may differ from uh, one device to another, suitability for pure regurgitation or mixed disease, and of course, at least as I come from a, a region in Italy, which is uh, famous for people being uh, very, uh, you know, picky, is cost. So other key aspects, uh, which are more general and not only pertain to um, the device itself, are the ease of use and the learning curve of the operator and the center, the, the hemodynamics, uh, and the capability to cause more or less hypertension. The impact on the need for permanent pacemaker and implantation, the presence of subsequent leak or regurgitation, the risk of embolization, the conformability, which may lead to suboptimal results, for, ex for example, in horizontal aortas, the risk of coronary occlusion, and the risk that uh, access to the left main is prevented or to the right coronary artery. The suitability for the cuspid or above involved interventions, the durability, and lastly, but not that much, the risk of endocarditis or thrombosis. Of course, we must remember the pioneers, Alain Cribier in particular, but also Jean-Claude Rabord, and we must recognize that they were pioneers because they used very crude devices. I remember the first cases in San Rafael, it was 2005, I guess, or six, and it was still an anti-grade approach with the transeptal, transmitral, and so forth. Luckily, we do not use this device any longer. The procedure has been improved substantially, and indeed, we have a plethora of devices. The key point is that it's very difficult to consider for instance, the Sapien 3 Ultra, similar to a Sapien or a Sapien XT, or to consider the Evolute Pro Plus, similar to the core valve, and so forth. So the problem with the studies, as we will see in a few minutes, is that sometimes this study may be already obsolete. Also, being there a number of devices, you get uh, a number of uh, comparisons, too many possibly, and this may uh, create uh, some spurious findings. The key point the current devices are the Evolve devices, the Sapien devices, Accurate Neo, Allegra, a bit less you know, supported by data, Centera, also less supported by data, Yena Valve, which is more suitable for augmentation, Lotus, and Portico. There are some differences, uh, basically, uh, Sapien is the only balloon expandable, more or less, as you can see. 
the randomized trials are there. There are at least, uh, as far as I'm aware, seven randomized trials. For instance, we have uh, the choice uh, which compared the, uh, the Tapian XT versus Corvab and showed better device success with Tapian, but similar outcome. The Portico IDE, which unfortunately compared Portico to a number of other devices, it didn't report uh, sub-studies or subgroup analysis. Actually, non-inferiority of Portico was not established, but outcomes were largely similar. The Prince 3, Lotus, where well, Corva Evolut, non-inferiority of Lotus established, and also similar outcomes in the two groups. Scope 1, accurate Neo versus Sapien, non-inferiority of accurate Neo not established, actually, for the chosen endpoint, but largely similar outcomes. Scope 2, accurate Neo versus Evolut R, Evolut Pro, non-inferiority of accurate Neo not established formally, but again, largely similar outcomes. Solve TAVI, it's a spontaneous trial, EUTAR versus Sapien 3, equivalence met with largely similar outcomes. And uh, finally, uh, an old study from Webb comparing Sapien XT versus Sapien and uh, uh, showing that uh, um, non inferiority of Sapien XT was established. Indeed, we can try to combine these studies, for instance, with the pairwise meta analysis, but uh, Basically, you in that you will find that the results are similar for self-expanding and self-expandable, uh, sorry, uh, balloon expandable devices, possibly with more uh, strokes and less pacemaker implant, uh, sorry, less strokes and uh, uh, different pacemaker implantation and probable regurgitation rates with a given device or another. The problem is again we have a combination of different devices here. We may do even something more fancy which is uh, doing a network with analysis, combining different types of devices, different axes as well. And uh, you can see this has been done for big cuspid bulbs uh, and also more recently in these studies or in others. This is uh, difficult to appraise though, because there are some obsolete devices uh, and in the end you get a number of uh, comparisons. Typically, uh, it seems that uh, uh, Lotus in this analysis was associated with uh, fewer strokes, uh, but more pacemaker implantations versus uh, balloon expandable devices or uh, self expandable devices. Something similar has been done by a former colleague of mine, Fabrizio D'Ascenzo. And again, you can see there are some differences between devices. Uh, and this analysis, a comprehensive one, which however includes also first generation devices, suggests better outcomes with balloon expandable devices. What about observational studies? There are many, of course, not that many comparing different devices. We have published something on this and it's not difficult to convince the viewers uh, because typically each reviewer has his own idea that a device is better than another. So for instance, the center study has shown similar outcomes uh, with the two types of devices. Uh, but more pacemaker implantations with self expandable, more bleedings with balloon expandable. Cost in 2020, accurate new versus Evolut versus Sapien, similar outcomes, but more pacemaker implantation with Evolut R. Um, the arrow, better outcomes with Sapien 3, including mortality. Core valve versus Sapien XT, Sapien 3 in France TV, better outcomes with Sapien XT, Sapien 3. Mass payroll, similar outcomes with Portico and Sapien 3. NeoPro, similar outcomes with Accurate Neo and Evolut Pro. And finally, our own study with FIVA, which showed the similar outcomes with the five devices, but possibly um, more non-fatal events with Lotus. The two biggest studies, however, are the French study, which was published last year uh, in circulation, suggesting that uh, there are some benefits uh, with uh, balloon expandable devices, uh, and indeed, uh, the results very strong with the fatal and non-fatal events favoring balloon expandable devices. Of course, the key problem is that you may improve the comparability of the groups by using propensity scores, but this is not optimal for every variable and also cannot be done for variables which are not measured or inappropriately measured. Another important registry is from the arrow, suggesting again, better results with the 
balloon expandable devices, uh, less debt, fewer pacemaker implantations. Again, some doubts why would the survival benefit uh, become evident early on and then keep going? It's uh, very difficult to understand. It might be due to confounding or residual features. Another registry is a small one, but uh, from China, there are not many of that. And you can see similar results uh, with, however, some differences in pacemaker implantation. And then there is our own Vispiva, which compared five devices uh, very attentively, very precisely. We compared uh, the devices, uh, each one against the others, uh, with for major adverse events, major vascular complications, renal failure, permanent pacemaker, and indeed, we found many, many differences, favoring sometimes, for instance, accurate, sometimes, uh, for instance, uh, uh, lotus, and so forth. The key point, up to one year follow-up, these differences, which may be striking, for instance, a uh, threefold increase in the rate of permanent pacemaker with lotus, uh, after adjustment, uh, most events uh, were not different between the three or four devices. Uh, possibly there was still some exceeding uh, rate of events, uh, no fatal ones with losses. So the key question is, whenever we have, want to compare a non-randomized study to a randomized study, we need to use some adjustment for a confounder to downplay its role in our appraisal of the association between a chosen device and the outcome. But what can we do when we do not measure a confounder? There is plenty of them, just for instance, rate. So I want to conclude, I will not tell you what I think, at least in writing, but I will read uh, from a recent uh, editorial by Abdelawab Gentile, implantation of the wrong device in the wrong patient may negatively affect patient outcome. This is a call for differential treatment, which can only be achieved uh, with a certain volume and level ex experience uh, with an in and different and continuously evolving tower device platform. This is also a call for more randomized clinical evidence, particularly in anomalous situations that are believed to be equally treatable with both platforms and with clinical endpoints relevant to the long-term expectations of a lower risk population. Indeed, another very nice review suggests that we can somehow choose for instance, uh, the sapien can be used for large annulus, uh, horizontal orthos. Uh, when you want to, um, uh, when you, you deem there is a high risk of a permanent pacemaker implantation work to, to decrease this risk, or there is extensive coronary artery disease, and I like you for future PCI. The self-expanding device, when there is dense annular or calcium, intolerance to rapid pacing, small or challenging femoral artery access, uh, Tabre and Savre for supranormal designs, and uh, uh, make sure you want to avoid prosthesis patient mismatch. And also, you can use Lotus when there is some calcium, again, tolerance to rapid pacing, but there is already a pacemaker. I have concluded. I want to thank you. I'm sorry I couldn't come to Belgrade, but I will sure uh, come next year whenever there is the opportunity. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you for this fantastic overview. I think that the, the, the key message at the end was that we all tend to choose the devices based on the patient's anatomy. And also in our center, because these balloon expandable valves were more, uh, more expensive, we tended to use them for patients who were of higher risk, uh, more complex anatomies and so on. So probably this is a confounder uh, very difficult to, uh, to, 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 to follow in, 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 in such analysis. But I think that uh, probably a, a center should use one or two types of devices and not uh, try too many at the uh, same time, especially if they are low volume. Uh, I agree definitely. In my center, we mainly use uh, um, I can be frank, uh, Evolut, Portico, and occasionally Allegra, mainly for cost. Uh, we preferred to treat more patients. Uh, this year we uh, finished with uh, 200 cases uh, rather than uh, doing fewer patients uh, with the, the same budget. But I believe that in, in some cases, at least, uh, 
a balloon expandable device is superior. Giuseppe, uh, thank you for your excellent lecture. Just one question, short time. Uh, very interested. Uh, I, I suppose you're aware of the, the paper that was published two years ago in um, European Health Journal, in which uh, uh, German Jerry registry was compared to the to the low risk um, trials evolved and partners. And what interests me is um, in those comparison, which are all comers in those German registry, uh, the mortality comparing to the, to the results of the partner and the Evolut trials was five times higher. So also the, the much more patient prothesis mismatch and so and so. So what do you think about those? The, the, is really the, the data from the from the trials how comparable is that to to real clinical practice, at least in, in Italy or? This is a very good question. So my personal take uh, is that uh, we need uh, not to focus uh, uh, already on low risk patients. This is uh, not uh, a good, uh, uh, you know, use of resources uh, for our patients. And also I think it's like doing PCI in patients uh, with uh, limited angina or no angina. I think we need to use our devices uh, for cardiogenic shock, iris systemi, and the same applies to TEVI. Um, my belief is that uh, uh, registry tend to underestimate uh, event rates or overestimate them uh, depending on uh, the adjudication process. Of course, it's true that uh, the pivotal trials, uh, the partner trials were very, very accurate in selecting patients. In some trials, uh, you may uh, screen maybe 50 patients to enroll one. So, um, it's not easy to externally validate those results. But the key point is, in my perspective, is that a trial is not necessarily applicable elsewhere, but it has an inner truth. Whereas uh, the registry can be repeated elsewhere, but uh, you never know whether the results you find are really, really um, demonstrating something. I, I don't know if you, I, I made my, my, my point clear. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, thanks for the great talk, uh, Ronnie from Austria. Uh, I have a question concerning the, the difference between the prosthesis. Some difference may have long-term consequences, like new bu left bundle branch block, a permanent pacemaker, or paravalvular leak. So if we have a young patient with, uh, where we consider longevity, Shall we? Shall age be uh, a factor that should uh, influence us to choose between different valves? So I, I can answer, but by telling you, what if I had uh, artic stenosis and uh, if I was offered TAVI? Probably now I would not have TAVI. I would still have uh, surgical replacement. What if I'm older? Um, then probably I would trust the physician. So for instance, uh, if you come to our center, we are happy with treating our patients with self-expandable, even low-risk patients. But because we trust the results, we have very low complication rates, uh, and, uh, uh, and that's our strength. If a center has extensive experience with, uh, for example, a balloon expandable device, uh, I think it's the way to go. And many studies suggest the Sapien 3 is the, the best device. Uh, there is, however, no conclusive evidence because the studies are uh, either of low quality, say registry, registered, or with the obsolete devices. Okay. So, so thank you very much, and, and hope you see you next time live in person. And greetings to Italy and Rome. Okay, so thank you. Bye bye. And we're going to move on uh, to the next speaker. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Wojtek Wojakowski from Katowice, Poland, and who is going to give a talk about transcatheter aortic valve and valve interventions. Thanks for coming, and please. Thank you very much, uh, dear, dear friends, colleagues. I really appreciate, uh, and great thanks for Marco and Svetozar for inviting me for this very nice tie. I really enjoy uh, visiting Serbia. 
and and hope to uh, work with you on future projects as well. So my my talk is about the uh, the uh, Valve in Valve uh, Tavi, which is uh, something of interest for me, also from the uh, scientific point of view. So the 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 growing number of Tavi in uh, native analogs it's uh, parallel to increase number of valve in valve procedures because of the uh, of the uh, higher uh, rate of implantation of uh, bioprosthetic surgical valves this is very recent data from uh, from uh, tbt registry showing uh, that uh, there are around uh, 5400 patients uh, done in the US. Uh, so let's say the, the numbers are around 60,000 TAVI implants, so that would make around 8%. And uh, so the number is growing and will be, will be growing uh, year by year. And the, and the concept of, uh, of valve in valve, it's, it's quite old. It came from Leipzig uh, and it was proposed in 2007, so uh, quite early. Uh, this is data from, from Polish registry uh, showing which types of the valves are treated as the valve in valve procedures. And uh, this shows that, uh, at least in Poland, the, 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 the main surgical valve is, is a Hancock valve. And also we have a lot of, of uh, stentless valves, which uh, will uh, create some uh, problems during the procedure, and I'll talk about this later. So uh, what's the mean size? The mean size uh, of the surgical valve is 21, uh, and uh, we have a lot of, uh, about 40% of small surgical valves, and this is the problem and uh, key limitation of the valve in valve because of the risk of high gradients after the, the procedure. So uh, if you look at the, at the TAVI valves, uh, used for valve in valve procedure, you see that that the uh, self expandable supraannular valves like like Evolute are uh, the most frequent frequently used, which makes sense at least for patients with very small uh, surgical valve, uh, and the other valves are used less frequently. And uh, what's important for the for the complication rate is that the stental, stentlet uh, valves with um, with externally mounted leaflets are used uh, in less than 10% because the, the, this group of uh, patients are higher risk for coronary obstruction and, and we have a lot of uh, homographs. So there are some challenges, some of them are not really uh, big issues, but some of them are, are uh, really significant. So for me, the, uh, the high gradient and patient prosthesis mismatch is the, is the key limitation of the valve in valve procedure then the risk of coronary obstruction and future coronary excess for patients who have already two valves, and the others are listed, uh, are listed here. So uh, our data showed that uh, after, the, after the implantation of, 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 of TAVI valve in the, in the failed surgical valve, you can expect uh, the, the mean gradients of uh, about uh, 15, 16, but uh, this is a bit different in patients with small surgical valves like 21 and low, lower because then the gradients are, are uh, persistently higher and this creates problem. And the same uh, show is showed by the uh, large, largest uh, registry on, on, on valve in valve, which is the, the Vivid registry. So uh, there are higher gradients than for the, uh, for the native Anolus uh, Tavi, but um, at, at the end, the hemodynamics is it's, uh, acceptable and the improvement of quality of life is it's, it's substantial. So what could we do if the surgical valve is uh, it's, it's, it's small and we may expect that after implantation of, of, of the TAVI device, we will have high gradients and the high gradients after the valve in valve uh, increase mortality. So um, there is a concept of a valve fracture or valve cracking, which is now uh, established in, 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 in the registries. So you have to use the non-compliant balloon like this, like Atlas or like Bart True Balloon, and with uh, either before implantation of the valve or after implantation of the valve, there is a high, um, high um, 
uh, pressure inflation, uh, which creates the the cracking of the of the of the valve. You see at the right upper panel there is a um, indentation of the of the balloon, and after the high pressure in, in inflation in the lower panel you see no no waste uh, no waste in the balloon. So the very recent publication in Euro Intervention showed that the device success is high. Uh, the Periprocedural mortality and then complication rate is it's 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 quite low. Uh, there are uh, you know I would say that the uh, concern is about about the valve di displacement because after the high pressure in e implantation inflation you may have uh, the displacement of the self, self expandable valve and also this creates lower gradient and and more. Um, favorable uh, chemodynamics. So the valve cracking for very small um, uh, surgical prosthesis is, is an option. Then uh, the risk of coronary obstruction, which is, uh, if it happens acutely, has very high mortality. Uh, it's now estimated to be lower than in, in, in first registries. Uh, it's it's uh, lower than 2% in current registries. And, but still it's six times uh, higher than for the native uh, valve TAVI. So there are some valves which are more prone to, to, to create this problem, like uh, externally mounted leaflets, uh, the stentless valves, and the stented valve uh, with internally mounted leaflets are least likely to, to produce the coronary obstruction. So I would say that the uh, preventive measures are for the two first types of the valves. This uh, coronary obstruction is, is caused by a variety of, of, of uh, technical problems, but uh, usually it's caused by, uh, by obstruction of the, of, the, of the left main or RCA by, by, the, by the leaflet which is displaced toward the coronary ostium. This, is, this happens especially uh, in patients with, uh, with less spacious sinuses and low coronary takeoffs. This can be uh, predicted by by assessment by a CT, you see uh, the um, so-called uh, valve to coronary uh, distance of 2.3 millimeters for the right uh, coronary artery and four millimeters uh, to the left. Uh, and the four millimeters is the threshold. Below four, milli four milli millimeters, you have increased risk of, of uh, coronary obstruction. Also, the, the height of the, of the uh, coronary uptake is it's, uh, it's an important factor. So very simplified um, rule of thumb that for the stented valves, if you have the uh, VTC uh, below four, the patients are higher risk. And uh, for the stentless valves, you also consider the, the coronary ostia, which should be not uh, less than uh, 12 millimeters above. And then what you can do is either to have uh, guide wires in the coronary vessels for coronary protection or uh, have stents ready in the vessels. Uh, So-called chimney stenting or snorkel stenting, which I think it's an ugly procedure because you have uh, two stents uh, protruding by several millimeters or, or centimeter from the, from the ostium and it's not really uh, a, good, a good idea. It's probably for bailout. Uh, situations and basilica, which will be discussed, I will not uh, cover this. So this is a, a, an example of protected um, implantation of the valve. You see the stent in the right coronary artery, you see the stent in the left coronary artery, and you see the, the evolute. And uh, this was uh, a chimney technique uh, because uh, this patient had very, uh, very, uh, um, very narrow. Um, sinuses and, and the risk of coronary obstruction was high. So what you can do after you, uh, you decide to implant the second valve, uh, first of all, regardless if you do basilica or not, you don't want to have the, the, the post of the TAVI valve in front of the ostium uh, because it will create the same problem that was already there. So if you do the basilica and you, have, uh, and you have less risk of coronary obstruction, you tend to, you want to implant the valve in so-called commissural alignment 
So the post of the surgical valve and the post of the uh, TAVI valve will be in the same places, so the post of the TAVI will not uh, be, uh, be uh, in front of the, of, the, of the ostium. And you can achieve this for many valves. It's easiest for the, for the evolute because we know the, that the hot marker at the, at the distal end of the valve corresponds to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the docking uh, uh, parts of the, in, uh, of the pro uh, aortic part. And we know what's the relation between these markers and, and the leaflets in the TAVI valve. So we can implant the valve by simply uh, looking at the, at the flash port, which should direct to, 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 uh, to three o'clock during the implantation to have this, this commissural alignment. Of course, it's, it's approximation, but it's still better than implanting the, the valve, uh, which is uh, unaligned. So the pacemaker rate, which is a problem for, for uh, younger high-risk patients in particular, but for TAVI in, 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 in SAVAR, it's less likely to happen because of the, of the stent of the, uh, of the uh, surgical valve and also the fact that we tend to implant higher. The uh, predictor is uh, right bundle branch block before the procedure. And after we need to implant the, uh, the pacemaker, the, the uh, outcome of the patient is inferior to the patients without pacemaker. So we should try to avoid that. So I'm a bit afraid of stentless valves because we treated a lot of uh, many patients with the stentless valves with failed uh, either uh, freestyle or, or, or prima, and those patients are uh, younger, and there, is, uh, there are many technical problems like uh, extensive calcification of this valve uh, and, uh, and less calcifications at the leaflet, so the anchoring is not that, that good. Also, poor visibility in fluoro, the, uh, the massive MR, AR, which, which uh, it's uh, more frequent than, than, the, than the obstruction of the valve, and low uh, coronaries. So just an example, on, in the left panel, you see the, the calcification all around the, the, uh, the valve extending to the, uh, to the coronaries. Then in the middle panel, you see uh, that you really can't see the valve because it's uh, not visible, so definition of the landing zone is difficult. And in the right panel, you see highly calcified uh, uh, valve and massive uh, aortic regurgitation. So the implantation is, is more, more challenging, at least uh, in my opinion. Also, the planning of the procedure is more difficult because, as you see, you don't see such uh, images for native valve. In native valve, you are really uh, able to measure the, the, the size of the annulus. And for this particular patient with, with failing um, uh, Edwards Prima valve, you see there is so, difficult, so much difficulty in, in, in assessment of the, of, the, of the size of the valve. Also, there are uh, not many calcification uh, at the leaflets. Actually, one of the leaflets was, was, uh, was prolapsing, and it, it was uh, a patient who had uh, primarily um, regurgitation and not uh, stenosis. And in the right uh, lower panel, you see this angulation by 90% of the aorta because it was a, f a, a root uh, replacement done by this, uh, this, this uh, stentless valve, and there was a 90 degree angle uh, just just above. So for this type, for this particular patients, we we took uh, the the Edwards valve because it was easier to manipulate around this <clears throat> this arc. And as as you see the the panels, could you please uh, switch on the movies? Okay. So let's let's stay at this final result. So. Uh, also, this implantation would be very low for a patient with native, native annulus, but uh, you have to remember that this part of the, the this ventricular part of this, of this, of this, of this valve with this sewing ring uh, tends to be lower than what you can assess by injection into the uh, aortic root. So, uh, actually, the end of the leaflet uh, of, this, of this prosthetic valve was 
at the same level as the ventricular portion of the valve. So it was a prolapsing leaflet which extended into the LVOT. So this patient is doing fine, and then you see this, 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 this white angulation just above the, 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 the surgical suture. So it was a difficult case, and I'm always afraid when I, 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 I do the procedures in patients with, uh, with failing stentless valves. At the end, both the Polish registry and recently published um, uh, Vivid registry showed that the survival of the patient is, is, uh, is comparable to the uh, stentle, stented valves, but anyway, the procedures are technically challenging and the patients are difficult. So the last, last uh, issue I would like to raise is that if we plan to treat the patients with valve-in-valve -valve procedure, and the patient is 85, we don't really have the problem with future procedures because the lifetime, the expected lifetime, which is shown uh, in the upper panel, this is uh, from European, uh, European uh, EU uh, website with predicted lifetime of patients uh, at the age of 65 at the assessment. So you can see that it's, it's almost uh, 20 years. So if the patient is 85, the predicted lifetime is shorter than the valve durability, and probably there is no issue. He will not care about the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, valve, uh, the next valve. If the patient is 65, what we can expect? We have already failing surgical bioprosthesis, and then we implant TAVI. But the patient will live probably another 30 years. So what will be the next step? So I think that for the patient with small annulus, we have to plan for the lifetime let's say valve management at the time of, of the surgery because we cannot implant third TAVI. Of course we can do it, but nobody knows what will be the result. So this is the crucial issue, not the surgical risk in my opinion, not the, uh, not the uh, technical issue, but the age and life expectancy of the patient. And the last topic is um, a TAVI in TAVI we recently published with, with some uh, with, with, with large group of, 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 of centers uh, from Europe and, and, and US registry on, uh, on um, TAVI in TAVI. It's technically doable. There are not that many patients. The results are okay, but who knows what happened if you implant the expandable valve in failing uh, sapient valve and the coronary excess, it's difficult to predict. So this is an unknown and we have to follow the patients. Uh, so I will end by saying that there, there is a trial uh, randomizing patients to either surgical redo replacement or uh, TAVI. I'm curious about the result. And, the, and my conclusion is that uh, uh, the valve in valve TAVI is uh, associated with good clinical outcomes. The limitations are high risk, uh, high gradients in patients with initially small surgical valve. The risk of coronary obstruction, which is infrequent by, but can be devastating, and uh, the issue of further coronary excess uh, in, in, especially in young patients. And we need to create a lifetime strategy between surgeons and cardiologists how to plan the treatment of younger patients. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for this great overview and thanks for sharing your personal experience and, and your data from uh, Poland with us. Um, I have a question concerning the prosthesis. Uh, on one of your first slides, you mentioned patient prosthesis mismatch may be an issue in valve and valve procedures. Uh, how do you in your daily clinical practice choose which prosthesis to use for a valve and valve intervention? So I think that for the failing surgical valve of 23 and larger, it doesn't really matter. For the smaller surgical valves, I would use the supraannular uh, self-expandable valve, which also makes uh, you know, the choice uh, limited to the, to, the, to the metronic valve. Okay, so small so, prosthesis rather self-expanding supraannular. Supraannular, and and they proved to be better in in uh, in post-operative gradients in valves smaller than 23. So the smaller valve, the may the more different it makes if you use supraannular or intraannular valve. But we used for many patients a sapient valve in large in larger surgical valve, and it's also 
uh, working very well. But for small valves, I would use soprano valve. And if you use the sapien valve in, in large uh, prosthesis, do you go for step-by-step uh, -step inflation, slow inflation, fast inflation? How do you... Uh, slow inflation, slow, slow inflation, inflation, slow, slow and steady. Slow and then rapid pacing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there any other questions yes. from the panel? I yes, will please. ask you. Thank you because you share your experience with us, of course. Uh, my question is, um, uh, how many time uh, was after the primary implantation, hand Kong prosthesis in a aortic position when you're doing a valve in valve? And another, do you have data how large was that uh, valve? Average, 27, 25, do you have, do you pay attention about that? Well, I, I can't tell it by now. I can send you the, the publication uh, with, with the details. Uh, it was just the distribution of different types of the, of the, of the, of the, of the valves. But uh, I, I can't really remember now. Okay, we will see in the next time when we match each other. But probably the... Probably Mara can, can tell me uh, the l very large Hancocks, wh which average size of the Hancock? Can you give us that question too? Yes. Uh, I would say 23 millimeters. Right. That's what it was like. Yeah, so okay, probably smaller. This, is mm -hmm. what this was, this was the... Yeah, 23. As you said, I, I fully agree. 23. It's 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 really safe, uh, safe threshold, for uh, high gradients, and smaller than that, it's it's high risk. Of course, some patients may have the patient prosthesis mismatch from the very beginning, and this is a big issue. But there are not that many patients. But we've seen patients who uh, had patient prosthesis mismatch starting at the initial uh, surgical procedure. And this is probably uh, the, 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 the case where you should consider uh, operation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, congratulations, uh, very nice, uh, very nice results. I'm, I'm a surgeon, so I'm talking from, from other side. So in your center, do you treat the, the patient with, uh, for failed um, bioprosthesis uh, regardless surgical risk, or you are picking up the patient that were refused for redo surgery? No, we, we discuss the patients in the heart team, and this is the, our common, common solution. Probably many of the patients were chosen for the, for the TAVI because they had bypass grafts, because they had some other adverse features. So I, I think that if the patient is low risk for redo operation, it's, 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 it's done. It's, it's the hard team de decision. So we consider risk and we consider comorbid comorbidities and the age of the patient. Yeah, and, and just one more question. For you, you made an uh, excellent comment about the 65-year-old patients, that group, very young group of patients. It will be, I think, we need uh, very carefully to think about putting TAVI in those patients. Yeah. I think 65-year-old uh, is should be a surgical candidate. Yeah, I fully agree. And even for the native valve, even. I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't go for 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 TAVI as the initial procedure. I fully yeah. agree. Yeah. The life expectancy is life expectancy yeah. is very important. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm, I I spend so much time talking about the, the the stentless valves because we had a group of patients who implant who were implanted with stentless valves you know, in the young age. And they present for, uh, for, for, for TAVI uh, with highly calcified valves at the age of 50. And what to do with them, with the low coronaries. Even if you are successful with first TAVI, you have to expect that in 10 years, the reintervention is needed. And then it's probably much more risky because of the coronary obstruction. So. This is something that's, that's why I mentioned that the, 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 the first decision of the type of the valve and the size of the valve is, is really making the, the, the whole lifetime treatment of the patients uh, difficult. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just one short question, maybe we move forward. In the, the, the patient that you 
have performed so far. So just in your experience, what was the mean time for Valve and Tavi? Eight years. Eight years. And what about comparing the gradients, uh, Valve and Tavi versus uh, Valve and Sever? Do, do, do you have some data? Is after it comparable? The Valve after the Valve, Valve? yes, yes. No, if, if there was no mismatch, it improved. But f in, uh, in my experience, at least 40% of the patients were uh, aortic regurgitation, not, not the high oh. gradient. Especially for the stentless, they, they present as either uh, cusp prolap or, or, or regurgitation mixed with, with some calcification. So uh, it's not the whole story about the gradient, but, but many patients are they admitted are. As, as acute uh, or as uh, severe regurgitation. Okay. Rather. okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. So um, it's my special pleasure to, to announce the next speaker, Professor Binder from Austria. And he will speak about TAVI and the uh, low coronary ostia, essentially the basilical procedure. Please. Uh, Marco, thank you uh, for the introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And it's, uh, Belgrade is a great city. I'm happy to visit it. And it's also personally an important city because my mother and grandmother were born here. And uh, so the topic of the talk is Tavin Lokarnoster, the Basilica procedure. Um, these are my conflicts of interest. So in surgical aortic valve replacement, the aortic valve is directly visualized. Uh, the native leaflets are cut out. They are removed from the body. And then a mechanical or a, a biological prosthesis is sutured in in the annulus with a perfect alignment of the commissures so uh, that the coronary ostra, which are also directly seen, remain open. So coronary obstruction of the surgical aortic valve replacement is extremely rare and usually has nothing to do with the prosthesis but rather with some debris or with the suture. In contrast, in transcatheter aortic valve implantation, the native aortic leaflets, they are not directly visualized. Uh, they are not removed from the body. They are pushed aside and pushed towards the coronary ostia. And so in certain anatomies, uh, a TAVI procedure can end up like this. The coronaries are gone. And, and this situation uh, can only be solved by coronary stenting or emergency bypass grafts, and the mortality is between 40 and 50 percent. So this is a situation that has to be avoided. So we've already learned that um, coronary obstruction after TAVI is, uh, has a different rate if we treat the native aortic valve or if we perform a valve and valve procedure. So in uh, if we treat the native aortic valve, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty rare, so it's below 1%. But if we go for a valve and valve procedure, uh, depending on the registry, it can be between 2 and 3%. So that's 1 in 30 persons who will have coronary obstruction. So how do we anticipate that the coronaries are going to get obstructed? Well, one of the important risk factors is which prosthesis we are treating. And the prosthesis who have leaflets mounted outside of the stand frame, like the trifecta or the mitral flow, they have a higher risk for coronary obstruction. And as we've already learned, the standards, especially the, the Freedom Solo and, and the Freestyle Valve, uh, they have higher risk for uh, coronary obstruction. So before we go forward to a TAVI procedure or valve and valve procedure, we have to understand the anatomy of the aortic root and the height of the coronaries is, is not the only and the main factor. Uh, it's the, the whole sinus and then the distance between the, the virtual uh, prosthesis and the takeoff. Uh, it's the height of the uh, sinotubular junction, it's the width of the sinotubular junction, and it's the size of the whole sinus. So the risk factors for coronary obstruction, we've already learned from the previous talk, um, is uh, the, the low coronary ostia, uh, narrow sinus of Valsalva, bulky leaflet calcification, then a high implantation and commissural malalignment, which can be performed in TAVI procedures, and, and then the valve, the, the surgical biprosthesis, so those who have no stent frame or externally mounted stent frames. 
So when we have a patient with a high risk for coronary obstruction, what can we do if the patient is not a candidate for surgery and should undergo a valve-in-valve -valve procedure? Well, we want to anticipate. We don't want to end up with, uh, with this situation in a valve-in-valve -valve mitral flow. The left main is completely gone. Here, the left main is still seen, but you can see that there is obstruction. Here, you can see the takeoff of the left main. Also, in, in, that's in a mosaic with internal mounted leaflets. Um, we have the possibility of the chimney or snorkel technique. So before going forward with the TAVI, uh, a guide wire is placed uh, um, in the coronary and then it's important to place already the stent of the correct size in the coronary before proceeding with valve implantation. Then the valve is implanted and uh, the situation is assessed for coronary obstruction. If there is a coroner, the lower coronary flow, then the stent is a little bit pulled back and deployed. If there is no obstruction, the stand can be removed and uh, with only the prosthesis in place. Um, so it's, it's a procedure that I personally don't really like because there is a lot of metal left in front of the left main or the, or the right coronary artery. The stand can get crushed. It's difficult to re-engage the coronary arteries uh, there is a registry that sh didn't show long-term consequences, but there is a rate of, uh, of restenosis that's more than 5%. So uh, it's, it's not an aesthetic uh, intervention. And so there is another possibility that was introduced in 2018, and that's the basilica procedure. So the biopsthetic or native aortic scallop intentional laceration to prevent hydrogenic coronary artery obstruction during TABR. And what is done is an electrified wire is, is moved uh, through the leaflet that may be prone to coronary obstruction so that the leaflet gets sliced and, and the flow to the coronary through the stent frame uh, is open. And in an in vitro study, after an in vitro basilic procedure, that would look like this. It's important to do not have the commissures of the TAVI procedure in front of the cut leaflet, otherwise there may be uh, obstruction despite basilica procedure. So let's go step by step through the procedure. How does it work? It's a bit a complicated uh, procedure. Usually we get access from both uh, femoral arteries. Uh, then uh, there is a snare placed in the LVOT with a security wire in the LV. Uh, then the next step is uh, to go to the correct position at the bottom of the leaflet. For the left, it's usually an AL2 catheter with an IM catheter inside, then a, a micro catheter inside. Then with cauterization, a wire, most use the estato wire, is uh, pushed through the leaflet into the LVOD and then snared in the LVOT. And then the wire is pulled back into the other guiding catheter who was waiting and sitting in the LVOT so that there is an externalization of the wire. There is a V here. And then with uh, electrification of the wire and pulling back both uh, catheters, the leaflet is sliced and cut. Uh, and then uh, the procedure, the Tabe procedure, a valve and valve procedure is performed as usual. Um, so the anatomical features for and against basilica, uh, it's important to exactly access the, the anatomy before. So if there is a lot of calcium at the, at the nadir of the leaflet uh, that, is, that is unfavorable for basilica, uh, the commissures of the surgical valve have to be aligned because the cut has to be done exactly at the ostium of the uh, coronary artery and not on the side. Um, single leaflet is, of course, uh, easier than, than a double basilica. And uh, if there is no femoral access, it makes the procedure even more complicated. So there is not too much uh, experience with the, with the basilica uh, worldwide. There is the US experience from those who invented the procedure. Uh, they have uh, screen 60, they've done a feasibility trial and now just recently published the one year data. Um, so they've treated uh, 30 patients uh, with this procedure and have a follow-up after one year of 30 patients. 
and there were no long-term problems with the procedure. So after one year all patient, there were no new coronary obstructure or uh, procedure-related problems. There was one uh, death directly during the procedure that was a patient who was not related to basilica. It was a patient who went into distributive shock with the introduction of the general anesthesia. The procedure is usually done under general anesthesia and with TOE guidance. And, and he later had a stroke and, uh, and died. And the other two deaths that occurred with the one year, one was an endocarditis of all four valves. And so uh, the, the procedural su success was pretty high, was more than 90%. Uh, and um, it showed the feasibility of uh, the technique. Then there is the, the first uh, experience from Europe that was published was by, by the Leipzig group from uh, Mohammed, Mohammed Abdel Wahab. Uh, they treated 21 patients with the basilica, so 23 leaflets. And um, they had a procedural success of 95%, and Tavi was uh, successfully performed in 100%. But there was one patient where it was not possible to cross the leaflet because of the, the calcification. And then there's the International Basilica re, uh, Registry. That's a combination from data from the US and Europe with 214 patients, 24 centers. Uh, the success of the procedure was uh, 94%. And, uh, but they had a couple of patients who, despite of this slicing of the leaflet, had uh, coronary obstruction. So in, uh, in one in 20, so about 5%, there was still uh, partial or complete coronary obstruction, and they had a stroke rate of 2.8%, of which is not that different from, from registries from TAVI procedure, but still high. In the, in the first feasibility trial, the stroke rate was 10%, and there is another registry from the US where the stroke rate was 6%, so most basilica procedures are done with a cerebral protection device. So I'd like to share with you one of the patients that was treated in my center. That it was a 70-year-old female patient. She underwent a microflow uh, surgical aortic valve replacement many years ago, and that was complicated by sternal wound infection and, and then reoperation. So she ended up with this uh, with a sternal fixation. So the whole sternum was was sort of made of metal. And when the surgeons and my center saw this, they said, well, we don't want to go through the sternum again. Uh, the virtual said this is inoperable. And uh, when we looked at the CT scan, uh, we saw that the, the right coronary is endangered and the left coronary is endangered. Uh, it was a microflow with externally mounted leaflets. Um, and when we think we put a valve, uh, valve and valve procedure, we, the risk of coronary obstruction was, was very high. So um, we decided we, we need to go, well, she, she wanted to live, she wanted to have, to have something done, and uh, she was not a surgical candidate, so we went for a double uh, basilica procedure. And here's a short movie. Uh, it was done under general anesthesia with TUE guidance and cerebral protection. And let's have a look at the movie. So here we place the sentinel device from the right uh, radial artery, a filter in the left and right carotid. Then there's a aortic root shot showing that there's real narrow sinuses. Here's the snare in the LVOT. Then we prepare the counter. Here we transverse the leaflet on the left, snare the wire, uh, create a V, then transverse the right leaflet. And then we have both Vs. We, this is the snare with pulling of both catheters. We slice the left and then we slice the right leaflet here, so we have two leaflets sliced. She was hemodynamically stable. And we, we went for a snorkel technique just in case, placed the valve, but we did not need uh, to do a chimney procedure. So we pulled back, uh, did a balloon post inflation, and then pulled back the, the chimney uh, stent, the sentinel device. There's some debris there. I don't want to have this in my brain. And final angiogram, both coronaries were open. And, uh, and the patient had an uh, uneventful recovery and, uh, and was pretty happy that she got her problem solved. Um, so when we assess for coronary obstruction, I think about basilica procedures or some other 
um, way to protect the corners with the snorkel uh, technique. Uh, most important is do the leaflets extend above the corner ostium? If no, we can go for conventional tower. If, if the, uh, the, the distance from the virtual valve to the corners is less than four millimeters, uh, that's something we should consider basilica. And then we have to look at the sinotubular junction. If this is very narrow or low, uh, it can also be uh, a case where basilica should be considered. So at the moment, Basilica is a pretty complicated procedure, but in the future it might get much less complicated. Uh, this is a device, it's not on the market. There have, this year have, there have been about uh, five patients done uh, in Israel, uh, and that's kind of automatic Basilica. It's the, the PI cardio shortcut device uh, where that's introduced before Tabor. And here, the, there's one arm externally to the leaflet, and the rest of the device is internally. And then there is, uh, is a, a cutting mechanism. And then with pulling back the device uh, here for the left coronary uh, cusp, here for the right uh, cusp, the tower, uh, the, the procedures can be sliced, and uh, it can be preceded with the valve and valve procedure. So in conclusion, uh, if we have a patient considered for a valve and valve implantation, uh, we have to perform a pre-procedural risk assessment for coronary obstruction. If the risk, in my opinion, is not so high, like a moderate risk, I rather go for the snorkel technique, uh, just in case. And in most cases, the stent does not need to be uh, deployed and the coronary stay open. But if a patient has a high risk for coronary obstruction, and we don't want to end up with so much metal uh, in the coronary or in front of the coronary ostia. Uh, it may be a, a patient we consider for the basilica technique. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ronald, for marvelous lecture. <clears throat> uh, wonderful slides, wonderful uh, movie. So we have time for maybe one or two short questions. Do we have some questions from panel? So either it's everything too clear or it's too difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what is the answer. Wait, do you have any? Maybe just one short question. Uh, if there is necessary to, to perform illustration of two leaflets, both for the right and, and left coronary ostia, does it increase the, any kind of the risk of the procedure or, or the, makes it a little bit harder or it doesn't make any difference? Uh, it becomes much more complicated, yeah. so the, the risk is higher. When we look at the registries, the, the, the double procedure techniques, they have a, high, a, a, or a worse outcome. The outcome is still good, but in comparison. Uh, the problem is the excess. So if you do a double basilica, you need four guiding catheters, and then a fifth catheter or wire in the LV. So what you can do is you can go from both groins with a gore dry seal, that is with this inflatable hemostatic valve where you can put two catheters through one uh, sheath uh, and then you have four here, uh, maybe a fifth and or you go, well, you, you, can, you can go radial for a pigtail but then you, you, you cannot use that, so uh, it's... It's complicated. Yes. <laughs> okay, Wait, do you have any question? Yeah. Do you know what's the risk of, of uh, severe acute MR, uh, AR? after the laceration. Is it a problem before you implant the TAVI? So in, in some, that's an important question because if you cut the leaflet, it might just prolapse. What is interesting in most patients, uh, it, it doesn't change anything right. if you slice the leaflet. They kind of still, uh, you know, have a counterpart from the other leaflets. And uh, so in most cases, it doesn't produce CVIR. Uh, but it may, so some centers reported about one-third uh, where they need uh, um, a drug a hemodynamic support. So the, the colleagues in Leipzig, they usually already start with hemodynamic uh, like uh, pressors before slicing, just in case, and then you can do fast pacing with 100 or 110 if there is severe AR. And, but I think it's, uh, in, if, if you do basilica, I think it's good to have an ECMO or something close by, just in case there's complete hemodynamic collapse, then you have some backup plan. 
Also, I think there is something about the mitral flow because I had two cases for a valium valve where I spent one hour trying to cross the mitral flow and we had to go uh, transeptal and mm -hmm. the other way because, I don't know, it was so difficult to cross with wire, pig tie or anything you, you tried. So probably this valve is more difficult than the others. Yeah, I, I, I don't like to encounter this valve during percutaneous procedures. <laughs> So, okay, if uh, no more questions, then maybe some, some from audience, if any question. If not, then uh, I, I wish to thank all the, all the speakers, all the, the, the panel, so thank you very much, and uh, I think we can conclude the session. So, thank, thank you. you once again. Dobar dan svima. Drago mi je da vas mogu pozdraviti na ovom Metronik simpoziju. Ja sam profesor Gašparović i zadovoljstvo mi je najaviti profesora Putnika koji će nam govoriti o lateral trialu i hardwareu. Danas je to u jednom posebnom kontekstu obzirom da Metronik je neke stvari promijenio u svojoj praksi, ali bit će sve jedno interesantno čuti što nam je lateral pokazao. Sveta. Hvala našem kolegi prijatelju i učitelju, doktoru Gašpareviću, koji nam je pomogao da ovaj program etabliramo u Beogradu još 2013. godine, kada smo započeli sa programom hiruškog lečenja terminalne srčane insuficijencije. Istina je nezgodan trenutak ili interesantan trenutak. Naime, kompanija Metronik je praktično zbog safety warninga, koje je na osnovu retrogradne analize ogromnog broja slučajeva koje je imala u prethodnih prijateljima, pa preko deset godina koliko je devajs u kliničkoj upotrebi, povukla devajs privremeno iz kliničke upotrebe. To se desilo pre bukvalno šest dana i mislim da ćemo mi možda i na kraju ovog simpozijuma prokomentarisati i to. To bi bilo vrlo interesantno sa više aspekata. U prvom redu kakva je sudbina bolesnika koji su i dalje na terapiji, a vi imate više hiljada bolesnika koji su i dalje širom sveta na hardware terapiji, odnosno terapiji ovim devajsem. Nevezano za to ili možda baš zanimljivo i iz tog ugla, iz te perspektive, imat ćete kliničke rezultate, odnosno rezultate studija vezanih za ovaj device koje su, ja ću vam odmah reći, izvanredne. Ali da se vratimo na početak, obzirom da je ovo sastanak namenjen prevashodno jednom bazičnom upoznavanju srčane insuficijencije, odnosno hiruškom lečenju srčane insuficijencije, a potom i nekakvim finesama vezanim za najnovije kliničke studije. Dakle, svi vrlo dobro znamo da je lečenje hiruške, pardon, srčane, terminalne srčane insuficijencije optimalno medikamentnom terapijom skopčano sa veoma lošim rezultatima. Transplantacija srca je zlatni standard u tretmanu ovih bolesnika, Zašto je to tako? Pa rezultati transplantacije srca, odnosno preživljavanje bolesnika sa transplantiranim srcem je, rekao bih, stabilno dobro. Dakle, i dalje 84 ili 85 ili čak nešto više procenata, dvogodišnje preživljavanje, potom petogodišnje i desetogodišnje sa veoma, veoma dobrim rezultatima. Šta je problem? Problem je nedostupnost ove procedure. Vi imate stabilan broj donora, odnosno stabilan broj procedura koji se godišnje uradi širom sveta, taj broj se ne uvećava, naprotiv se čak pomalo i smanjuje. I baš zato je hirurgija vadova, odnosno uređaja koji zamenjuju prevaskodnu funkciju rada leve komore, ono što predstavlja sadašnjost, a sigurni smo i budućnost u terapiji terminalne srčane insuficijencije. Šta je VAD? VAD je device koji omogućava da se praktično bajpasira leva komora, odnosno da se leva komora zaobiđe time što će implantirana pumpa u vrh leve komore generisati protok i potom krv iz leve komore transferovati u aortu, na taj način praktično čineći bajpas leve komore. Te pumpe su danas male, dakle vidite kolikih dimenzija, potpuno implantabilne u perikardni prostor. U toku je a mi smo bili svedoci jednog sjajnog pipeline-a Metronik kompanije u kome je u nekom vrlo, vrlo skorašnjem vremenskom periodu, kada to kažem, mislim, na dve, tri ili četiri godine, trebao da izađe i fully implantable device, dakle device koji ne bi imao drive line koji izlazi kroz prednje trbušni zid i konektuje pumpu sa izvorom energije. 
Kada ga ugrađujemo, pa ovo su vam klasične indikacije, dakle most do donošenja nekog odluka ili most do premoštavanja nekom drugom terapijom, most do kandidovanja ili do pokušavanja popravljanja bolesnika koji trenutno nije kandidat za transplantaciju srca, dakle kod bolesnika koji ima neku od relativnih kontraindikacija i onda klasične indikacije, most do transplantacije koji je dalje najčešća indikacija, most do poravka vrlo redka ili definitivna terapijska opcija koja u eri ekspanzije srčane inicijencije s jedne strane, s druge strane praktično smanjivanja dostupnosti transplantacije srca kao procedure postaje dominantna terapijska opcija. Indikacije su praktično identične kao indikacije za transplantaciju srca, s tim što uvek morate imati na umu da te bolesnike treba uputiti na vreme, odnosno treba ih uputiti do godine, funkcija desne komore zadovoljavajuće da može da isprati rad uređaja koju ugradimo na levu stranu cirkulacije. Intermax klasifikacija, dakle, i dalje su nam klasične indikacije Intermax 1, 2 i 3, to je najveći broj bolesnika koji su kandidati za primjenu ove terapije, s tim što pokušavamo da svičujemo ili da se pomerimo ka nižim Intermax klasama, odnosno ka ambulatornim bolesnicima, ka takozvanim frequent flyerima, naravno da su rezultati u takvoj grupi bolesnika bolji, i da očekujemo da će u budućnosti biti još bolji, samim tim će i procedura postati dostupnija većem broju ljudi i dugoročno preživljavanje tih bolesnika će biti bolje. Dakle, ugrađivali smo ovim jako bolesnim ljudima, NIHA 4 hospitalnim ili Intermax 1, 2 i 3 na osnovu rezultata studija, a sve studije koje su objavljene od 2000. godine pa na ovamo su studije sa jako malim brojem bolesnika, sofisticirana terapija sa veoma skupim devajsevima i naravno da nemamo jasne, prospektivne, randomizovane dokaze, ali su te studije bile opet nekakav put ili putokaz koji je ukazivao da je ova terapija neuporedivo bolja nego optimalna medikamentna terapija kod ovih najbolesnijih ljudi. Zašto sada ugrađujemo manje bolesnim ljudima? Dakle, ugrađujemo zato što imamo između ostalog i evidence-based dokaz, studije ima svoje manjkavosti, ali generalno roadmap trial nam je omogućio da sa jednim pouzdanjem u evidence-based medicinu radimo jelvade kod manje bolesnih ljudi, kod bolesnika koji imaju intermax 4, 5 ili 6, zato što je composite end point u smislu šestominutnog testa, odnosno popravljanju u šestominutnom testu hoda i preživljavanju bio bolji u grupi kod bolesnika koji ima ugrađen elod u poređenju sa grupom bolesnika koji su imali inicijalno optimalnu medikamentnu terapiju. I sada dolazimo do lateral trajla, dakle studija koja nam daje za još više prava da kažemo da je elva terapija, terapija izbora za sve ove bolesnike, zato što su dvogodišnji rezultati ove studije fantastični. Primarni end point, dakle, opet single arm, 144 bolesnika, nisu to velike studije, multicentrična, 26 centara. Primarni end point je bio šestomesečni follow-up i taj primarni end point je, vidjet ćete, uspešno dostignut. Sve jako bolesni bolesnici, dakle 80% bolesnika Intermax 1 do 3, značajno manji broj 2, 3, 4 i 5. Suštinski šestomesečno preživljavanje od gotovo 90%, dakle, rekao bih izvanredan rezultat. Ono što je za nas kao hirurge bilo interesantno, to je studija koja se bavila proučavanjem bolesnika kod kojih je alternativni hiruški pristup, odnosno pristup mini torakotomijom, mini invazivni pristup, ili ajde, ne mini torakotomijom, nego prednje lateralnom torakotomijom, dakle, pokazao zadovoljavajući ili izvanredne rezultate ne samo u preživljavanju, što nam je bio ipak primarni end point, nego i u drugim sekundarnim end pointima prevashodno u smanjenoj incidenci krvavljenja. I kada pogledate dvogodišnje preživljavanje od 87%, dakle jednogodišnje od 89% i dvogodišnje od 87%, pa se setite onog rezultata transplantacija gde nam je i dvogodišnje preživljavanje transplantiranih bolesnika svega, dakle negde približno o ovoj cifri, od 85, 86, 87%, pitanje je u budućnosti koje od ove dve terapije će biti zlatni standard u tretmanu bolesnika sa terminalnom srčanom insuficijencijom. Dakle, od svega ovog ja bih samo još jednom naglasio dvogodišnje preživljavanje stabilno nakon dve godine sa preko 85% živih bolesnika sa divajsem koji je implantiran, opet kažem, u preko desetogodišnjem periodu iskustva i, nažalost, sa divajsem koji je sada privremeno povučen 
iz upotrebe. I na kraju, ovo je onako nekakva poruka koju mi često pokušavamo na verne sastancima koje održavamo širom zemlje, dakle, da pokušamo da šaljemo, identifikujemo i šaljemo bolesnike na vreme. Bolesnik, kao što je ova bolesnica koja je na intraortnoj balom pumpi ili bilo kom drugom mehaničkom cirkulatoru, privremeno mehaničkoj cirkulatornoj potpori, ECMU, koja je intubirana duže vremena sa problematičnim pitanjem stanje svesti, svakako da nije idealan kandidat za ugradnju Elvada i svakako da tu rezultati ne mogu da budu kao kod bolesnika koji je isto tako hospitalan ili frequent flyer bolesnik, ali bolesnik koji još uvek može da sa većom šansom preživi ovu intervenciju. Hvala vam. Ja bih sada... Da, ja bih sada najavio profesora Gašparevića sa vrlo, vrlo interesantnom temom, a to je Elva terapija tokom COVID ere. Dakle, vrlo zanimljive rezultati i vrlo zanimljivo iskustvo koje će nas usmeriti u kom pravcu ćemo lečiti ljude, imam utisak i nevezano za ovu COVID eru. Izvolite. Prije nego što počnem, htio bi se zahvaliti profesorima Putniku i Banoviću na pozivu da sudjelujem ovdje. Lijepo je vidjeti da program u čijem osnutku sam imao jednu malu ulogu i ovako daleko napredovao kao što je to danas slučaj u Beogradu. Također mi je drago da se barem u limitiranom obliku nađemo ovako uživo, jer mislim da nema alternative sastancima uživo. Znači, kad govorimo o... COVID-19 pandemije, ja bih rekao da potrebno neke stvari ipak staviti u kontekst i napomenuti neke možda prilično bazične stvari, ali koje su važne. Više od 25% hospitaliziranih bolesnika imaće neki oblik srčanog zatajenja, kao što je to slučaj u većini miokarditičnih patologija, to će biti biventrikulsko zatajenje. Kod bolesnika koji imaju kronično zatajenje, znači ovo prethodno je bilo potpuno novo nastalo zatajenje kod bolesnika koji nisu imali primarnu srčanu patologiju, Kod kroničnih zatenja možemo očekivati da će doći do egzacerbacije, a sve je to povezano sa nekoliko stvari. Jedna od njih su podležići miokarditis i ishemične promjene. Također ne treba napomenuti da patologija bolesnika sa kojima se mi susrećemo je vrlo rijetko, baš 100% izolirana ljevoventrikulska, tako da često nalazimo neki oblik disfunkcije desnog ventrikla i primarna parenhimska bolest pluća koja ide uz COVID vrlo često će dovesti do porasta afterloada i posljedično tome pogoršanja funkcije desnog ventrikla. Tome treba pridodati jedan proinflamatorni i protrombotični milje u kojem se ti bolesnici nalaze i u konačnici povećenu potrebu metaboličku kako nalazimo u svih bolesnika sa infektivnim zbivanjima. Mislim da je jako važno razumjeti koji je značaj toga. Rekao sam 25% bolesnika sa COVID-om koji su hospitalizirani imat će srčanu zatajenje, međutim ako to raščlanimo po ljudima koji su preživjeli, oni koji nisu preživjeli, tada ćemo vidjeti da više od 50% ljudi koji nisu preživjeli imali su srčanu zatajenje u kontrastu sa 12% bolesnika koji jesu preživjeli. Zašto je ovaj problem COVID-a zapravo toliko značajan? Mislim da ovaj slajd dosta dobro pokazuje, a povezan je sa svjetskom praksom u diagnostičkim, a kasnije ćemo vidjeti terapijskim postupcima koji su povezani sa srčanom patologijom. Znači, uočiljiv je dramatičan pad diagnostičkih postupaka u kardiologiji, praktički u svakoj sferi kardiologije, a posljedično tome pali su i kardiokiruški volumeni. To naravno nije praćeno podjednakim rezultatima u kardijalnoj kirurgiji, znači bolestnici sa kardiokiruškom patologijom nedvojbeno su stradali u ovoj COVID pandemiji, ne samo od COVID-a, nego i radi COVID-a. Koji su točni brojevi, zapravo u ovom trenutku ne možemo reći, ali možemo naslutiti. Znači, većina centara imala je pad volumena između 50 i 75%. Ima iznimaka, bolnica u kojoj ja radim, znači klinički bolnički centar Zagreb je među i tim iznimkama. Mi smo specifično bili COVID negativna bolnica, za razliku od susjedne bolnice u gradu Zagrebu, koja je druga najveća bolnica u Hrvatskoj, koja je bila pretvorena u COVID bolnicu i koja je imala potpuno suspenziju svojeg kardiokiruškog programa. Mi, nažalost, a niti nitko drugi u Hrvatskoj nije mogao 
odgovoriti tom izazovu gubitka operacijskog volumena kliničke bolnice Dubrava, tako da je sigurno ostao jedan bolestnik, postatak bolestnika, posebno iz sfere elektivnih bolestnika koji nisu bili rješeni. Znači, više od 30% centara u svijetu je izgubilo barem 50% svojih operacijskih sala i kreveta u jedinici intenzivnog liječenja. Više od 30% kardijalnih kirurga je bilo barem privremeno translocirano na neke druga radna mjesta koje nemaju veze sa kardijalnom kirurgijom. Veliki broj centara je suspendirao u potpunosti akademske aktivnosti, podučavanje studenta i specializanata. Stradali su također follow-up sastanci sa bolesnicima. Svi znamo koliko to znači za kvalitetu liječenja. Više od 90% centara je imalo restrikciju na samo urgentne i najžurnije bolesnike, a 5%, tako je u Hrvatskoj bila i Dubrava, je u potpunosti obustavila svoje programe. Vrlo kratko kako je to izgledalo u našem centru. Bolesnici koji su bili najžurnije bolesnici tipa disekcije, rupture i tako dalje, oni su bili testirani prije ulazka u operacijsku dvoranu, ali taj rezultat testa nije utjecao na brzinu ulazka u operacijsku dvoranu. Međutim, do trenutka kad je operacija završila, već se znao da li su to bolesnici COVID pozitivni i negativni. Ako su negativni, išli su u našu standardnu kardiokiruvičku intenzivnu, oni koji su bili pozitivni išli su u dezignirani centar za to. Kod bolesnika koji su nižeg stupnja hitnosti, ali su u bolnici, oni bi bili testirani, negativni operirani na rebru, a pozitivni operirani u COVID dezigniranoj bolnici, a oni koji su elektivni, najvećim dijelom taj program je bio barem privremeno potpuno suspendiran, a onda kad smo ga ponovno okrenuli sa njime, ti bolesnici su naravno bili izvan bolnički testirani i ovisno o rezultatu bio je daljni protokol njihovog liječenja. Sve to je, ja mislim da je važno za reč kao uvod u ono što se događalo sa bolesnicima sa uznapredovalom fazom srčanog zatejenja koji su trebali kardiokiruške intervencije. Što se L-vadova tiče, osim praktičkog gubitka elektivnih L-vadova, jer više od 80% onih koje smo mi operirali ove godine su nam došli sa ECMO-om, Sama COVID patologija dovodi do porasta tromboembolijskog potencijala i sam inherentni problem koji bolesnici sa elvadom imaju, koji proizlazi iz ekspozicije krvi neendotelnoj površini, je doradno egzacerbiran sa COVID-om. Osim toga, ono što sam napomenuo, već primarna parenhimska bolest pluća dovešće do doradne disfunkcije desnog ventrikla, a i određene pozicije koje se koriste u respiratornoj insuficijenci poput pronacije nisu moguće kod ovih bolesnika. Što se tiče transplantacijskog programa koji čini drugu ruku, naravno uz napredovale faze srčanog oboljenja, što se tiče kiruškog liječenja, nikakve dvojbe nema da su ti bolesnici podložni COVID-19 infekcijama, ali to je zapravo manje važno za ovaj razgovor. Više je važno što ne znamo uopće koji bi bili imunosupresijski protokoli koji su primjereni njima sve ide nekakvim metodama pokušaja i pogreške. A druga stvar, postoje, ali barom na početku, postoje nedostatak protokolizacije interinstitucionalnih, ali i međudržavnih suradnji. Mi smo dio eurotransplanta, u jednom određenom trenutku sva međudržavna izmjena organa je zapravo bila zaustavljena. I to me dovodi do ovog slajda u kojem bih htio ilustrirati što se dogodilo sa kardiokiruškim programom što se tiče transplantacije jelovodova na KBC u Zagreb. Znači, mi smo u 2021. godini vidjeli porast od preko 200% transplantiranih bolesnika i gotovo 400% bolesnika kojima smo ugradili Elvadova i ponavljam, velik broj njih, najveći broj njih je dolazio na nekom obliku temporerne mehaničke potpore srcu. Zašto je to važno? To može biti statistička anomalija. Ja osobno ne mislim da je to statistička anomalija, već posljedica činjenice da su bolesnici u prethodnih godinu dana koji bi inače bili kandidati za konvencionalno kardiokiruško liječenje, došli toliko kasno u bolnicu da im konvencionalno kardiokiruško liječenje više nije moglo pomoći i onda su postali kandidati za neki od oblika mehaničke potpore srcu ili zamjene srčanog tkiva. Ako pogledamo to u usporedbi sa cijelim 11-godišnjim perirom, također ćemo vidjeti preko 100% povećanje transplantacijskog programa i gotovo 200% povećanje programa što se tiče Elvada. Ovo je dosadašnji portfolio mehaničkih potpora srca koje su postele na KBC u Zagreb. 
Osim standardnog ECMA započeli smo sa Impela programom u našem velikom iskustvu od jednog bolesnika. Taj bolesnik sada čeka upgrade na neki od trajnih, durabilnih mehaničkih potpora srcu i ovdje su navedeni ostali uređaje koje smo koristili. To je naša prošlost. Čarvika i Reliant Harta više nema, one su dio naše prošlosti i ostaću u prošlosti, osim kada bi došlo do radikalne promjene paradigme, a ne vidim je na horizontu. Što se tiče Taha i Sinkardije, ugradio sam dvije i mislim da tu treba reći da postoje tri problema. Najmanji od tih problema je tehnička kompleksnost ugradnje, on to je značajno kompliciraniji zahod nego što je to ugradnja pumpe, kao što je Hardware ili Hardmate. Drugi problem svakako je kvaliteta života tih bolesnika nakon ugradnje. Od ta dva bolesnika koje smo ugradili, prvi bio otpušten kući, bio šest mjeseci kući, čekajući srce, nakon čega je dobio masivno intrakranijsko krvarenje i nikad nije doživio transplant, a drugi od tih bolesnika nikad nije izašao van iz bolnice nakon dva mjeseca liječenja u jedinici intenzivnog liječenja. Snašlo ga je ono što će svakog bolesnika koji je dva mjeseca u intenzivnoj snači, a to su septične komplikacije i on nikad nije izašao van iz bolnice. Sa osobitim žaljenjem moram reći da hardware sada ulazi u ovu zagradu. Mi smo imali solidno iskustvo sa hardwareom i mislim da je šteta što je Metronik odlučio da tehnički izazovi pred kojima su se našli, umjesto da budu potice za unapređenje tehnologije, su doveli do privremene suspenzije tog programa. Ponavljam, privremene, ja se tako nadam. A razlog od čega se nadam je zato što monopol koji će EBOT sada imati ja mislim da je odličan put u stagnaciju tehnologije, jer impetus za razvitkom te tehnologije je nestao. Ja sam malo promijenio svoju strategiju u gradnji Elvadova i krenuo sam na minimalno invazivno u gradnji zadnjih dvije godine. Mislim da je to zapravo misnomer, ne vidim ništa minimalno invazivno u toj proceduri, a pokušat ću objasniti koji je moj racional za to. Svatko ko je radio transplante, ne znam da li radite transplantacije nakon hardmate-ova, pretpostavljam da da, ili hardware-ova, ali svako ko ih radi zna da se radi o tehnički zahtivnom zahvatu koji daleko nadilaze kompleksnost standardne reoperacije. Zapravo to su prilično različiti zahvati u kojima je interakcija između vada i izvan tijelosnog krvotoka, dakle kardiopulmonarnog bajpasa, iznimno važna i u kojemu tehničko odstranjenje te količine stranog materijala predstavlja izazov. Danas to znači radim kroz lijevo anterolateralnu torakotomiju, to nije mala torakotomija, nije moguće ugraditi pumpu kroz malu torakotomiju i opet tu je hardware bio jednostavniji za ugraditi kao što je to u lateralu nego što je to Heartmate 3. Za Heartmate 3 Moram reći da za uređaje od 100.000 eura ja uzmem škare za žicu i izrežem metalni okvir koji na Hartmetu 3 postoji jer to olakšava ugradnju unutra. Znači, malo brutalno, to je nešto što radi većina centara koja ugrađuje Hartmet 3 kroz lateralnu torakotomiju. Srećom, Ebot je napokon izašao van sa prstenom koji će to omogućiti bez tako jednog radikalnog poteza, ali on neophodan. Druga stvar je aortalna anastomoza ide putem gornje hemisternotomije. Ona je nešto veća nego što bi radio za mini AVR, znači ne nekakvih 6 cm kroz treći interkostalni prostor, nego sigurno 8 do 10 kroz četvrti. Razlog za to je jednostavnije uhvatiti outflow graft i spriječiti twist outflow grafta koji je ključni parametar u uspjehu ovog operacijskog zahvata. Potpuno sam praktički izbjegao koristiti sva topikalna hemostatska sredstva, kao što je to bio glu posebno. Pokušavam minimalizirati korištenje pleđita, dakle radim to sada više sa jednim produžnim šavom, a sve to samo zato da bi transplantacija srca koja slijedi bila tehnički jednostavnija, brža i ti se bolesnici nakon toga značajno bolje oporavljaju. Kao i kod svake pleđe, kao i kod svake ugradnje Elvada, ključna je i prioperacijska ehokardiografska priprema, ali osobito intraoperacijska. Ja vjerujem da većina nas koja ugrađuje pumpe koristi digitalnu impresiju Apexa kako bi se identificiralo mjesto u kojemu će pumpa biti najbolje usmjerena prema mitralnom zalisku i udaljena i od lateralne i od septalne stjenke. 
Taj dio je zapravo kompliciraniji kroz anterolateralnu torakotomiju. Kutevi nisu jednako pogodni kao što je to kroz puno sternotomiju i treba obratiti tome posebnu pozornost, zato što na ovom slajdu se vidi, ovo su kompjuterski modelirani protoci krvi, ovo u sredini crno se vidi zapravo adekvatno pozicionirana inflow kanila, ovi ove konvolucije, ovi zapravo protoci označavaju koliko postoji turbulencije unutar ljevog ventriklija. Ako vidite dislokaciju u bilo kojem ekstremu, što je udaljenija pozicija kanile od idealne, postoji sve više i više turbulencije. To se može prikazati sa markiranim trombocitima, kao što je to ovdje. Ukratko, što je manje točkica, to je bolje. To su suspendirani trombociti koji ostaju na jednoj određenoj poziciji i zapravo su surogat pokazatelj intraventikulne staze, a svi znamo što to znači za bolesnika sa elvodom. Evo, u konačnici ja bih rekao da što se tiče COVID-19 pandemije u našem iskustvu, ona je dovela do označene redukcije u volumenu ukupnom kardiokiruške, kada govorimo o svjetskom nivou. Mi na Rebru nismo imali taj slučaj, ali praktički samo zato što smo preuzeli teret koji je nastao gubitkom kliničke bolnice Dubrava. Također, mi smo u sklopu medicinskog fakulteta bili primorani suspendirati rad sa studentima, rad sa vanjskim specializantima također bio suspendiran. Postoji sigurno shift prema visokorizičnim bolesnicima, upravo zato što proporcija elektivnih bolesnika više nije onaka kakva je bila prije i u konačnici mi ne znamo koji su dugoročne sekvele ovog COVID-19, to ćemo tek vidjeti. Na samom kraju htio bih vas pozvati kao predsjednik Hrvatskog društva za kardijalnu kirurgiju sljedeće godine u Opatiju, kada ćemo mi imati svoj nacionalni kongres i bila bi mi čast da tamo prisustujete. Hvala još jednom na pozivu i na pozornosti. Zahvaljujemo se profesoru Gašpareviću. Ja te pozivam da sednemo sad ovde zajedno možda da započnemo diskusiju. Pa dok ne vidimo da li postoji još neko pitanje iz publike, ja bih imao evo jedno možda dva, tri pitanja pa da vidimo da započnemo diskusiju. Prvo, čime objašnjavaš tako dramatičan skok u broju procedura koje su obavljene u ustanovi? Da li je to samo zato što je Dubrava obustavila program? ili ima još nešto, da li ste imali problem sa nekim transplantiranim ili vad bolesnikom u smislu da je postoperativno postao COVID pozitivan i šta ste sa takvim bolesnikom radili ukoliko jeste? Hvala na pitanju. Ja mislim da je ključan razlog, dakle definitivno gubitak KB Dubrava ima utjeca na to jer oni su jedini dodatni centar u Hrvatskoj koji ima transplantacijski program i vad program, Međutim, ja uistinu mislim da je najveći razlog to što su bolesnici sa konvencionalnim patologijama gdje je mogao sa akutnim infarktom dobiti dva stenta ili tri bajpasa, čekao je doma sa idejom ne idem u bolnicu, ne želim dobiti COVID u bolnici i onda strada od posljedica infarkta miokarda sa intraktabilnim poremećem. Tako vidjeli smo velik broj bolesnika, značajno veći nego prije, koji su došli u egzistencijalnim ekstremima, i bili postavljeni na ECMO prije nego što smo im ugrađivali bilo pumpu, bilo transplantaciju. Tako da mislim da je to multifaktorijalno i gubitkom kliničke bolnice Dubrava, ali ipak ja mislim i velikim dijelom radi zakašnjile diagnostike koja je nešto što vidimo na svjetskom nivou. Što se tiče COVID-19 i naših bolesnika sa uznapredovalim srčinim zatenjenjem nismo imali niti jednog transplantiranog, ali imali smo vad pacijenta koji je postao COVID pozitivan i koji je imao zapravo jednu poslijeoperacijsku komplikaciju, prokrvario je u ljevi toraks, nakon čega je trebao ići na žurnu zapravo tipa tri tjedna nakon operacijskog zahvata žurnu intervenciju, nakon čega se vidjelo da je COVID pozitivan, iako je više struko prije toga bio COVID negativan i on je bio premješten u kliničku bolnicu Dubrava kao COVID dezigniranu bolnicu, nakon čega se je negativizirao i vraćen je ponovno nama na nastavak liječenja i u konačnici je otpušten. Znači nije ga to koštalo glave, ali transplantiranje bolesnika sa COVID-om zapravo nismo imali. Ja samo se nadovežem na ovo prethodno pitanje. Interesuje me za tog jednog, ako imate follow-up za što je rađen Elvad kao COVID pozitivan ili ošte neki podaci iz literature, 
kako generalno su prošli pacijenti koji su transplantirani, koji su bili COVID pozitivni, a imali su transplantaciju ili implantaciju jelvada? Ima li neki... Dakle, jedini članak na tu temu, pripremajući se za ovo sam pogledao što se tiče transplantiranih bolesnika gdje nisu našli akutnog problema. Dakle, ukazuje se na to da zapravo niko ne zna koje su dugoročne sekvele, ali COVID pozitivan bolesnik, COVID pozitivni bolesnici, ali sve su to minijaturne jednoznamenkaste serije, nije se mogao identificirati nekakav specifičan problem. Je identificiran specifičan problem u okviru LVAD populacije, jer COVID-19, kao što svi znamo, nosi inherentni protrombotički potencijal, što dodatno doprinosi problemu sa bolesnikom koji već ima LVAD ugrađen. Ali to, ponavljam još jednom, po onome što sam našao u literaturi, zapravo su jedna znamenkasti brojevi, a mi u našem iskustvu imamo doslovno samo jednog bolesnika za kojeg znamo. Evo, tako, to je ono što bih mogao reći sa te strane. Niste ništa u protokolu antikulantne lečenje, niste davali nikakve druge šeme, sve kao da je... Ne, mi ih držimo na... ANR-u između 2 i 3 i dobivaju antiagregacijsku terapiju aspirinom, ali zapravo osim toga nismo ništa mijenjali. U nedostatku podataka u literaturi mislim da je to jedna od onih wait and see strategija. Ono što bi ja tebi pitao vezano uz lateral, ne znam da li si, mi sigurno si primijetio, ono što meni nije bilo u lateralu sasvim jasno, je 140 i par bolesnika je regrutirano, 144, jel? U 26 centara. Znači, to je pet i pol pacijenata po centru. Zašto bi tako veliki centri, jer tamo je i Georg Wieseltaler i Martin Struber, jako puno zapravo velikih imena u tom radu, je regrutiralo samo pet pacijenata po centru i onda je follow-up bio samo šest mjeseci. To je ono što je bio moja osnovna zamjerka lateralu, jer mi u našem iskustvu, iako nemojte me krivo shvatiti, meni je iznimno žao što je hardware nestao. Najmanji pacijent kojim sam ja ugradio hardware bila je djevojčica od osam godina. Znači, djevojčica od osam godina gdje je taj hardware zapravo dosezao lateralnu stjenku i nismo inicijalno primarno uopće mogli nju zatvoriti, što bi bilo potpuno nemoguće sa bilo kojim od hardmate-ova. I on je za tu djevojčicu predstavljao jedino rješenje u onom trenutku. Ali naš problem sa hardverom se zapravo vidio u dužem follow-up od šest mjeseci. Hvala na tom pitanju. Mislim da je to izvanredno pitanje koje može da bude postavljeno i mnogo šire. Dakle, mnoge kardiohiruške ili interventne studije ne uzimaju u obzir consecutive patients, odnosno ne uzimaju u obzir sve bolesnike koji su urađene u određenom vremenskom periodu. Ja sam siguran, to ne piše u radu koji je izašao, dakle da se ne radi o konsekutivnim, odnosno o svim bolesnicima koji su u tim centrima ugrađeni u tom vremenskom periodu. Kad vi pravite tako brižljivu patient selection, odnosno selekciju bolesnika, onda i ti rezultati ne mogu da budu adekvatno interpretirani na real life situaciju. Mislim da se mi u tome možemo definitivno složiti. Odnosno, mi ćemo imati rezultat koji nam reflektuje ono što je ta studija, kako je ta studija dizajnirana. A ako bi pogledali registar, recimo istih tih centara, moguće je da bi real life situacija bila potpuno drugačija. I to jeste glavna zamerka i toj studiji i mnogim drugim studijama u kardiohirurgiji generalno. Zato su registri često pouzdanije nego što su to prospektivne studije ovakvog karaktera. Ja bih samo komentirao jednu drugu stvar. Kao osoba koja je krenula prije par godina u taj program ugradnje nazovi minimalno invazivnih vladova, ponavljam još jedno, mislim da je to misnomer i da bi bilo bolje da postoji drugačiji termin za to. Ja ću to raditi bolesnicima koji su višeg stupnja elektivnosti, dakle manjeg stupnja hitnosti. Čovjek koji je na ekmu ili čovjek kojemu treba napraviti još predruženu aortnu valvulu ili čovjek kojemu treba bilo što drugo osim ugradnje vada, ići će na punu sternotomiju. Drugim riječima, radi se već tu o jednoj autoselekciji gdje će na manje invazivni zahvat, kao što je to torakotomijska, ministernotomijska kombinacija, zapravo, barem u mojim rukama, ići osoba koja je nižeg risk profila. Da, ja sam baš to htio da te pitam i možda ja ne znam da li smo sa vremenom već kratki, ali samo kratko, da li 
će postojati određena grupa bolesnika kod kojih ćeš dalje primjenjivati minitora kotomiju, da li su to samo ridu pacijenti, recimo to je ono što je meni delovalo kao jedna prednost u odnosu na full sternotomiju, da li su to bolesnici sa slabom funkcijom desne komore, ili ćeš svičovati kao što ima centara koji su svičovali potpuno na taj, slažem se, ne minimalno invazivni, nego less invasive ili kako god da ga nazovemo. Ja u ovom trenutku imam neki profil bolestnika kojima to ne bi radio. Dakle, ne bi radio bolestniku koji ima marginalnu funkciju desnog ventrikla, gdje mislim da je sasvim solidna vjerojatnost da će mi trebati barem privremeno ervat. Jer postaviti ervat kroz taj pristup nije jednostavno. Tehnički je moguće, ali nije jednostavno. Znači, bolestnik sa marginalnom funkcijom desnog ventrikla u mojim rukama ići će na punu sternotomiju, što mi olakšava ugradnju ervada. Druga stvar, bolesnici, ima jedan jedini bolesnik od kojeg sam krenuo sa manje invazivnom metodom i nisam uspio napraviti, je bio bolesnik koji je imao tešku kronično obstruktivnu bolest pluća i stvarno vrlo neugodan bačvosti toraks. Njemu bi se kroz minimalno invazivni zahvat mogao zamijeniti aortalni zalistak, ali nije bilo moguće postići nježnu kurvaturu outflow grafta koju želimo da ne postoji problem što se tiče protočnosti toga. Znači, osim tih anatomskih i funkcijskih metoda, ja bi svakog drugoga barem evaluirao za manje invazivan pristup, ali u mojim rukama to neće, ja mislim, nikad biti 100% portfelja. Hvala lepo. Ne znam da li imamo neko pitanje. Mislim da je vreme da završimo, ukoliko ne. Ja se zahvaljujem profesoru Gašparoviću i kompaniji Metronik na organizovanom simpozijumu. Pozivam vas na kratku pauzu i mi nastavljamo u 11.30, je li tako, Marko? Hvala lepo. Hvala. So I'd like to welcome you all to the session on valve disease and heart failure. Uh, it's my pleasure to first announce uh, Mr. Benitska. He's going to talk to us about cardiac MRI and the advantages and defects in evaluating patients with valve disease and heart failure. Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues, uh, uh, it's my great honor and pleasure to return to Belgrade and give this talk. So what the guideline says, MRI could be used in patients with inadequate echocardiographic quality or discrepant findings to assess severity of valvular lesion, left ventricular volumes and ejection fraction, pathology of ascending aorta and myocardial fibrosis. However, there are emerging data that suggest much broader role of MRI in the evaluation of patients with valvular heart disease during all the steps of clinical management going from initial diagnosis through follow-up uh, timing of intervention and at all these steps with prognostic implications. So we can use MRI to assess mechanism of valvular disease, although this is more domain of echo. MRI provide, provide accurate quantitative assessment of valvular heart disease severity. It's the gold standard to evaluate left ventricle volumes and ejection fraction, which, which you know is class one indication. And it has unique place among non-invasive imaging techniques to evaluate myocardial fibrosis which probably may serve as the marker of early left ventricular decompensation in patients with valvular heart disease. In my talk today, I will concentrate on three valvular diseases with high prevalence in our countries, and that's aortic stenosis, mitral regurgitation, and aortic regurgitation. I will skip right heart for, for the sake of time. So in aortic stenosis, MRI could be used to assess morphology of the aortic valve, bicuspid, tricuspid, and you agree this is not always so clear from echo. The MRI images are very clear, uh, and uh, you can also perform easily the planimetry of the aortic valve. However, MRI is not good to assess velocity and gradients through the valve because they are usually underestimated compared with echo. However, what is all about in patients with aortic stenosis is assessment on the underlying myocardium. So as you know, aortic valve re replacement is indicated in patients with severe aortic stenosis and sign of left ventricular decompensation, such as symptoms or left ventricular ejection, drop in ejection fraction. However, it seems that myocardial fibrosis provides early marker of left ventricular decompensation before developing of these conventional markers. So when we talk about myocardial fibrosis, we have two types of fibrosis that could be assessed using MRI. First is diffuse myocardial fibrosis, which is microscopic. 
uh, the sequence is T1 mapping and the parameters that we use is T1 time or extracellular volume. And this is partially reversible after art articular intervention. Then we have replacement fibrosis of SCAR, uh, which is uh, SS using delayed enhancement sequence, express as percentage of SCAR in percentage of grams. And we have two types. We have non-ischemic type, typically located midventricular or subepicardial, and then ischemic type, typically subendocardial or transmural. There are several studies involving hundreds or more, more than thousands of patients already that show that myocardial scar is pre highly prevalent in patients with aortic valve stenosis, and both diffuse and replacement fibrosis correlate with aortic stenosis severity, symptoms, hypertrophy, ejection fraction, and what is more important even, they are independent predictors of all-cause mortality, and these negative effect on mortality persists even after aortic valve intervention. So it's not completely reversed by aortic valve intervention. Myocardial fibrosis progress with time. This is the study that mapped uh, nature prognosis of nature history of myocardial fibrosis in patients with aortic stenosis. The first uh, panel on the left shows a situation at baseline where we see non-ischemic type myocardial fibrosis in anterolateral wall. One year later, this fibrosis is still there. Patient was observed, managed conservatively. But you see there are no areas, new areas of fibrosis developing in the septum. And after aortic valve intervention, two years later from baseline, of course, this per, uh, fibrosis stays there. It's irreversible. So it seems that myocardial fibrosis is a key process in left ventricular decompensation. And there are currently several studies uh, trying to see uh, if the early intervention somewhere in this long asymptomatic course before development of classical markers, triggers for intervention, such as ejection fraction and symptoms, if the intervention at this course is beneficial, such as avatar trial run here by Dr. Banovich, or evolved trial in, in uh, UK. I think we have heard about this trial already this morning. So when we move to the regurgitation, MRI could be used for quantitative assessment of severity for assessment of left ventricular volume and ejection fraction and myocardial fibrosis. In case of mitral regurgitation, the recommended parameters by several recent guidelines are uh, uh, MR regurgitant volume and regurgitant fraction. They are calculated by combining two, two sequences, Cine sequence, which is used to derive left ventricular stroke volume, and flow sequence at the level of sinotubular junction to derive aortic forward stroke volume. Although this method is indirect and you need two sequences, it's very reproducible and accurate. It's important to realize that there is high prevalence of discordant findings in categorization of MR severity between echo and MRI. And it's not surprising. These are two different methods. Up to now, we had only echo. Now we have another player in the arena, and there is high prevalence of discordant findings. Generally speaking, in primary mitral regurgitation, Echocardiography overestimate of MRI underestimate the regurgitant volume depending on the view. In secondary mitral regurgitation, MRI uh, echo underestimate error uh, compared with MRI. We have several studies both in primary and secondary mitral regurgitation involving hundreds of patients that derived prognostic prognostically based cutoff value of regurgitant volume and regurgitant fraction for the endpoints of mortality and toward mitral valve interventions. So in primary mitral regurgitation, these cutoff values are mitral regurgitant volume 50, 55 milliliters. So it's, you see it's lower than, the, than the, that we use on echo. Regurgitant fraction 40%, and also end systolic volume index and end diastolic volume index were independent predictors. In secondary mitral regurgitation on the right, it seems that mitral regurgitant fraction with cutoff 30, 35% is the best parameter to categorize prognostically severe mitral regurgitation. Assessment of myocardial fibrosis is very important both in primary and secondary mitral regurgitation. This is the example of patient with primary mitral regurgitation, large recent studies involving 424 patients with primary mitral regurgitation. Roughly half of them had mitral valve prolapse etiology and another half non-prolapse etiology of mitral regurgitation. And you can see that diffuse myocardial fibrosis represented by extracellular volume increase in relationship with increasing severity of mitral regurgitation. And it makes sense. More volume overload, more myocardial damage. However, when you look at the replacement fibrosis on the right, 
you see that patients with mitral valve prolapse in green had disproportionately larger extent of replacement myocardial fibrosis or scar if you want compared with non-prolapse etiology. This has been confirmed also by other studies. Myocardial scar is detected in approximately 30% of patients with mitral valve prolapse. And there are some typical places like basal inter inferolateral wall or papillary muscle. It means the region that are most stretch of strain uh, uh, in this disease. Also, replacement myocardial fibrosis increase, increase in proportion with severity of mitral regurgitation. However, and that's interesting, already in patients with trace mitral regurgitation, some percentage has already scar, myocardial scar, some percentage has dilated per ventricle, and 50% has premature ventricular beats. So there is ongoing process in the myocardium of this patient even before development of mitral regurgitation. And myocardial scar independently contributes to the risk uh, of these patients and probably it's important component of arrhythmic risk of the small subgroup of the patient with mitral valve prolapse. Secondary mitral regurgitation, so the prognostic impact of secondary mitral regurgitation depends on the scar burden. There were two large studies showing that recently in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and both ischemic and non-ischemic etiology. The first study on the left shows that severe mitral regurgitation defined by regurgitant fraction more than 30% was associated with outcome only in patients with myocardial scar, but not in the patient without scar. The second study on the right shows that hazard ratio for deaths increased disproportionately in patients with severe mitral regurgitation and large extent of myocardial scar compared with less myocardial scar. So there is important interaction between mitral regurgitation and scar. And when we move to aortic regurgitation, the last part of my talk, MRI can provide comprehensive assessment of aortic regurgitation, including morphology of the aortic valve, tricuspid, bicuspid, dilatation of the aorta, aortic root, assessment of severity, ejection fraction volume, and of course, aortic uh, myocardial fibrosis. The recommended parameters to assess, quantify aortic regurgitation using MRI are, again, regurgitant volume and regurgitant fraction which are derived using flow sequence at the level of semitubular junction or even closer to the leaflets if, if there is no turbulent flow. I will not go into technical details. There are several studies that derive cutoff values for regurgitant fraction and regurgitant volume in asymptomatic patient with moderate and severe aortic regurgitation. And in this case, it's to predict aortic valve intervention. So we don't have mortality data, but we have predictors of aortic valve interventions. And what is important to note that single MRI derived parameter had a large area under the curve that eight, param or seven, no, eight parameters echocardiographic uh, integrated in the integrative approach. This is our study that we have performed in 128 patients asymptomatic moderate to severe aortic regurgitation. And this is the plot showing the selection of the predictors, echo and MRI of outcome of aortic valve intervention in this case. And you see the parameters in the red are significant. You have here on the CMR the right parameters, regurgitant fraction, regurgitant volume, and diastolic and systolic volume, and from echo parameters, 3D vena contracta area, which is the parameter to quantify the aortic regurgitation, but we don't use it routinely. And surprisingly also transmitral E-wave and EQE prime. Again, these are the parameters that are not part of an integrative approach. We don't use them. Moving from the aortic valve to the left ventricle, uh, currently used trigger, and I'm speaking about systolic diameter index, 25 millimeters per meter square, are insensitive to indicate aortic valve intervention. It has been shown in two very large recent studies when they show that the mortality risk increases already from cutoff values 20. In fact, 25 seems to be too late, both before and after aortic valve replacement. And when we look at the gender comparison comparison between left ventricular dilatation and severity of aortic regurgitation, you see that the woman for the given degree of aortic regurgitation never reach the degree of dilatation as the man even after indexing for body surface area. So this is definitely too late. And again, I come back to myocardial fibrosis, which maybe may be uh, also here serve as the early marker of left ventricular decompensation. It has been shown in a recent large study that show that myocardial scar is independent predictor of outcome 
while end systolic diameter or ejection fraction were not in that study. Is every patient with fallible heart disease suitable to go for MRI evaluation? Of course not. There are absolute contraindications. There are patients with claustrophobia. There are patients who are critically ill or patient non compliant that cannot lay quietly in the scanner or hold breath for 20 seconds. Uh, we also don't like irregular heart rate because uh, we reconstruct the uh, sequences from several beats. And also concomitant malural heart disease of shunts are uh, not, not good. And there are some technical things and also limited expertise and equipment. So to conclude, MRI uh, has important clinical value in patients with aortic stenosis and regurgitant lesions. We have outcome-based cutoff values of regurgitant volume and regurgitant fraction to categorize disease severity. And we have unique information, MRI can provide unique information on myocardial fibrosis as a marker of early left ventricular decompensation with prognostic implications. So I can conclude with the same slide as two years ago that although the echocardiography is the first choice, of course, MRI should be more liberally used on inpatient with valvular heart disease. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, maybe we have time for, for one or two short questions. I, uh, just just to, to, to clarify it for, for me as a surgeon, uh, we are talking about asymptomatic aortic stenosis patients. Mm -hmm. So do you suggest to uh, do the echo in every, pa uh, so, uh, sorry, M MRI in every patient with asymptomatic aortic stenosis, uh, with, uh, which is of course severe uh, symptomatic aortic stenosis, and is there any cutoff of Amount of, amount of myocardial fibrosis which is going to lead these patients to the early surgery or, or it is just, uh, let's say, uh, some kind of link between clinical status of the patient and the, and the MRI find, finding. Thank you for this question. Uh, so uh, if the capacity allows, I would suggest to do MRI in every patient with asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis uh, and preserved ejection fraction uh, because uh, there are studies showing that it has important prognostic information. It may pinpoint, uh, like select the one quarter or one third of patients uh, who will have already delayed enhancement and probably uh, are better managed with early intervention. It's not yet in the guidelines. There are some ongoing randomized trials. Uh, uh, to the other question, uh, in that studies, any scar was associated with bad outcome and also ischemic type of scar, although probably non-ischemic has more value. Um, but there is, a, in my opinion, common sense that more, more scar versus prognosis. But any scar matters. Maybe I just can lean on, on your question, Martin. Um, what decides if patients will develop first the, the, the diffuse uh, myocardial fibrosis and uh, not uh, um, mid-wall fibrosis? Is it that diffuse always comes first and then follows with uh, mid-wall fibrosis? Or just is there any prognostic factor? What decides what, what's going to be? Will patient develop uh, diffuse or, or, or mineral fibrosis? Is it related to ischemia or, mm -hmm. in, in, for example, in patients with valvular disease? So uh, we have a ischemic scar, which could be surprising finding on MRI and point our attention to incidental coronary artery disease, which is quite prevalent as we have seen in our study in patients with severe stenosis. But uh, to, back to the question: to diffuse fi fibrosis should come first. But the problem with MRI is that uh, the assessment is uh, challenging. The scar is very easy, but the assessment of diffuse myocardial fibrosis is still challenging. So I would not recommend it as the first, uh, first line parameter. But normally it should come first before, before replacement fibrosis. OK, thank you very much for, for your beautiful presentation. Sada bih pozvao profesora Ivana Stojanovića. Uz veliku zahvalnost što nam se priključio danas po ovom lepom vremenu napolje. Dakle, da nam prezentuje replacement or repair in heart failure patients with primary MR. Uh, dear colleagues and dear guests, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to, 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 to respond to, to, to kind uh, uh, call for, from Dr. Banović and Professor Putnik to, to present uh, some insight on. Uh, on patients with primary MR in, in heart failure and want to do with them whether to repair or to replace. 
uh, it is difficult to, to find too many papers on this topic because generally today mitral valve repair is a golden standard and is uh, generally accepted and performed, although and unfortunately is performed only in 60 to 70 percent of MRs uh, worldwide. Uh, this is a, this is a, a, a study of 20-year uh, follow-up outcome. It's a multi-center study. Uh, it was following uh, around uh, 2,000 patients, 700 with repair and 200 with replacement. And of course, as we know, it's nothing new that mitral valve repair demonstrates superior survival. Uh, uh, both, you know, in the early post-operative period and uh, in propensity-matched population thereafter, uh, in the same period. And we, we see those data on 20 years follow-up, uh, mitral valve repair is, I mean, it's nothing new, uh, continues to be superior both for overall population and both for, you know, Propensity in propensity matched cohorts regarding age, EF, NIHA class, and other uh, major pathology, pathologies that could influence the outcome of the procedure. And uh, it continues, you know, particularly to be uh, favorable comparing to mitral valve replacement when you see major, uh, you know, uh, heart uh, function data as EF or you know, hard diameters and so on and so on. So, I mean, nothing, nothing special. We, we, we all knew that mitral valve repair should be done and it is a gold standard. But when we are trying to answer the questions regarding wh what to do in patients with uh, heart failure and primary uh, mitral insufficiency, it's a little bit uh, different and difficult to give a straightforward answer. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a study from Duke University with, uh, 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 the, uh, of 101 patients and uh, you see that uh, mortality in those patients, uh, uh, operative mortality was 30%. Those patients are a, a, a composed group of primary and secondary MR and the uh, overall uh, survival at five years is uh, 70%. And primary and secondary MR, uh, comparing their survival, are approaching at the five-year period that have no, no, no statistic, statistic difference. What does it mean? It means that uh, when you have a heart failure, <laughs> both primary and secondary MR behave in the same way regarding the prognosis because that's what I'm always talking to, to, to my patients that we cardiac surgeon could operate anything except the heart. So we can replace a valve, you can repair a valve, repair or replace an aorta doing cabbage surgery, but we cannot, we can't do too much with, 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 uh, with the dead heart, with heart that is not functioning, with the, with, the, with the myocardium that is lost. And you can see really that, uh, you know, although primary, primary uh, MR repaired, primary MR has better outcome at five-year period, there is no statistic difference comparing uh, to, to patients with, uh, uh, with secondary MR. And also, you know, in both group, you know, they behave this, the, the, almost the same. I, I forgot to say that th those patients are selected as a patients with a EF less than 40%. Uh, this is a one of, of, uh, of rare uh, where, uh, papers that, that, are, that, are, that are following or, and comparing vital regurgitation in dilated and ischemic cardiomyopathy in patients with uh, mean ejection fraction of 0 0.32. And you see the mitral valve replacement is uh, inferior regarding hospital mortality. And we all know that, you know, without preserving uh, subvalvular apparatus, this myocardium is not the same after the surgery. So that's the, the main advantage of, of mitral valve uh, repair. Uh, 
at, uh, at, at uh, eight years uh, follow-up, follow there is a mitral valve repair uh, that is superior to, to, to mitral valve replacement in those patients. And as we see also, there is a huge improvement, not huge, it's, a, it's a too, too hard word, there is an improvement in LV function in those patients. So we can get a straightforward conclusion that, okay, we know mitral valve repair is better and we can do, and we have to do, and we should do mitral valve repair whenever it is possible to provide safe and durable repair. And that is the main question of my lecture today. Can we provide safe and durable repair in those patients? Because with primary MR, and bad left ventricle, we are operating both primary and secondary MR, and those hearts are behaving in a different way, and we have no right to, to experiment on patients, to, to do try error efforts to help them. We do not have too many chances to, 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 to repeat our surgery. Those are very fragile patients, and we have to, to do it, you know, uh, one, and to be a good and durable repair if we are doing. If we are not possible to achieve such an, re such an repair, we have, it's better to replace the valve. And, and, uh, uh, and uh, we see on, on the, this slide, you know, we are going a little bit on the, on the, on, on this, on the topic. Uh, how can we be sure that we are we are going to be to, to get a durable and 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 uh, and, uh, and good repair? You see that uh, the the main question is the surgeon experience. Uh, total uh, annular surgeon volume of more than 15 repairs provides uh, three times greater uh, bigger probability to to perform a, a, a valve repair than, a, than, a, than with surgeons that have less than 50 patients a year. So those are data on general mitral valve repair, but could, are reflecting on our topic today as well. Uh, uh, Reoperation uh, after the repair is of as well less common in patients with bigger experience. And what is very interesting uh, regarding the repair surgery, it is not a question of a one person, of a single uh, si uh, one-man show, it's a question of an institution. And uh, when you see an institution with, uh, with a high volume of mitral valve repairs, uh, and the surgeon with a low, uh, if you have a surgeon with a relatively low vo uh, repair volume a year, working in a high volume repair institution, the probability to, to, to achieve a repair is bigger than a person who is less experienced and working is in less experienced institution. Uh, when you see the morta one year mortality, mortality in patients operated on primary MR due to degenerative mitral valve regurgitation, we see that uh, experienced surgeon has a superior result, which is another, you know, quality of, of, uh, of, of doing a repair valve in highly experienced or high volume centers. And uh, if you have a patient with primary heart failure, you should address it to a center who is going either to repair or to decide uh, what is the best treatment for the patient? For the, for the patient, those are patients that are not, you know, suitable for any kind of experiment or, 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 or trying, you know, a number of of repairs of number of surgeries again and again in order to achieve. You have not, uh, not right to, to 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 make an error too much in those patients. So, if you have such a patient, just transfer to the center. We are going to decide is it going to reparable or not, and uh, you will gain a, 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 a enough uh, enough benefit for the patient, even if surgeon replace a valve and not trying to repair it. Uh, and when we are talking about, <laughs> I'm going to, to you know support all those uh, my words with some images from the OR. 
when we are talking about primary MR, we are generally talking about, you know, prolapse, P2 pros, which is, of course, the most common your entity you will find in mitral valve surgery, but uh, this also, this one is also posterior leaflet prolapse, a calcified one, or you can have anterior leaflet prolapse, or you can uh, have a anterior leaflet cleft in those patients. Those are primary degenerative mitral valve pathologies, or you can have a hypoplastic posterior leaflet, which is also primary, it's not degenerative, it's kind of a congenital uh, condition, or you can have, you know, papillary muscle dysplasia, and on plus of all those entities and the number of that which I didn't put on, on my presentation, on plus you have heart insufficiencies. So you have to really be skilled to, 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 to deal with both, uh, with both uh, problems at the same time. I will show you a, a, a short footage of a surgery uh, performed in a 37-year-old male patient uh, with the dilated left ventricle and 35% of EF fraction. The patient was operated, you know, it came as a, as, a, as a secondary MR, but generally when we opened the heart, we found a relatively hypoplastic posterior leaflet, and you will see, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the papillary muscles for the posterior leaflets, how they are dysplastic and connected to the, to the left, uh, left ventricle free wall. You see this... Uh, posterior medially papillary muscles which are really uh, not mobile enough to provide enough posterior leaflet mobility. And you will say, okay, that's a primary MR with a uh, secondary MR with a congenital, you know, dysplasia. But on the anterior leaflet, <laughs> we found the cleft, you know, there is a cleft in the, between A2 and A3 leaflet and we had to resect the cleft and to, to, to put some stitches in, in order to close it. So this is, the, this is the third pathology in these patients, and which is not unfrequent on the posterior leaflet, that those intendations between scallops, when you have a small leaflets are, are, are frequently you know, uh, stretched and you have to close it. And you, we, we got a, a very nice uh, you know, probe, but this probe is not going to, to, this MR, this valve is not going to work properly because we have, you know, LV component in all in these patients. Although was, you know, quite satisfactory results of our water probe. So we decided to, to detach the posterior leaflet from the posterior annulus. This is the reason, you know, to deliberate secondary cord and to mobilize papillary muscles in order to get more flexibility and more mobility on the papillary, on the, on the posterior leaflet. You see how these plastic papillary muscles are, and we had, like in, like in Epstein anomaly, we had to to cut uh, the, those trabeculas and to, to to free the papillary muscle from the wall to make it uh, f uh, free to move. And in order to uh, to to compensate those LV dilatation and tethering we have, we are implanted here or augmented posterior leaflet with a huge pericardial patch treated with gluter aldehyde. It's a big one and uh, generally when using a patch, we are always using the big patches and because the ventricle is dilated, the risk of SEM is, is almost zero in those patients. And you see how huge this patch. Some of the patch size is eaten with those huge bites, you know. So the uh, patch is going to get uh, smaller and smaller by the end of the surgery. I'm not that fast. <laughs> this is, you know, just a higher frame rate, I mean, uh, in order to, to obtain uh, a shorter presentation. is not looking too nice, but it's working very nicely. You will see later on. We put, you know, 30, 34 a size a CG future uh, annuloplasty ring.
and uh, this is a, a water probe after the surgery, which is difficult to perform, but with some experience, we, we, are, we, are, we are very satisfied with such a result. It's difficult to make enough pressure to, co to close the, the leaflets during the surgery if itself. And these are post-operative results. You see, can you, can you stop the video for a second? You see the posterior leaflet, this, this, is the, this, this is the remnant of the posterior leaflet free edge. And this structure here is a pericardial patch. This pericardial patch is compensating the tethering and also gets pliability and, uh, in order to obtain very, very uh, high uh, coaptation, coaptation surface or coaptation line in order to obtain durable mitral valve repair. Can you go on please with the slide? And we have no, no stenosis on the valve and the results were really excellent. Patient, you know, leave the hospital 10 days after the surgery because he spent a couple of more days in, in ICU because of the, of, the, of, the, of the heart failure situation. So, so the takeaway message from this uh, short lecture of mine is that, yes, we should perform uh, mitral valve repair in, in every patient, even in patient mid heart fail, but in if we are you know, capable to provide safe and durable repair. This is the, the cornerstone of the mitral valve repair surgery. If not, just replace it. You will, you will, you will do a you know, better choice for the patient. So uh, don't, don't, don't be ashamed if you cannot repair. Don't, don't think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's your... Uh, uh, that you not succeeded or so on. The patience is, is, is the, 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 the most important thing in surgery. You will repair in other patients. You are not God, you are something who is dealing with the material you got. And uh, it's, it's true that, uh, that it is better to, you know, uh, to obtain, it's, it's, uh, you're going to obtain better results if you operate such a patient with a high volume mitral repair surgeon and in high volume mitral repair centers. Uh, I, I really, I'm really doing a lot of mitral repairs a year and really, I mean, don't have any, any problem of mine to replace a valve with, when I'm not sure to, to, that I will, will get, you know, perfect coaptation and no MR. Those patients are just not supporting failure. Those patients just, you know, don't, don't, uh, those hearts are very bad if, if, if you will behave very badly if you left, left, you know, not perfect MR. Thank you. So, are there Can any I just questions? ask a quick yeah, question? Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate you on this interesting procedure. And I'm personally not a big fan of doing a lot of subvalvular surgery on a mitral valve repair, but this certainly looks nice. It would be interesting to see what this will look like five years after the operation and whether you're going to see any calcification in this glitteraldehyde preserved pericardium, which sometimes tends to, tends to occur. Um, I just wanted to make a brief comment when we uh, discussed, because you've only briefly mentioned this when it comes to ischemic MR. Um, that everybody who does, it, does this, uh, repairing an ischemic MR is, is probably the easiest operation that you can do on a mitral valve. However, that the 60% uh, recurrence rate of MR, as was seen in a fairly recent prospective randomized trial in the, in the New England Journal of Medicine, should certainly be cause for caution and alarm that we should probably be more liberal in actually replacing these valves when it comes to severe ischemic MR um, and not, re not necessarily repair them even though this is a very simple operation. This is, uh, this is, a, this is a huge, uh, huge topic we can, we can spend discussing on a, a, a lot of hours and it's a never, never ending, you know, talk about ischemic mitral valves. What I'm thinking about ischemic mitral valves is I just tried to mention a little bit on this slide of slide of mine because so far today I I didn't didn't realize that uh, we have enough preoperative tools or enough preoperative of awareness. Is that mitral valve fully and truly 
ischemic one or you have something uh, concomitant with this valve. So it is difficult to, to realize uh, on echo, uh, you know, the, the changes of subvalvular apparatus on, on posterior leaflet, but because if you're putting, you know, uh, downsizing uh, anuloplasty, if you made downsizing anuloplasty on, on those patients, and if you have this plastic subvalvular apparatus, which is generally going with uh, hypoplastic posterior leaflet, you're not going to, make, to obtain a durable repair even if you have nice operative re uh, results. So those are patients that should be treated on, uh, on expert, you know, uh, opinion. Those patients are on the very, very low, you know, uh, uh, level of evidence and should be treated uh, very, very specifically, each one patient as a, as a particular case, if you want to, to obtain a good result. The parameter that I've found useful really is the tenting area. I think it's a huge, uh, huge point when you're planning on repairing or replacing an ischemic valve. And I no longer repair moderate MR in patients who, are, who will um, undergo a coronary bypass surgery. I think it's been pretty safely shown that this operation makes no sense. Uh, to repair moderate MR, it may actually worsen your outcomes according to a prospective randomized trial. So I don't do that for moderate MR at all anymore. I don't know what the experience in No, we're nev is. never doing on moderate MR ischemic mitral valve repairs. We always, you know, perform, you know, on uh, moderate to severe on severe MR, but never on, on the on the on the moderate MR. It's a difficult question because you know you 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 put you put a, 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 a decision on a patient. You are heart failure patients, and that's it. But uh, I mean, if if you have you know a, a difficult anatomy, if you have you know a big obese patients, if it's time consuming, it's not you know worth to to try any any particular surgery or any and too much effort on repair. It's not good for the patient, but if you have a patient with a heart failure, it's, it's worth trying, you know, to, to repair valve if it is reasonable with all those techniques I, I mentioned in these slides. And it is, you're going to get a good result. Thank you for, for the discussion. I think, I, I, I know that we have a lot of questions. Is, is, I yeah, have a okay. question. I just, I just saw, Marek, you, I saw you. Careful about the video. <laughs> do you have any comment, anything to add? Please do. The, the only comment I would add is that uh, it's easy to say I don't repair moderate any longer. The trouble is that we don't really know what moderate means and what severe means. And it's an ongoing debate, what is really moderate, what is really severe, is it according to American guidelines, is it according to European guidelines, is it 30 mils, or is it 30 regurgitant fraction, or is it 60 mils, therefore, that you will repair and you would not touch 30 mils of regurgitant volume. Uh, I think it's, the picture is so complicated and so crowded that it's very difficult to, to clear cuts say which one I repair, which one I leave, but uh, yeah, other I than that. The, the, the thing that is clear is that the definitions of um, severity should differ between primary and secondary MR, but we deal with the data that is out there and you just basically need to base your judgment on what is known and try not to speculate as much. This is, this is how I look at the subject. So w which one do you repair? Which one is moderate to you? Is well, it, you, is it, do you follow 02 or 04? Zero 02 zero zero two for ischemic. So Americans know any longer. So yeah. if you repair 02, then you repair moderate by American yeah, standards. Th this is what I'm saying. I would not repair 02. You would not repair 02? No, I would not repair 02. I, uh, I think that anything above 02 would to me be ischemic MR. So this is the cutoff that I would use. 021 I would operate on, you see. 
Okay, and you go by ERO or you go by some kind of integrated well, approach? Well, clearly, the, go by clearly the, if, mm, the ERO is not the only thing that we would look at. We would look at the whole picture, and this is a, this is a complicated discussion that we have with our uh, Echo Lab, and I don't think you should just rely on one parameter, but you've just mentioned one parameter for the sake of this discussion. I don't think one parameter is enough, but um, if we all agree that this is ischemic MR of a moderate degree, according to... Uh, what the latest definitions would be, and this patient needs coronary bypass surgery, I would just do the coronary bypass surgery. Okay, thank you. For the sake of time, we have to, to move on. So thank you for the discussion. It was really fruitful, let's say, but a lot of questions are still going to be open even after this meeting, of course. Now I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Arsen Ristic, who have just arrived, like James Bond, <laughs> straight, straight from doors to the to the to the state so stage so uh, treatment of persistent secondary pulmonary hypertension Arsene is thank you very much and sorry for the delay and for this kind of appearance it's uh, truly an honor for me to participate in this uh, outstanding uh, meeting and uh, long standing cooperation that we have with our surgical colleagues is one of the essential uh, postulates in the, our everyday clinical practice, so it's uh, even the greater pleasure to talk on the topic that we share on uh, on daily basis. So uh, patients with uh, persistent secondary pulmonary hypertension uh, that uh, remains after uh, surgical procedures, or especially after valvular surgery, are uh, a, kind, a, a special challenge for the management. And uh, the first challenge is actually to uh, select those patients properly are actually to recognize and to perform the differential diagnosis uh, properly and uh, uh, the new revised definition of pulmonary hypertension that, that was changed after the sixth world symposium in Nice in 2018 uh, is uh, uh, has created a, a lower threshold for the diagnosis of uh, pulmonary hypertension so mean pulmonary pressure pressure above 20 millimeters of mercury is now the threshold for diagnosis, but however, uh, since all previous uh, clinical trials were performed on the previous threshold with uh, 25, this is still not, or it's a kind of a gray area for the uh, treatment and for the introduction of management even for the patients with uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. Of course, uh, capillary wedge pressure and pulmonary vascular resistance are essential uh, measures for the classification. And uh, in uh, differential diagnosis, we should actually recognize those, those patients with uh, uh, valve disease or secondary pulmonary hypertension that have a clear-cut diagnosis with uh, isolated post-capillary uh, pH. Uh, but uh, even of greater interest are those patients with uh, combined uh, post-capillary and pre-capillary disease, and uh, uh, this subset of patients uh, is the one which uh, uh, could be uh, further evaluated for the uh, for the diagnosis. So uh, just for a, for a brief uh, review and the introduction, uh, we are mainly dealing uh, with uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension patients, though that have primary disease of the pulmonary circulation, and in this area we are rather successful. We have at the moment uh, 14 registered medications, and there is uh, there are many trials uh, uh, ongoing and many advances in this area. And uh, uh, only with the monotherapy, the survival of those patients is uh, was prolonged uh, almost for a double uh, medium time. Uh, however, in uh, uh, group two or uh, patients with pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease, we are much less successful, and the valvular heart disease in this uh, in this group and uh, uh, equally, uh, several trials uh, have been unsuccessful or even harmful, harmful with uh, previously successful medications for uh, pulmonary arterial, arterial hypertension, and uh, uh, therefore, uh, management of those patients with persistent uh, pH after uh, surgery is uh, especially challenging. Uh, what is uh, what is uh, um, also important to uh, bear in mind is that uh, regardless of the uh, of the type of the left-sided uh, valvular heart disease, um, uh, pulmonary hypertension preoperatively, but also 
the one which remains after uh, surgery is uh, imposing increased uh, uh, increased risk is also uh, increasing the risk for uh, for surgery and uh, in uh, with those patients with mild and in moderate with moderate and severe uh, pH they are uh, present and uh, it is uh, uh, more than uh, in, in, in general in all valvular diseases uh, affecting the left side of the heart, uh, more than 30% of those uh, cases present uh, uh, even before surgery with uh, pulmonary hypertension of uh, moderate to severe grade. And it is uh, known for a long time. This is an original publication from Eugene Brownwell from New England Journal of Medicine from 1965, uh, stressing that uh, Preoperative pulmonary hypertension, which is uh, decreasing after the surgery, is a good prognostic marker. But uh, on, uh, on the other side, uh, those patients that remain uh, with persistent, and so not any more residual, but persistent pH after valvular correction, they are at uh, increased risk. And this risk is uh, getting worse and worse over the time in the subset of patients with uh, advanced disease. And this is true for aortic stenosis, for mitral uh, disease as well. And uh, uh, there is also a subset of patients that are recognized on stress tests, so it is not uh, after the last revision of the, of the recommendations for the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension in the World Symposium in East, and we are expecting the new uh, international guidelines on pulmonary hypertension for the next year. Uh, 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 exercise so exercise-induced pH is also important in uh, patients with valvular disease, and this subset of patients is also uh, the one with, uh, with uh, increased risk. Uh, pulmonary hypertension is one of the diseases uh, where uh, you need a multidisciplinary team and you need um, fast track referrals for uh, uh, those patients with, uh, uh, with the suspicion on uh, a treatable pulmonary hypertension and in this diagnostic algorithm uh, we should certainly uh, clearly re recognize those patients with uh, advanced disease and the reason why uh, those patients should be referred to the uh, centers specialized for pulmonary hypertension is uh, the interpretation of the hemodynamic data and uh, uh, differential diagnosis or actually the, the final diagnosis is still established uh, uh, on cardiac catheterization as a gold standard despite all the advances of the non-invasive imaging. So uh, interpretation of the data, vasoreactivity testing, which is not indicated for patients with uh, valor heart disease or those with uh, post-thrombolic disease or those with, uh, uh, with autoimmune disease. So uh, uh, on using still valid guidance recommendations, uh, class two, or patients with uh, with uh, pulmonary hypertension as a, a part of valvular disease, they, are, they should not be tested for vasoreactivity. They should be simply referred to surgery if this, this is feasible, having in mind also that the risk is increased. But uh, this is a, a recent presentation from the last digital version of the EST Congress where this uh, approach was challenged within a, a rather large group of uh, patients with uh, class 2 pH. Uh, testing those uh, uh, patients for uh, the uh, risk stratification with uh, sodium nitroprusid, and um, this is uh, probably a, a hypothesis creating uh, investigation that should uh, lead to the further investigation of proper agents and proper testing modalities for potential vasoreactivity in the cases with uh, uh, valvular disease and, and pH as the, the testing strategies for advanced heart failure patients that are, for example, transplant or MCS uh, candidates. Uh, diagnostic algorithm for uh, left ventricular uh, pH should also recognize not only systolic uh, but also diastolic dysfunction, and we have the uh, recent uh, uh, guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology on uh, non-invasive uh, diagnosis of uh, diastolic dysfunction. And uh, uh, this differential diagnosis is uh, selecting the group of patients where we have a clear uh, postcapillary pulmonary hypertension in which uh, we need timely uh, surgical or international management. We need, uh, of course, uh, management of uh, congestion, uh, arrhythmias, comorbidities. And uh, 
what we know so far, uh, despite several attempts, and those attempts uh, include uh, studies with sildenafil, rheosiguat, uh, macitenta, and so all the drugs that were highly successful in pulmonary arterial hypertension, everything was uh, much less successful and even harmful. Uh, a COVAC study with uh, sildenafil in patients with corrected valvular disease and mean uh, pulmonary arterial pressure more than 30 millimeters of mercury, uh, mercury caused uh, uh, even increase of mortality and uh, hospitalization of valvular uh, due to the uh, worsening of, of pH. And uh, even when we uh, sub-analyze uh, biomarkers like BMP in this uh, study and the number of hospitalizations, uh, despite the positive uh, initial effect on um, effort tolerance on six-minute walk test on the uh, hemodynamics uh, uh, revealed by uh, uh, mean pulmonary artery pressure measurements, uh, the study was in general uh, highly unsuccessful and this treatment uh, was harmful in this uh, study of patients. And uh, long-term data from the, from the COVAC study are also revealing the importance of, uh, of uh, uh, post-operative pulmonary hypertension as a prognostic marker, uh, showing that the COVAC population is doing much worse than uh, those patients in the reference population. So uh, despite the, the promising hypothesis, persistent pH in patients with corrected valvular heart disease is associated with a poor outcome, and this outcome cannot be corrected with uh, sildenafil. Uh, there are uh, procedural um, uh, parameters that are also related uh, with, uh, with um, outcome, and uh, uh, surgery is uh, uh, more risky in the subset of patients with uh, high pulmonary vascular resistance higher than 4.3. Wood units. There are ongoing attempts with macitentin, uh, oral rheosiguat, uh, treprostinil, or tadalafil, but those studies are ongoing and they're mainly including HFPEF HFP patients and not patients with uh, corrected valvular heart disease. So uh, uh, the summary of still valid guidelines is uh, that the management of pulmonary hypertension in left heart disease should optimize the treatment of the underlying condition, and this treatment should be uh, timely and uh, should uh, uh, include management of patients or correction of the, of the structural heart disease uh, before advanced uh, pulmonary hypertension develops, and uh, management of uh, congestion and comorbidities and, of course, optimization of the volume stat status. In those patients that, are, uh, uh, that uh, belong to the high-risk uh, subgroup of uh, uh, for cardiac surgery, interventional procedure like uh, mitra clip or um, uh, percutaneous implantation or, uh, of uh, aortic valve can uh, be associated with uh, uh, lower risk, lower, lower periprocedural risk, and can in improve uh, pH in, pa in the patients with pre procedural uh, pH. So, both mitra clip and TAVI can improve uh, pulmonary hypertension in those patients with persistent. Uh, disease uh, uh, before before the surgery. There are some promising attempts with uh, medications highly successful for patients with uh, uh, ha with heart failure and reduced reduction fraction. This is a recently published Embrace HF trial uh, with uh, uh, implantable cardio MEMS uh, pressure sensor in the pulmonary artery, detecting a decrease in the diastolic pressure uh, after. Uh, introduction of empagliflozin in patients with uh, uh, left-sided heart failure, uh, but this is only a small uh, uh, s s hypothesis creating uh, trial that should be uh, further evaluated in the near future. So, in conclusion, dear uh, chairman and dear colleagues, uh, I would like to stress that uh, persistent secondary pulmonary hypertension is a poor prognostic marker. Differential diagnosis of uh, 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 clear uh, postcapillary or combined pre- and, and postcapillary pulmonary hypertension is of essential importance, and those patients should be referred to the specialized uh, pH centers for differential diagnosis. And symptomatic management, management of congestion, arrhythmias, comorbidities can improve symptoms. However, the most important is timely correction of the underlying valvular disease. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much. It was excellent presentation. Uh, uh, I would like to ask the question, uh, it's probably wise to avoid persistent pulmonary hypertension. Uh, what would be your recommendation uh, for the asymptomatic patient? Should we uh, consider intervention in any patient with uh, mildly elevated pulmonary artery pressure at rest, or should everyone, if possible, undergo stress test? Uh, what will be the threshold for you to indicate early intervention? Uh, for each uh, valvular disease, there is a, a recommendation table with, um, uh, with the thresholds for uh, early uh, management strategy or for in controversial cases adding. Uh, there, there is uh, additional information that could be obtained uh, from uh, doing a stress test, and this is also a daily clinical practice in our institution. Uh, our policy is to regard uh, even patients with uh, mild pulmonary hypertension, uh, and this finding sh is actually an additional criteria to, uh, to in indicate to refer a patient for surgery or for interventional management if feasible, uh, because uh, worsening of pulmonary hypertension is clear-cut uh, prognostic marker. So uh, even mild uh, pH is um, adding uh, the indication for the, for the interventional or surgical management. I would like to thank Professor Arsen for this uh, very nice presentation, which I was uh, listening with uh, with full attention because he tr he stressed out uh, uh, an extremely important you know question in cardiac surgery and in cardiology generally. But me as a cardiac <laughs> me as a surgeon is always talking about you know uh, my, my uh, our job. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, generally a landmine in cardiac surgery because uh, it's, com it's behaving completely unpredictable, you know, and we are all, uh, always entering the surgery with, be with best hope that when fixed the valve, the pulmonary hip hypertension is going down, but such a neglect uh, is going to, to, to lead us to, to, to disastrous results. And any effort should be made to, 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 to diagnose properly pulmonary hypertension preoperatively to see uh, is there any possibility, you know, to, to decrease it preoperatively and how reversible it is. And uh, my question is to my surgeon colleagues here in the, in the audience, uh, is what are their experience and how to prepare those patients uh, for the valve surgery with, with pulmonary hypertension and uh, uh, what they do with the right ventricle, which is the key, key question here, whether those patients are going to survive or not. So I, I posed <laughs> 10 <laughs> questions to everybody here, but it's very important, you know, I, issue. Maybe I can add also one question to this dilemma, and this is a repair of the tricuspid regurg. Uh, there are several studies commenting on this, and the general conclusion is that you should not do it, regardless of the, of the extent of the, of the tricuspid regurg. So maybe a surgical experience from this field would be interesting. I think it's very, it would be very interesting to hear what other people do. We do not routinely treat pulmonary hypertension preoperatively in these valvular patients, so I don't know if anybody else does. We do treat it preoperatively in uh, patients with LVADs, patients in whom we plan to implant LVADs or transplant patients for sure, but not, um, not valvular patients. And I'd be very interested to, to hear what anybody else does, does differently. And we certainly do not give any pulmonary vasodilators after surgery. Uh, I, I, I'd like to, to stress one another thing. I mean, nowadays, pulmonary hypertension is not a contraindication for, for a valvular surgery itself. It is really difficult or challenging to prepare these patients whether you treat it with dilators or no preoperatively, but it is not in a contraindication. But of course, in LVAD era, which is now growing, and I think it is going still to be growing, if you have irreversibly bad left ventricle with uh, highly elevated pulmonary pressures, I think the cutoff or the threshold for the LVAD implantation is going to be lower and lower. So we are, we are going to uh, remove a lot of these patients towards another type of, of, of treatment as, as LVA therapy is. Uh, so, but intraoperatively, yeah, it, is, it can be really challenging. The, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with, with Ivan, it's, it's, 
it's really difficult to manage these patients with, with highly elevated pulmonary pressures, bad, bad LVs, yeah. Uh, it's very, very uh, essential is, is the right ventricle in those patients. And mm -hmm. when you asked about the tricuspid repair, I think that we should, uh, we should try to spare right, after, right ventricle by any means. So uh, we're always uh, repairing the, the, the tricuspid valve in pulmonary hypertension because on the long run, the bad right ventricle is to suffer even more in, if, you do, if you left, you know, unrepaired tricuspid valve. What is also uh, highly important is to recognize cases with uh, mixed disease, uh, especially those with uh, concomitant pulmonary embolism. And in the COVID uh, era, those cases are not that rare. We, um, in the recent weeks, we have uh, uh, received patients with uh, thromboembolic events on different vascular beds uh, simultaneously. And therefore, uh, we might expect also additional cases with uh, mixed uh, pH phenotype also due not only to valvular disease but to, to concomitant, frequently not recognized pulmonary embolism. Okay, thank you. I think we have to move forward. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to introduce next speaker, Dr. Otashevich, to speak about heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction. Uh, hello from my part too. It's always nice to be a part of this multi-specialty crowd because we may have a different uh, views on the same issues. And today I will speak a bit uh, on the entity that it's recently known as mid-range ejection fraction heart failure. So is it the gray zone or the true uh, new entity? So before I begin this lecture, I would, like to, I would like to ask, let's say, Marco, do you really think that FMRF actually exists? I'm not sure. Anybody else would like to come to this point? Everybody's being very diplomatic. I will, I will, I will say my preferences in my concluding slide. So uh, despite the... Um, Majority of thinking here, uh, DSC uh, guidelines actually think that uh, HFMRF actually exists. And this is the term uh, coined for the 2016 ed uh, edition of the, of the guidelines. And I am very curious to know whether this term will still exist in 2021 edition of the guidelines. So how we define HFMRF? It's relatively clear as uh, a patient needs to have a symptoms, uh, plus minus signs, ejection fraction of between 40 and 49%, elevated natriuretic peptides, and at least one additional criterion such as relevant structural heart disease, mostly uh, LVH or enlargement of the left atrium, or diastolic dysfunction. However, if we cross to the other side of the Atlantic, uh, the thinking and the reasoning differs a bit because the current edition of the ACCHA HFSA guidelines do recognize that these patients may represent a gray zone, but they do not think that such clinical entity as uh, HFMRF actually exists. And what Milton Pucker says. So Milton Pucker, most of you know him. He is a very famous and outspoken cardiologist who actually uh, from time to time speaks what other people think. And uh, this is by far my favorite uh, paper regarding the half MREF because in the, in the uh, because Martin Parker says that this is a disorder that the psychiatrist would love. Why is that the case? Because I think at least there were at least two reasons because Milton Parker put that title. First of all, uh, ejection fraction, term ejection fraction was coined actually by psychiatrists in 65 which came as a surprise to me. And the other hand, uh, we have this pertinent discussion regarding the validity of ejection fraction, whether we should so heavily rely on ejection fraction. And because we have this narrow definition of a certain clinical entity as ejection fraction between 40 and 49%, the issue of inter and most, uh, and more, uh, more, more importantly, intra-observable variability when we speak about the definition of ejection fraction. If we look at the distribution, distribution of uh, EF in heart failure, we can see that roughly 15 to 20% of patients actually fall in this category based on ejection fraction alone. But do not forget that to diagnose someone with a half MRF, he also needs to have 
elevated nitritic peptides and some sort of, of uh, diastolic dysfunction. If we look at demographic and clinical characteristics of these patients, in some characteristics, have MRF patients closely resemble to the patients with, uh, with the patients with HEF-REP, such as the incidence of ischemic etiology, prior reoscolarization, or prior myocardial infarction. On the other hand, if we look at the uh, characteristics like comorbidities like diabetes and hypertension, then these patients more closely resemble to the half path patients. If we look how we treat these patients in real world, then the treatment of half MRF patients more closely resemble to the treatment of half ref patients. It's a very mixed bag of patients, if I can say so. Uh, if we look at the uh, biomarkers and uh, based on the uh, ejection fraction, we can see that half MRF patients, when we look at the anti pro BMP, more closely resemble to half PEF patients, indicating somewhat, indicating somewhat less strain on the left ventricle. But when we look at the uh, biomarkers indicating inflammation and fibrosis, then these patients more closely resemble to half ref patients. Again, if we look at the prognosis and as stratified by uh, LVEF, then uh, if we just say about, if we are just talking about all cause mortality, then half MRF patients more closely resemble to half PEF patients. But if we look at the different issues about rehospitalization, whether cardiovascular, heart failure, on, or any sort of, of uh, rehospitalization, then these patients more closely resemble to half ref patients. If we look at the mode of the death, we can see that mode of the death is somewhere in between of half ref patients and half PEF patients. So it's really a gray zone. So we can do not have a, 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 a strong anchoring point to, to correctly classify these patients. Uh, beside the Milton Packers paper, this is possibly the most important slide that I will show to you. It says, uh, basically what it's shown on this slide is that if we look at the ejection fraction as determined by ECHO one year for the, from the initial examination, then we will have to reclassify a vast number of patients based purely on ejection fraction. If we look specifically at, if, at in uh, half MRF patients, then after one year, only 43% of patients originally classified as having MRF will remain in that group. On the other hand, if we look at the patients with reduced ejection fraction, then 21% of these patients will switch, will uh, cross to the uh, half MRF group after one year. And if we look at the patients with preserved ejection fraction, then again, 32%, about 11% of patients will be in half MRF group. What is the reason for this? Is this the progress, progression or improvement of the disease? or problem with the reproducibility of sequential LVF uh, measurement. I think that both, uh, both are correct, but I will just look for the time being and for the sake of the time at the problems in, in sequential LVF measuring. This is a relatively small trial, 56 patients, and uh, basically it uh, measured intra-observer variability with the different methods of, the, of determining ejection fraction by echo. This is echocardiographic measurements of, echo, of LVF, which we most commonly use in our clinical practice. And if we look at the most commonly used method of estimating ejection fraction, which is uh, biventricular uh, Simpson model, it appears there is a 5% difference between the observers for each and single measurements during one year period in, uh, in a group of patients. So this is really significant. We are talking about 9% range, and we can not be in the range of 1 or 2% with, with the precision of measurements. I think that we do have a problem in determining the correct, uh, the correct clinical entity for particular patients. But do not forget that half MRF is actually a syndrome. And risk factors for half MRF are closely related to the risk factors for half PEF. So patients with half MRF do have more comorbidities as compared to patients with uh, half ref. And again, I would warn you that there is a sizable number of crossovers from both half PEF and half ref group. If you look at the diastolic function in patients with half MRF, we can see that it is somewhere in between, between uh, half ref patients and half 
uh, REF patients, indicating that in this group of patients, we do have a problem in systolic function, as systolic function, well, let's say 42, 43% is clearly not normal, but let's say mildly abnormal. But these patients also have abnormalities in uh, their systolic function. What is the reason for that? Generally, they, there is uh, two reasons for that. Problems with the cardiomyocytes, problems with the uh, calcium metabolism, and again, uh, problems with the extracellular matrix, such uh, as the increase of, in the amount of collagen and change between the collagen types. What about the treatment? Possibly the most important issue that we should discuss today. So uh, ESC guidelines were brave enough to introduce a new entity, but they did not mention anything about the treatment of these patients. Uh, the reason for not measuring treatment is because we do not have trials. So uh, ESC guidelines are recommended are recommending that we use data based of, uh, derived from half pef studies, but look at the patients at the lower end of ejection fraction. If we do not have data, then we do meta-analysis of randomized clinical trials. And these meta-analysis clearly state that beta blockers are beneficial in this group of patients. If we look at the incidence, at the uh, etiology of, of HEP-MREF, then uh, Swedish uh, National Registry says that, that beta blockers are, uh, are useful in patients with HEP-MREF, but who do have coronary artery disease. On the other hand, it appears that beta blockers, at least at, according to, to the Swedes, are not useful in patients who uh, do not have coronary artery disease and belong to this group. What about the MRAs? Uh, again, no clear, uh, no, no, no studies specifically designed for this kind of, for this group of patients, for, of the, for this group of patients, but it, if we do the post hoc analysis of randomized clinical trials and again meta-analysis, it appears that MRIs are clearly beneficial in the patients with uh, half MRF. Uh, the latest addition to the MESS is, is a Paragon trial. This is a well-known trial that uh, tried to address the usefulness of sacubitril sartan in patients uh, with uh, HFMREF. I just need to warn you that one of the inclusion criteria for this study was ejection fraction 45% or more. So this is, they excluded a sizable proportion of patients with HFMREF. And as you all know, uh, this study was a near miss. So it was a borderline significance, yet definitely not a positive study. If i just wondering if Novartis would include patients between 40 and 45 percent, I would think that the study would be positive. However, when they did a post hoc analysis, which was pre-specified luckily, about the patients with, uh, with, when the patients were divided according to the median ejection fraction, which was 57% in this case, it appeared that uh, Entresto was beneficial in patients with, uh, who had lower ejection fraction than 57%. And based on this post hoc analysis, uh, Entresto received a new FDA indication, which is, uh, you know, uh, should be rewarded for the, for the most diplomatic uh, definition of a use of, of, of a single drug that I know. So basically, what does the FDA says? It says that the Entresto uh, is of benefit for, uh, for the patients with chronic heart failure, but the benefits are most clearly evident in patients with left radicular fraction below normal. What is normal? So uh, again, uh, just to uh, be cautious, then there is a, there is a, a sentence saying that LVF is a variable measure, so we need to use clinical judgment in deciding whether to treat our patients with interest. So what is the situation in, in the real world? Again, uh, Swedish registry, and these data clearly indicate that when it comes to ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, uh, patients with HFMREF are generally uh, treated more or less in the same way as the patients with HFREF. To much of my surprise, patients with HFMREF, when we come to MRI, uh, are most closely uh, treated as patients with HFPEF, meaning that these patients receive uh, less MRIs than the, than the patients with HFMREF. So what do we have? Uh, we do have very little, uh, so in terms of guideline-directed medical therapy. So generally guidelines are not saying much what we should do and, we was, and what we should not do in these patients. So uh, I would just 
conclude with the same paper as I cited before by Milton Pecker because I do think that uh, we are somewhere stuck uh, between the rock and the hard place in, this, in these patients. So uh, we're not sure whether this entity really exists. We're not really sure whether we should uh, diagnose it and whether we, if we diagnose one patient with MRF, whether he will be in half MRF group six months from now. And most importantly, we're not sure how to treat them. So at least in my mind, I would treat these patients more or less similarly as the patients with HFRF until proven otherwise. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, excellent presentation. Uh, uh, according to your opinion, what is the strongest of strongest uh, prognosis markers uh, in patients with uh, mid-range heart failure? Uh, it's probably not ejection fraction or not uh, so it's difficult to say. So generally, uh, we need to, I mean, uh, this is clearly uh, a term that was coined because we're not really sure what to do with this group of patients. So uh, in my mind, I would generally not really like to, 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 to term this group as half MRF. So uh, I generally treat these patients as patients with half ref, as I said in my concluding remark. So generally, uh, if you look at the biomarkers, uh, Clearly, these patients have uh, more closely resemble in terms of anti-pro BMP to the patients with, uh, with HFPEF. On the other hand, if you look at the inflammation markers and, and, uh, inf and uh, fibrosis markers, they generally more closely look to the, uh, they more closely resemble to the, to the HFREF patients. So it's really difficult for me to say what is the single most, uh, most, uh, most uh, predictive parameter in these patients. So we generally will need to look more closely into these patients. We have one comment, uh, speculating about uh, the existence of this entity in the new guidelines. There is, a, um, in parallel, a very strong movement trying to delete the term HEFPEF as well, uh, led by uh, Perry Elliott from London and with strong support of other people for stressing the importance of uh, background etiology in, uh, in heart failure with so-called preserved ejection fraction. So in this population with half MREF, maybe we are also uh, having some subset of patients with some different etiology like amyloidosis or some other genetic form of disease that is simply not recognized. And this uh, death to half PEF uh, mo uh, movement maybe will also affect the half MREF, so both entities will disappear slowly. So there is a huge turmoil in the, in the community, I guess. He's, he's showing the slides all the time, death to half pep. <laughs> Thank you for your In terms of names, will it be 20 years back? <laughs> I mean, uh, 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 at the end of the day, I don't think that we should so much strongly rely on ejection fractions. So we should need a specific patient. So uh, in my mind, it's clearly different if the patient has 41% ejection fraction or 61% ejection fraction. So uh, maybe we'll just, you know, move as a definition of HFPF, let's say, to 50 ejection fraction or something. But when it is clear that this lower end uh, HFPF or HMFRF patients are behaving more closely, at least in terms of responding to the therapy to the HFPF patients. So uh, we will just see, actually. Or, I think that or, or just, just simply as ischemic heart disease or valvular disease or cardiomyopathy. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Thank you. To, to Professor Otashevich, for me as a surgeon, I, I, I didn't understand, understood anything, yeah, whether it is mid or low or whatever, but thank you very, very, very much. I mean, it was really. So I would like to uh, introduce Professor Maria Zdravković with the last session or with the last uh, presentation of this session. It's cardiac MRI after COVID-19 infection, what lies behind the horizon? So Maria, please. Uh, thank you, dear Professor Putnik, dear Chairman, dear colleagues. I'm very happy being here today with you and to talk about new changes in the heart after COVID-19 infection, COVID-19 pandemic. But allow me to proceed in Serbian and we could discuss later in English. 
Dakle, ja ću danas pričati o kardiomagnetnoj rezonanciji kod pacijenata koji imaju neke kardiovaskulare tegobe i dolaze kod kardiologa sa idejom da oni imaju post-covid kardiološki sindrom, a šta u stvari mi vidimo na tim kardiomagnetnim rezonancima. Najpre da vam kažem, mi smo od kraja juna prošle godine u našoj ambulanti koja je otvorena kao covid ambulanta, a mi smo najmanji KBC u Srbiji, imamo 320 postelja, pregledali nešto više od 30.000 pacijenata sa sumnjom na COVID, lečili smo hospitalno, vidite, nešto više od 4.000 pacijenata i veliki broj tih ljudi koji su lečeni od COVID-19 infekcije imali prethodno kardiovaskulno oboljenje. Kada je COVID-19 počeo, mi smo mislili da je to bilateralna pneumonija. Sve brže smo uviđali da to je mnogo više od bilateralne pneumonije i da oko 80% pacijenata ima tu neku blagu formu bolesti, ali jedan značajan broj pacijenata je zahtavao bolničko lečenje, a neki od njih su lečeni u jedinicama intenzivne energije. Imali su veliki broj kardiovaskulnih komplikacija. Što zbog prethodnih kardiovaskulnih oboljenja, što zbog samih kardiovaskulnih komplikacija, komplikacije koje je COVID-19 donao sa sobom. Ako mi znamo da AC receptor je tu najbitniji, da li možemo da kažemo da je COVID-19 primarno kardiovaskulno oboljenje i ja bih rekla da je COVID-19 oboljenje endotelne ćelije u svakom krvnom sudu i zbog toga imamo toliku širinu, diapazon, u stvari svih ovih poremećaja od bilateralne pneumonije do poremećaja u samom srčanom mišiću, do poremećaja u krvnim sudovima sa trombozama, endotelnom disfunkcijom, do crevnih poremećaja, moždanog udara, da kažem, psihijatrijskih i neuroloških poremećaja koje uzrokuje i onda, da kažem, bubražne poremeće, bubražnu insuficijenciju, ne mali broj bolestika nam je završavao na sjeru RT proceduri i jedan deo njih je i uspio da izađe iz tog problema bez ikakvih posljedica sada po bubržnu funkciju. Dakle, diapazon komplikacije je ogroman. Ukoliko pacijent preživi sve te komplikacije koje su akutne, onda on ode kući u nekom periodu, se vraća kod kardiologa sa nizom komplikacija koje mi pratimo. Neki od njih su srčane slabost, neki su trombobolijske komplikacije koje nastaju posle otpusta iz bolnice, a ritmi su jako česte, bol u grudima, neprijatnost, testiranje, naći šta je, da li je ubrzana korona, na bolest, da li ima još nešto što je COVID-19 deklanširao, a pacijent nije znao o tome ili je nešto što se dešava. Eto, to je, da kažem, zadatak nas kardiologa. Sama povreda miokarda u prvom radu koji je izašao, u 2020. su se pojavili prvi radovi, mi smo to čitali, od 7 do 17 procenta pacijenta ima miokardnu povredu, međutim, kod skoro svakog četvrtog pacijenta koji je lečen u jedinici intenzivne energije, ona se nalazi i imacio profesor koga smo imali sreće da bude gost kod profesora Arsena Ristića pre nekako godina, on je prvi objavio da povećeni biomarkeri u nekroze miokarda pokazuju lošiju prognozu. Ali mi smo videli da nema veliki broj pacijenata zaista i povećene biomarkere troponin, a imaju tegobe i miokardna povreda kod pacijenata posle COVID-19 oboljenja opisana u nekoliko radova sa različitom incidencom, sa različitim razmatranjima, tako da su ovi procenti, vidite, vrlo raznoliki i šaroliki i ne možemo baš da se oslonimo na njih. Jedan od najboljih radova iz kardiomagnete rezonancije izašao je kao autor objavila profesorka Puntman 2020. godine. On je bio pokazati da 78% pacijenata ima zahvatanje neke od strukture miokarda, a 60% pacijenata ima direktnu miokardnu inflamaciju. Ovo se prvi put složilo s onim što kad smo mi počeli da radimo kardiomagnetnu rezonanciju, imali smo veliki broj inflamacije u srcu, toliki broj da se ja u jednom trenutku posumnjala da si magnet dekodirao 
sa šemama, jer ovaj rad još nije izašao i zvala sam imamo Simensu Magnet da prekontrolišu zašto imamo toliko puno inflamacije u srcu, a nismo imali praćenje sa gadolinijumom. Dakle, nije bilo još uvek fibroze formirane da bi se tu pojavio onaj LGE fenomen, jer da bi se LGE fenomen pojavio, mora da postoji smrt miokardne ćelije i pojava fibroze, a za to je potrebno vreme. Dakle, mi sad imamo te pacijente koji se pojavljaju sa LGE fenomenom. U tom trenutku to su bili edemiokarda i bio je povećan ekstracevularni volumen kod nekih pacijenata. Aktivna inflamatorni proces u miokardu se najbolje vidi kroz T1 i T2 mapping ili T1, T2 mapping, gde mi imamo jako dobro tumačenje da li imamo aktivnu inflamaciju ili rezidalnu inflamaciju ili nemamo inflamaciju, imamo nešto drugo. Zbog toga ono što smo mi rekli da nama magnet srca apsolutno ne daje puno informacija bez davanja kontrasta. Sada kada su stigle T1 i T2 mapping, koje mi imamo na bežanjskoj kosi i koristimo kod svakog pacijenta, mi dobijamo mnogo više informacija ti van ti tu mappingom i zbog toga je jako bitno da svaki pregled insistiramo na tome ima upravo ove mape. Postoji rezidalno difuzno oštećenje miokarda koje se ogleda u povećanom T1 vremenu i normalnim vrednostima T2 vremena. A zašto je ovo bitno? Zato što kod mnogih pacijenata upravo ekcijona frakcija o kojoj smo pričali ovde iz drugih uglova je potpuno normalna, a i volumeni koje na magnetu se dobijaju jako dobro su izuzetno dobri, normalni su. I zbog toga je nama važno da mi vidimo tkivnu strukturu, jer na kontrolnom pregledu koji koji zakazujemo za 6 do 12 nedelja, ovi volumeni se već remete. Znači, proces ide, mi možemo ranom detekcijom da utvrdimo. Šta mi utvrđujemo? Mi merimo ove volumene. Znači, pored anatomije, pored volumena, pored kardijak indeksa, kardijak outputa i strok voljuma, koje dobijemo neinvazivnim metodama na magnetu, mi gledamo postojanje LGE fenomena, koji predstavlja trajnu fibrozu u miokardu. Dakle, to je edem koji je različitim signalima stigo do fibroze. To je formirana fibroza koja ne može da se povuče. Ekstracelularni volumen možemo izmeriti nativno T1 i T1 ta dva vremena i naravno ono što uvek gledamo to je sam perikardijum, odnosno da li imamo neke znakove inflamacije perikarda, T1 vrednosti iznad 1100 milisekundi i T2 vrednosti iznad 56 milisekundi su značajne za postavljanje inflamacije i tu nam je signal bio upravo ovaj rad koji je postao kultni rad u kardiomagnetnoj rezonanciji profesorke Puntman. E, dakle, da kažem, uobičajna lokalizacija EDM u akutnom miokarditisu na kardiomagnetoj rezonanciji u inferiornom i inferolateralnom zidu. Međutim, ono što je karakteristično, kod COVID-19 infekcije mi smo imali i druge lokalizacije, a najčešće smo imali u interventrikulnom septumu, zbog toga je bilo puno bradikardija kod tih pacijenata, vi znate, bilo je nekoliko blokova gde su stavljeni i trajni pacemakeri, prednji zid i i anterolateralni zid. U našem centru je do sada pregledano 156 pacijenata koji su razmatrani na kardiomagnetnoj rezonanci upravo zbog prelaženog COVID-19 oboljenja i te goba koji su imali posle toga. Ovo su isključivo naše slike koje su dobijene na magnetu. Prva slika 27-godišnje devojke koja je imala prilično blage simptome COVID-19 i nije lečena hospitalno, lečena kod kuće, međutim sa čestim ekstrasistolama. To je inače naše kolegi Čerka koja je došla i vidite ona ima jedan klasičan subepikardnijeni LGE fenomen sa afekcijom samog perikarda i imamo miokardni volumen u inflamaciji 11%. Ovo je druga slika, ovo je T2 mapping, kao što vidite, svaka boja odgovara. Gdje mi je ovdje kursor? Aha, evo ga, vidite perikard koji je zahvaćen i subepikard i miokard, međutim ovdje je inflamacija, on ide i inferiorni, ali i ovdje u septumu vidite da ovo je sve edem potpuno kodirana drugačije boja. Ovo je jedan 
osam nedelja posle otpusta pacijent koji ima tešku sliku COVID-a, ali ovde već imamo formiranu fibrozu koja se počinje subepikarno, ali ide i premezomiokarno, a isto takva slika u inferiornom zidu, znači multifokalni miokarditis koji je imao. Ovo je 30-godišna devojka koja je imala asimptomatski COVID-19. Ona je došla kod nas zbog te goba koje su odjednom nastale. Mi smo radili magnet i onda smo joj uzeli antitela. Ona je bila visoko pozitivna u titru IgG antitela. Vidite ovu sliku prolongiranog T2 vremena koje možemo i da merimo sa jednom kompletnom inflamacijom apikalnog septuma i samog apeksa sa formiranom fibrozom u ovom delu. Vidite potpuno izmenjen signal i sa jasnim, da kažem, miokarditisnim ožiljkom. I to tako izgleda kada se mere vrednosti, onda dobijemo i objektivnu kvantifikaciju vrednosti. Dakle, ali kad gledate oku, ne možda pobegne kad se naviknete. Ovo je isto jedan subepikarni ožiljak u anternolateralnom zidu. E, ovo je 25-godišnja, isto jedna mlada osoba koja je došla sa temperaturama nepoznatog porekla, koja je imala prilično dosta dobar ehokardiografski nalaz. Moj kolega je rekao nema ništa na ehu, međutim, kad smo je stavili na magnet, vidite koliko je taj miokard potpuno izmenjen, on je potpuno nehomogen i radi se o jednom difuznom promenjenom miokardu nakon korone sa produženim i T1 vremenom u T1 sekvencama. Ovo su T1 sekvence. Ovo je T2 slika, još jednom da pokažem. Ovo je jedan pacijent koji je upućen iz Banja Luke, on je njima bio bitan i oni su molili, izvinjam se za magne srca, to je pacijent koga je uputila profesorka Preradović zbog toga što je imao septum 14 mm i ona mi je rekla, ja sumnjam da je to hipertrofična kardiomiopatija. Ja kad mi je rekla, uopšte nisam sumnjala da je hipertrofična kardiomiopatija sa 14 mm septumom. Meni je to bilo, ali ajde, ja nisam tela da odbijem kolegini, i priznala sam joj da je bilo u pravu. Evo ga kako izgleda taj miokard. On je samo na osnovu ekokardiografske, to dušanje i hipertoničar ima dijastolnu disfunkciju. Vidite, ovo je kompletno izmenjen signal. Ove zone žutog, to su zone izmenjene od kiva i ovo je deo koji prelazi u zonu. Ovo nisu normalne miociti. Njegova cela komora je izmenjena, do duše njegova ekcijna frakcija je već u ovom trenutku 50% i on je ta HFPF, a u stvari on je hipertrofična kardiomiopatija koja će se tek deklanširati i pokazati. Ovo je jedan pacijent koji je takođe došao kod nas, novinar je, bio je obsednut time da ima post-covid sindrom, da ne može da se popne do stepeništa i tako dalje. Mlađi čovek, vidite, ovo je magnet koji je njemu urađen, ovo je klasična non-compacted kardiomiopatija koju naravno nije dobio od covid-a. Ultrazvučno urađen je nalaz u jednoj drugoj ustanovi i nije viđeno, a zaista se i ne vidi tako eksplicitno, moram da kažem. Kad se stavi, eto kako je izgleda ta non-compacted, uglavnom u apikalnom delu. Ovo je jedan pacijent koji je došao kod nas u akutnoj COVID infekciji. On je dobio akutni transmuralni infart i rađen je u našoj sali u pripravnosti kad smo bili za COVID pacijente. I vidite, to je jedan, izvinjavam se, transmuralni oživljak koji je tu ostao. Ovde je infarkt transmuralni, ovde je više od 50%. Bilo u pitanju cirkufleksa, on je dobio on je dobio stent, onda je on stalno imao neke tegobe, stalno je dolazio ostale arterije opisane sa promenama koje nisu bile označaja i mi smo tada radili njemu prvi put magnet koji je bio u skladu s onim što je on imao. Međutim, onda smo mi postavili i dobili najzad dozvolu od Republičkog fonda, a dve godine smo je čekali sa aparaturom da uradimo adenozijski test na magnetu i mi radimo, moram da kažem, pošaljite nam pacijente, adenozijski stres stes, ovo je u miru, međutim, ovako je to izgledalo sa adenozinom. Sa adenozinom smo mi videli da on nama pravi ispad u perfuziji, u septumu, što uopšte nije odgovaralo ovaj koronarografiji koja je razmatrana i onda smo na osnovu toga taj ispad u septumu, on se jako lepo vidi kao ovaj crni deo od griza kod jabuke u adenozinu, ne valja da bude znači to crno. I onda smo 
tražili ponovu koronarografiju i uradili smo FFR. Interventni su naši kardiolozi uradili FFR jer je nama na adenozinskom telu, LAD stenoza bila 60%, a adenozin je pokazao da je značajna i vidite da je odnos bio 0,85, što je značajno i stavili smo stent u septum. On nema više te gobe, a nema više ni post-covid sintome, jer on nije imao post-covid, on nije imao nerešenu koronarnu bolest. Dakle, na kraju, izvjetno mi je drago da sam ja ovde, ja sam počinjala i tako sam i upoznala profesora Putnika, svoju naučnu karijeru, magisteriju sam radila na prvoj hiruškoj kod operisanih pacijenata i drago mi je ponovo da kroz rad sarađujem sa kardiohiruzima, jer kardiologija bez kardiohirurgije ne može, a i obrnuto. Hvala vam puno. Evo, ja imam jedno pitanje. Ok, so I will have just one question. What is the clinical implication of inflammation as detected in MRI in a young patient with a post-COVID patient? So any specific advices regarding the treatment in this patient? Yes. If they have signs of heart failure, then we give them therapy according to the heart failure. One of these patients is the young girl that I sent to Arsen, and he helped me a lot. She was she is a daughter of our medical technician, and she had non-sustained VTS suddenly, and Arsen helped us a lot. But we we don't have a specific anti-inflammatory treatment. We didn't perform biopsies for these patients, but we advised them not to be physically active. We, ha we had some of them were high-grade athletes because we performed projects with our state uh, institute for sport. So uh, the, uh, the greatest number of them at the control cardiomagnetic resonance after, but we don't perform it uh, eight weeks earlier, they had all changes in resolving. But some of them, some of them, we have some of them that uh, have um, uh, lowering of the ejection fraction, and then they have clinical course of heart failure. Then they get uh, the, the, the therapy for heart failure. Maybe I can add a comment on this because I was a part of a European consensus statement on, in this area, both in 2013 and uh, the one that was published a few weeks ago uh, jointly with the uh, Heart Failure Society of America and Japanese uh, Heart Failure Society. Uh, there is a, a very nice algorithm which is unfortunately not followed uh, all over the world. Uh, created by the Working Group on Myocardial and Pericardial Disease in 2013, uh, uh, introducing uh, a diagnosis which is clinically suspected myocarditis. You have clinically suspected myocarditis if you have at least two criteria from different diagnostic categories. So one from clinical presentation, another one from imaging, and MRI is always included. Uh, if the patient is clearly symptomatic and the clinical presentation is a clear-cut presentation with two, two the, the positive diagnostic criteria, for example, typical MRI finding and the typical clinical presentation, you have an indication for endomyocardial biopsy. This is not systematically uh, performed uh, all over the world and not even in, uh, in the centers that uh, participated in the, in the creation of those. Uh, strategies because of the lack of uh, high-level uh, laboratories performing uh, not only pathohistology but also immunohistochemistry and PCRs from those uh, patients. There are, of course, no studies in, uh, in COVID population, but there are studies which are not that large. There are, uh, there are, there are many controversial issues. However, the general recommendation both from 2013 and from this consensus statement, which is recently published, is that we have, uh, uh, if we get the result from the biopsy, which shows that uh, 
there are uh, there is no active viral infection, so the tests uh, PCR tests for cardiotropic viruses are negative, but there is an ongoing inflammation, and this ongoing inflammation is according to the immunocytochemistry findings more than 14 inflammatory cells for the regular myocarditis and more than 50 cells for fulminant myocarditis. Then we have the indication to treat those patients for six months with combined immunosuppression. Uh, if uh, additional indication are the cases with giant cell myocarditis, which is, of course, the most malignant disease, uh, with sarcoidosis, and those patients with myocarditis as a part of systemic autoimmune disease. Uh, COVID patients should be treated uh, similar as all other myocarditis cases. cases. Uh, therefore, if they have uh, persistent inflammation and no persistent viral infection, you can apply the same strategy, but we, of course, do not have any proof for this. Uh, many uh, patients receive, as a part of the management of uh, arts or the pneumonia, uh, uh, corticosteroids even on during the, the hospitalization and initial management, and if, uh, if this is beneficial or harmful for myocarditis, it is an open issue. Uh, general recommendation for acute viral myocarditis is to avoid uh, corticosteroids if you do not have uh, the findings of the biopsy. And the reason of, uh, un for, uns uh, for the failure of several trials in myocarditis, and especially for myocarditis treatment trials from the States, was unselective application of steroids without uh, this uh, strategy for biopsies. Uh, we certainly can test this uh, hypothesis on the international level, but at the moment, the recommendation for COVID is the same as for other uh, viral myocarditis. Okay, th thank you, Professor Istic. Um, thank you all uh, for, because of the uh, time, we have to finish the, the session. So once again, thank you for excellent lectures and uh, for excellent and uh, um, fruitful discussion. Uh, I would also like to remind you we now have uh, two uh, symposiums, but there will be also the, the lunch will be served from the 1 p.m. till 3 p.m. downstairs in the in, in the uh, buffet. So thank you very much once again, and uh, have a good time. <laughs> thank you. Najprve bih zamolio doktor Kojemeliju Nestorović da nam ispriča nešto o selekciji bolesnika za terapiju left ventricular assist device-evima. Izvoli, Emilija. Poštovano predsjedništvo, drage kolege i koleginice, ja ću vam danas govoriti o selekciji pacijenata za lečenjem ugradnjom mehaničkom cirkulatornom potporom levoj komori. Danas ćemo se podsjetiti ko su to pacijenti koji su za lečenje ovom vrstom intervencije i kada je pravo vreme za nju. Počet ćemo prikazom slučaja pacijentkinje 60 godina sa dilatativnom ishemijskom kardiomiopatijom. Od prethodnih operacija ima operaciju mitralne valvule na terenu funkcionalne mitralne insuficijencije i ugradnju ICD-a. Jedno vreme je bila dobro sa tim, međutim, na prijemu u bolnici je sa niha 3B simptomima srčane slabosti i unazad šest meseci četiri puta je bila hospitalizovana zbog dekompenzacije na terenu srčane slabosti. Na prijemu ima nabrakle vene vrata, izražene edeme donjih ekstremiteta, hipotenzivna je u sinusnom je ritmu sa frekvencom sa 65. minuti, I kao što možete videti, ima terapiju za lečenje srčane slabosti koja je optimizovana u skladu sa njenim krvnim pritiskom i sa srčanom frekvencom. Ehokardiografski vidimo značajno smanjenu sistonu funkciju leve komore na 15%, dilatiranu levu komoru, blagu mitralnu isuficijenciju, nema aortnu isuficijenciju i ima granično redukovanu sistonu funkciju desne komore sa ekcinom frakcijom 25%, TAP se 15% i umerenom trikuspidnom regurgitacijom. Kateterizacija desnog srca nam ukazuje na izrazito visoke pritiske punjenja leve komore sa veđom 27%, centralnim vejanskim pritiskom 15%, kardijak indeks 1,9% i plućnom hipertenzijom 4,5 vuda, koja je fiksno karaktera, znači na proceni reverzibilnosti plućne hipertenzije procenjena. 
ergospirometrija je pokazala značajno redikovanje funkcionalni kapacitet sa maksimalnom protrošnjem kisonika deseta. Pacijentkinja ima umereno oštećenu renalnu funkciju, normalnu funkciju jetre i živi sama, nema nikoga od bliže porodice. I sada dolazimo do toga da izaberemo najbolju opciju lečenja naše pacijentkinje. Da li je to transplantacija srca, da li je to ugradnje mehaničke cirkulatorne potpore sa različitim strategijama. Da premostimo period do transplantacije srca kao definitivni način lečenja, kao donošenje, premošćavanje perioda do donošenja odluke ili da uključimo pacijentkinji inotropnu potporu lekovima ili prosto samo da nastavimo sa optimalnom medikamentnom terapijom bez gore pomenutih intervencija. Mi smo se odlučili da ugradimo ELVAD kao bridge to decision iz razloga da pacijentkinja ima fiksnu plućnu hipertenziju koja predstavlja apsolutnu kontraindikaciju za transplantaciju srca. Da bi lakše doneli odluku, našu pacijentkinju smo stavili u Intermax klasifikaciju koja podrazumeva sedam potpuno klinički različitih kliničkih slika terminalnog stadijuma srčane slabosti koji će nam pomoći da donesemo odluku da li je pacijentkinja, odnosno naš pacijent i kada za ugradnju Elvada. Kao što možete videti, od sedam stadijuma, prva tri stadijuma jesu pacijenti koji su hospitalni, znači u bolnici koji su jako loši na inotropnoj potpori. Intermax grupa 1 predstavlja pacijente u kardiogenom šoku, Intermax grupa 2 to su pacijenti koji su na inotropnoj potpori nestabilni i takve pacijente ne želimo ni mi da vidimo u bolnici, jer njihova prognoza, kao što vidite, je jako loša. Bez ikakve mehaničke potpore njihovo preživljavanje je maltene 0%. Međutim, jako je važno da obratimo pažnju da ovakvi pacijenti i sa ugradnjom Elvada imaju jako visok mortalitet i zato je jako važno da jedino ukoliko dozvolimo da pacijenta dovedemo, propustimo ga i klasifikujemo za ugradnju Elvada u ranijim stadijima, I kad imamo ovakvu grupu pacijenata, ukoliko je pacijent mlad, ukoliko je transplant kandidat, ukoliko nema neke druge komorbiditete, može za ovakve pacijente razmatrati ugradnju ne Elvada, već neke brste kratkoročne mehaničke potpore i nakon toga, ukoliko uspemo da stabilizujemo takvog pacijenta, ponovo razmatrati o potencijalnu ugradnju Elvada. Ali kao što vidite, prilično ove dve grupe pacijenata ukazuju da smo zakasnili sa ovakvom, sa odlukom, pravom odlukom lečenja. Pacijent Intermax grupa 3, to su stabilni pacijenti, ali na inotropnoj potpori. I znači ugradnja Elvada kod njih je preporučena u roku od nekoliko nedelja. Međutim, ovo što vidimo, znači pacijenti od Intermax grupe 4 do 7, to su pacijenti koji su ambulantni. To su pacijenti koji mi najčešće ne vidimo, znači oni su kući. Pacijenti koji su 6 i 7, oni su bolesni, ali da kažemo lakše bolesni kada govorimo o terminalnom stadijumu srčane slabosti, tako da i pacijenti intermas grupe 7 i nisu indikovani za goradnju Elvada. Pacijent grupe 5 i 6, znači pacijenti koji se ne nalaze na kućnom lečenju, njihova ugradnja zavisi od niza drugih faktora, zahteva jedan individualni pristup i zavisi prvenstveno od funkcije drugih krajnjih organa. Naša pacijentkinja je svrstana u Intermax grupu 4. To je pacijentkinja Treatment Flyer. Šta to znači? Videli smo da naša pacijentkinja je u nazad šest meseci imala četiri hospitalizacije zbog srčane slabosti. Tako da Intermax klasifikacija nam ukazuje da naša pacijentkinja treba da dobije Elvad kao pravu opciju lečenja. Intermax je napravio jednu studiju koja je procenjivala baš te ambulatorne pacijente Intermax 4 do 7. Jer kao što smo napomenuli, kada imamo pacijente Intermax 1 do 3 koji su u bolnici, prosto da kažem, jako ti pacijenti imaju značajno lošiju prognozu, svi nam je jasno da nešto moramo da učinimo. Ali šta je sa ovom grupom od 4 do 7 koji se nalazi u kućnim uslovima? I procena u Intermax ovoj studiji jeste da ovi pacijenti, ukoliko se ostave na optimalnoj medikamentnoj terapiji, njihovo jednogodišnje preživljavanje, evo vidimo grupu 4, kao što je naša pacijentkinja, iznosi samo 60 procenata. Za razliku od toga, 2016. godine Evropsko druženje za srčanu slabost je izdalo preporuke i vidimo da ukoliko ova grupa pacijenata je lečena mehaničkom potporom cirkulacije levom srcu, vidimo da njihovo preživljavanje je značajno bolje, znači da iznosi čak 80% i za grupu 3, koja se nalazi u bolničkim uslovima koja je na inotropnoj potpori, a i za pacijente koji su frequent flyer, odnosno koji se nalaze u kućnim uslovima. 
Naša pacijentkinja nije inotropno zavisna, pripada Intermas grupi 4 i koji još podaci jednostavno nas upućuju da donosimo pravu odluku o ugradnji Elvada kod ove grupe pacijenata. Nažalost, nema još uvek randomizovanih studija koji su upoređivali preživljavanje ovih pacijenata i pacijenata koji su na optimalnoj medikamentnoj terapiji, međutim, poslednja studija iz 2015. godine, Roadmap studija, koja je procenjivala jednogodišnje preživljavanje baš ove grupe pacijenata Intermax profil 4 do 7, koji su NIHA 3B4 klasa i krajnji cilj ove studije jeste bilo preživljavanje i poboljšanje funkcionalnog kapaciteta. I kao što možete vidjeti, nakon godinu dana pacijenti koji su lečeni Elvadom imaju značajno bolje preživljavanje i funkcionalni kapacitet u odnosu na pacijente koji su lečeni optimalnom medikamentom terapijom. Međutim, također je važna činjenica da ovi pacijenti su imali 30% veći rizik od razvoja neželjenih događaja, znači jednostavno bolje preživljavanje, bolji funkcionalni kapacitet na štetu u smislu razvoja nekih od neželjenih događaja za razliku od pacijenata sa optimalnom medikamentnom terapijom. Sada možemo da jednostavno pogledamo preporuke Evropskog udruženja za srčanu slabost i 2016. godine, koji su nam rekli da ukoliko naši pacijenta više od dva meseca uprko s optimalnoj medikamentnoj terapiji ima jedan ili više od sledećih kriterijuma, ekcinu frakciju leve komore manje od 25%, maksimalnu potrošnju kisonika manje od 12%, tri ili više hospitalizacije zbog srčane slabosti unazad godinu dana, da ima potrebu za inotropnom terapijom, da ima progresivno oštećenje kranjih organa zbog smanjine perfuzije i da ima odsustvo teškog stepena desnostrane srčane slabosti, jer znamo da ovi uređaji predstavljaju potporu za levu stranu srca. Takođe je jako važno da obratimo pažnju, iako su ove preporuke prilično široke, da obratimo pažnju da se odnosi na pacijente koji uprko s optimalnom medikamentnoj terapiji imaju ove vrste, odnosno ispunjavaju ove kriterijume. Zašto je to važno? Ukoliko prvi put sretnete pacijenta sa srčanom dekompenzacijom, koji nema nikakvu medikamentnu terapiju za srčanu slabost, taj pacijent prvo mora proći određene algoritme po guidelinesima za srčanu slabost, uključiti maksimalnu medikamentnu terapiju prema njegovom krvnom pritisku, prema znači srčanoj frekvenciji, kada pacijenta optimizujete sa lekovima, ukoliko i dalje nakon dva meseca ima simptome srčane slabosti i jedan od ovih kriterijima koje smo pominjali, tada možemo razmišljati o ugradnji Elvada ili transplantaciji, ne pre toga. Naša pacijentkinja je dobila Elvad HeartMate 3 nakon agresivnog pokušaja stabilizacije sa optimalnom medikamentnom terapijom. I sada nam je jako važno da vidimo koji su to faktori koje naša pacijentkinja već posedovala, koji povećavaju mortalitet nakon ugradnje Elvada. Vidimo plučnu hipertenziju, ženski pol, trikuspidnu regurgitaciju, nedostatak socijalne podrške i ono što je jako važno da znamo da faktori rizika koji su bili prisutni kod naše pacijentkinje, a koji povećavaju procenat mortaliteta nakon ugradnje Elvada jeste ženski pol, Iako do sada se ne zna tačno razlog za to, nedostatak socijalne podrške, moramo napomenuti da nedostatak socijalne podrške, odnosno nedostatak da ukoliko pacijent živi sam, nije kontraindikacija za ugradnju Elvada, ali ti pacijenti moramo biti svesni da imaju veći mortalitet u odnosu na pacijente koji imaju podršku porodice. Trik uspidna, znači regurgitacija, s obzirom da ona utiče na povećanu incidencnu destostrane srčane slabosti nakon ugradnje Elvada. I ono što je jako važno da vidimo da plučna hipertenzija koja je predstavljala apsolutnu kontraindikaciju za transplantaciju srca, ona predstavlja indikaciju za ugradnju srčane pumpe. Takođe je jako važno, uvek napominjemo da procena funkcije desne komore je jako bitna s obzirom naročito kod pacijenata koji se nalaze na inotropnoj potpori, kod pacijenata koji su već imali prethodnu operaciju na otvorenom srcu, nije lako proceniti funkciju desne komore i da li je taj pacijent za ugradnju Elvada. Jako je važan kriterijum odnos centralnog venskog pritiska i veđa koji ukoliko je manji od 0,63 je indikator dobre prognoze funkcije desne komore i nakon ugradnje Elvada i kao što vidimo, naša pacijentkinja je bila u tom obsegu i to je, da kažem, još jedan od razloga zašto smo se odlučili za ovu vrstu procedure. 
Koji su to još faktori koji povećavaju mortalitet nakon ugradnje elvada, o čemu treba da vodimo računa? Svakako su godine, iako ne postoji takođe granica koja nam ukazuje da su neki pacijenti koji su stariji kontraindikovani za ugradnju elvada, moramo biti svesni da što je pacijent stariji, znači i postoji veći rizik za neženjen efekt i mortalitet nakon ugradnje elvada, O ženskom polu intermas klasi smo već pričali, takođe proceni funkcije desne komore koja nije ni malo laka, s obzirom na različitu grupu pacijenata koji smo rekli naročito za pacijente koje ponavljam, koji su na inotropnoj potpori, koji su već imali prethodnu operaciju na otvorenom srcu, tri kuspidna insuficijencija kao prediktor loše funkcije desne komore nakon operacije, potreba za nekom konkomitantnom procedurom u toku same intervencije implantacije elvada kao što je potreba za zamenom aortnog zaliska, ventrikulana tahikardija, oštećenje, odnosno oslabljena funkcija bubrega, koja predstavlja značajni prediktor mortaliteta nakon ugradnje elvada, funkcija jetre, malnutricija, nedostatak socijalne prodrške. Kao što možemo vidjeti odavde, znači neki od ovih faktora su korektibilni, međutim jako ih je teško korigovati u smislu optimizovanja pacijenata za ugradnju elvada kada govorimo o ovoj teškoj grupi pacijenata. Šest meseci nakon ugradnje elvada kod naše pacijentke nje dolazi do značajnog smanjenja plučnog pritiska, funkcionalni kapacitet je poboljšen, sada je NIH klasa 2 i naša pacijentkinja sada predstavlja jednog transplant kandidata, da njena sudbina dalje zavisi od, da kažem, broja donora i drugih faktora koji su povezani sa tim. Znači, naša odluka da ugradimo elvad kao bridge to decision se pokazala ispravno. I da zaključimo, ELVAD predstavlja jako dobru alternativu transplantaciji srca. Kada govorimo o pacijentima koji su Intermax 1 i 2, ne treba da čekamo, da upućujemo pacijente u ovom stadijumu, jer je njihova prognoza jako loša. Eventualno je indikovana kod jako mladih pacijenata bez komorbiditeta koji su transplant kandidati, ali prvenstveno da se pokuša nekom drugom vrstom mehaničke kratkoročne potpore stabilizovati pacijenta pa ga onda u smislu tome tretirati za ELVAD i procenjivati. Pacijenti Intermax 3 i 4 svakako su dokazali da imaju značajno poboljšanje i preživljavanja i funkcionalnog kapaciteta nakon ugradnje ELVAD-a. Ostali ambulatorni pacijenti, njihov pristup treba da bude individualan i jednostavno ugradnje ELVAD-a kod njih u određenim slučajima ima rezona. Međutim, jako je bitno da pre ugradnje ELVAD-a procenimo sve faktore rizika koji mogu dovesti do povećenog mortaliteta ovih pacijenata nakon operacije i pacijent mora biti svestan svih komplikacija koji nakon toga slede. Hvala vam na pažnju. Hvala, doktor Kinestorović. Jedno kratko pitanje za u vašem kliničkom iskustvu koje je sada već značajno i pozamašno. Da li su bolesnici visoke intermax klase kandidati za ugradnju Elvada? Odnosno šta bi bio neki vaš, pa ajde da kažemo, cut off, kom čoveku bi individualni cut off za bolesnika, kome bi savjetovali ugradnju Elvada od tih ambulantnih bolesnika? Kada govorimo o ambulantnim pacijentima, to su pacijenti svakako Intermax grupa 4 i eventualno pacijenti Intermax grupe 5, u zavisnosti ukoliko kod takvog pacijenta procenimo da nije transplant kandidat ili ukoliko situacija što se tiče transplantacije nije povoljna, kao što je, da kažem, sada bila epidemiološka COVID situacija, a postoji već popuštenje desne komore ili popuštenje drugih organa, onda bi se odlučila i za pacijenta Intermax i 5, ali svakako, znači, Intermax 4 i Intermax 5 kada govorimo o pacijentima koji su ambulantni. Kada govorimo o hospitalnim pacijentima, mislim da jedino ima rezona s obzirom da cilj jeste da pomognemo pacijentu i pacijent treba da ima ne samo da bude živ, već da ima kvalitetan život nakon ugradnje Elvada, mislim da je to Intermax grupa 3. Intermax grupa 1 i 2, to su prilično pacijenti koji su zakasneli, odnosno lekari koji nisu na vreme uputili svoje pacijente i moramo biti oprezni što se tiče toga, ali je preživljavanje, da kažem, jako loše i bez ugradnje Elvada i sa ugradnjem Elvada. Hvala lepo. Hvala, hvala Emilija. Dakle, profesor Velicki, Heart Failure Registry, molimo profesora da nam izloži praktično njegovu ideju i realizaciju i da vidimo dokle se stiglo sa tim, a nadamo se da će to imati direktan impakt na rekrutment pacijenata i na dalje razvoj LOD i transplant programa u državi. Hvala na lepom uvodu. Dakle, poštovani predsjedniče, poštovane koleginice i kolege, 
Tema ovog predavanja, kao što ste čuli, odnose se na kreiranje registra za pacijente sa srčanom slabosti. Puno smo danas čuli o srčanoj slabosti. Ono što je važno da kažemo jeste šta je to uznapredovala srčana slabost. Smatra se da negde oko 5 do 10 procenata bolesnika koje imaju dijagnozu srčane slabosti mogu se karakterisati i grupisati u kategoriju uznapredovale srčane slabosti. To podrazumeva da konvencionalna terapija, medikamentozna terapija i druge strategije za kontrolu simptoma više ne daju željeni efekat, odnosno da pacijenti koji imaju srčanu slabost mogu iskusiti te gobe koje se jadaju čak i toko mirovanja. Postoje brojne klasifikacije srčane slabosti, poznata je naravno njiha klasifikacija izdata od strane American Heart Association i Hrvatska. American College of Cardiology i taj grafikon je prikazan na ovom slajdu gde vidimo da bolesnici se kategorišu odnosno na svoje tegobe od klase A do klase D. Ono što je nama interesantno kada govorimo o uznapredovole srčanoj slabosti i svakako jeste krajnji deo klase C, odnosno kategorije C i kategorija D. Vidimo također da se i ono što je vrlo važno na ovom slajdu, lekari koji se bave lečenjem ovih bolesnika menjaju u zavisnosti od stepena težine srčane slagosti. Tako da u početnom spektru imamo lekare koji pripadaju grupi lekara opšte prakse ili internista. Kako se simptomatologija i stadijum srčane slabosti povećava, tako se i u lečenju ovih bolesnika uključuju lekari drugih specijalnosti, pre svega kardiolozi, kardiolozi koji su profilisani za lečenje uz napredovale srčane slabosti i naravno kardiohirurzi. Ovo je grafikon koji je verovatno većini vas poznat i koji prikazuje prirodni tok ili progresiju bolesti. Vidimo da u početnom stadijumu imamo jedan stabilan period, odnosno stacionaran period kad bolesnik ima minimalne tegobe ili ih nema uopšte i u određenom momentu samo da vidim kako prikazujem ovaj pointer, dobro. U jednom momentu dolazi do egzacerbacije bolesti, odnosno do dekompenzacije bolesnika, koja se kod manjeg broja bolesnika završava smrtnim ishodom, kod određenog broja bolesnika ima tešku kliničku sliku, dok određen broj bolesnika također prolazi uz blažu kliničku sliku i polako se vraća u neko prethodno, relativno normalno zdravstveno stanje. Vrlo je važno da primetimo da se ovi periodi egzacerbacije tokom vremena postoje učestali i javljaju se češće i vrlo važna opaska jeste da povratak iz ovog momenta dekompenzacije u normalno stanje više nikada nema one iste karakteristike kao što je bilo pre tog trenutka. Znači, bitno nam je da pacijente selektujemo i uputimo za napredne oblike terapije u onim situacijama kada dolazi do pojave ovih dekompenzacija, odnosno egzacerbacija. Isto tako vidimo da postoje brojne udruženja koja su pokušala da kroz različite kriterijume definišu šta je to uznapredovala srčana slabost. Pažnju ću vam usmeriti samo na posljednje izdanje Heart Failure Association i ESC kriterijuma koji definišu uznapredovalu srčanu slabost kao pojavu i prisustvo persistentnih simptoma srčane slabosti, dakle NIHA 3B ili klasa 4, pojava teške srčane disfunkcije iskazane kroz ekstremnu frakciju leve komore manje od 30% ili izolovanu popuštenje desnog srca, praćenu sa manjem ili većim promjenama u biohumoralnom odgovoru, potom epizode plućne ili sistemske kongestije koje zaktevaju visoke doze diuretske terapije ili low cardiac output sindrom koji zakteva inovazopresornu terapiju za korekciju, i značajno sniženje funkcionalnog kapaciteta koji se iskazuje kroz nizak indeks šestominutnog testa hoda, odnosno malu potrošnju kiselnika. O Intermax klasifikaciji smo već čuli dosta toga. Ono na čega bih teo da ukažem i da potencira možda je to da je spektar bolesnika na koji se Intermax odnosi spada u kategoriju 3B ili 4 NIHA klasifikacije. 
Intermax nam je značajan, čuli smo već nešto, zbog, kako zbog diagnostike, tako pre svega zbog prognostike i posebno su nam od interesa kategorije 5 do 3, koji zapravo jesu kandidati za ugradnju VAT terapije. Ovde je prikazan razvoj u polju mehaničke cirkulatorne podrške, odnosno lečenja srčane slabosti, koja započinje negde 60. godina prošlog veka sa prvom transplantacijom srca i implantacijom totalnog artificijalnog srca. Nakon toga sledi pauza 10 godina, čak i nešto i više, do momenta dok nije otkriven ciklosporin. U tom trenutku dolazi do razvoja i uvođenja u praksu medikamentne terapije srčane slabosti, koji nakon toga slede brojni trajlovi koji su pokazali uspešnost ovog načina lečenja, tako da dolazi potom i do prve implantacije vada, do otkrivanja bikavalne tehnike, takrolizmusa, do čuvenog rematch trajla 2002. godine, implantacije savremenih vada uređaja, pa sve do poslednjeg perioda kada će imamo trajlove kao što su Endurance i Momentum 3, koji su definitivno pokazali uspešnost ovog vida lečenja. Paralelno sa ovim dolazi do značajnog napretka u domenu ritmologije i elektrofiziologije, tako da ovo polje sada predstavlja kombinaciju medikamentne terapije, ritmološke terapije i naravno savremene terapije hiruškog tipa, odnosno gradnje mehaničke cirkulatorne podrške ili transplantacije srca. Koji su to centri u Srbiji koji se bave lečenjem uz napredovale srčane slabosti? Pre svega to su Klinički centar Srbije kao krovna kuća, nakon toga Institut za kardiovaskone bolesti Dedinje i Institut za kardiovaskone bolesti u Srnskoj kamenici. Važno je da skrenem pažnju možda samo na činjenicu da je oko 5% pacijenata koji imaju srčanu slabost mogu se kategorizovati u grupu pacijenta sa teškim oblikom srčane slabosti, odnosno napredne srčane slabosti, što na nivou Srbije znači da imamo otprilike oko 5000 bolesnika koji su kandidati za ovaj vid napredne terapije. E sad, ovaj slajd možda predstavlja i suštinu ove prezentacije. Do sada smo puno toga slušali i puno radova je objavljeno na temu selekcije pacijenata za VAD program. Selekcija pacijenata podrazumeva jednu detaljnu kliničku obradu ovih pacijenata, dobijanje puno i niza parametara koji govori o njihovom zdravstvenom stanju i odabar onih pacijenata koji će imati najveći benefit od ugradnje VAD-a. Međutim, postoje se pitanje kako se kreira pool pacijenata od kojih mi selektujemo one koji su kandidati za VAD terapiju. Znači, upravo se postavlja pitanje upućivanja bolesnika u neki određeni registar na nivou bolnice, države ili već neki drugi. I ono što je vrlo važno da znamo da kada se postavi sumnje ili kada se identifikuje bolesnik koji ima srčanu slabost, a koji može se karakteriše kao napredna, bez kompletne diagnostike, bez broja silnih parametara, pacijent može biti upućen u tercijanu ustanovu kako bi se dodatno ispitao i svrstao u kategoriju, odnosno u pool pacijenta iz kojeg ćemo kasnije vršiti selekciju za VAT. Ono što je važno da znamo je da je da posebno kolege iz regionalnih centara koji se susreću s ovim pacijentima imaju pravo da upute ovakve pacijente ka tercijanim centrima i to je uvek bolje uraditi na neurgentnoj bazi jer to pruža dovoljno vremena kako i lekarima, tako i porodici i pacijentu, naravno, da se dovoljno edukuje i da dobije sve neophodne podatke, informacije o tome šta takva vrsta terapije nosi, kako ona izgleda, kakav je očekivani životni vek i kvalitet života i da nakon toga pristane ili ne pristane na tu vrstu terapije. Isto tako, rano upućivanje i stvaranje ovog registra omogućava pravovremenu edukaciju pacijenata i porodice kako da se nosi sa ovim vidom terapije, kolika su često kontrole, kako izgleda život sa vadom. I konačno, ono što nam je takođe vrlo važno je da kroz ovakav jedan registar i pristup pokušamo da napravimo partnerski odnos sa kolegama kardiolozima iz regionalnih centara koji upućuju pacijente za napredan oblik lečenja srčane slabosti. 
Kratak jedan možda uvod samo o ustanovi s koje dolazim. Znači, do sada smo implantirali osam LVAD uređaja, pet pacijenata je živo. Razumljivo je da je COVID imao značajno utjecaj na dinamiku ovog programa koji se sada ponovo pokreće. Pacijente koje smo selektovali kao kandidate za VAD program smo dobili i pretragom našeg bolničkog informacijonog sistema i od naših pacijenata faktički smo dobili kandidate kojima je i ugrađen VAD. Ono što smo svakako primetili, verujem i kolege naše, jeste da postoji stalna potreba za upućivanjem pacijenata iz manjih regionalnih bolnica kako bi program zadržao svoj momentum i kako bi se vremenom i širio. Ono što je takođe od velikog značaja je da oni pacijenti koji nisu kandidati za VAD-a jesu za transplantaciju srca bivaju upućeni ka Beogradu. Ovo su centri u kojima postoji kardiološka služba na nivou Vojvodine i sa kojima imamo komunikaciju i u situacijima kada kardiolozi imaju pacijente koje mogu da svrstaju u kategoriju bolestnika sa naprednom srčanom slabosti, pacijenti bivaju upućeni ka kamenici, a opet kažem, oni pacijenti kojima ne možemo da pomognemo, smatramo da za njih postoji pomoć u drugom centru, bivaju dalje upućeni ka Beogradu. Za sada u registru imamo 45 pacijenata koji su živi, od toga 85% njih su muškog pola, prosječna životna dob 54 godine, frakcija 23%, i nekako nam je cilj da svake godine implantiramo 6 od 10 vadova, s tim da bi ovaj broj, naravno, iz godine u godinu trebalo da bude veći. E sad, postoje se pitanje koji su to kriterijumi za upućivanje bolestnika u tercijani centar. Znači, Sumarno prikazano je ovde da su to obično pacijenti koji imaju frakciju ispod 35%, koji imaju njiha klasu 3 ili 4, koji imaju jednu, dve ili više hospitalizacije tokom poslednje godine, koji imaju uvećene volumene leve komore i diametre, naravno, koji su postigli neki maksimum u optimizaciji medikamentalne terapije, koji imaju niza krvni pritisak siston ispod 100 mm žive, koji zahtevaju ili su zahtevali intravensku inotropnu terapiju, koji imaju povećene zahteve za diuretskom terapijom ili persistentne edeme i koji pokazuju znake malperfuzije krajnih organa koje se očituje kroz poremećaj bubrežne i jetrene funkcije. Ovo je zanimljiv jedan akronim, znači vidimo da piše I need help, I mislim da je jednostavno za pamćenje koja je to kategorija bolesnika koje možemo svrstiti u kategoriju bolesnika sa uznapredovnom srčanom slabosti. Ovo je prikaz, ako možete film samo napustiti, molim vas, na koji način smo implementirali ovaj registar na nivou Instituta za kardiovaskoj bolesti Vojvodina. Ili ide film, ide? Neće. Dobro. Dakle, na sajtu instituta imamo odeljak gde svaki centar regionalni ima svoje korisničko ime i svoju šifru i gde može da pristupi u određenom delu sajta gde se kroz popunjavanje određenog upitnika koji se drži nekoliko pitanja koje su koje se odnose na demografske karakteristike bolesnika, osnovne laboratorijske parametre i osnovne eho parametre, bolesnik svrstava u naš registar bolesnika sa srčanom slabosti, nakon čega naši lekari kontaktiraju bolesnike, traže dokumentaciju koja je njima na raspolaganju i zaktevaju dodatne diagnostičke procedure ukoliko su neophodne, sve u cilju dobijanja neophodnih informacija i kompletiranja potrebnih zahteva za svrstavanje bolesnika u registar srčane slabosti, iz kog se kasnije selektuju bolesnici za implantaciju vada. Sad mi je žao što niste vidjeli film, ali bit će prilike, postavit ćemo ga možda na nekom drugom medijumu. Ono što ostaje za dalje, svakako jeste ambicija da ovakav jedan registar postane možda i centralizovan, registar na nivou Srbije, gde bismo imali kompletan uvid u bolestnike koje imaju uznapredovalu srčanu slabost i gde bismo mogli da vršimo pravilno selekciju ovih pacijenata. Ono što svakako budućnost donosi, a industrija podržava, 
jeste da dolaze do razvoja naprednih tehnika, pretrage bolničkih kartona informacijonih i selekcije pacijenata opet za VAD program. Budućnost takođe donosi sve veću i sve učestaliju upotrebu različitih monitoring sistema, ovde je naveden Cardio MEMS ili Pacemaker defibrilator podaci, koji pametnim algoritmima mogu da triggeruju u trenutak kada je pacijent kandidat za VAD terapiju. Ne treba da zaboravimo da je u upotrebi stvara već značajan broj pametnih uređaja, pametni telefoni ili pametni satovi koji imaju mogućnost detekcije snimanja srčanog ritma, poremeć srčanog ritma i tako dalje, što sve kroz neke napredne možda algoritme veštačke inteligencije mogu da opet predodrede bolesnike za neki napredan vid lečenja ove bolesti. Hvala vam na vašoj pažnji. Hvala. Profesore, samo prvo iskrene čestitke, veliki je napor napraviti registar, skupiti bolesnike i opet na verovatno dnevnoj bazi te bolesnike pratiti. Kratko pitanje, u centrima koji su vam referral centri, znači naveli ste tamo Kikinda Sombor iz Vojvodine, ili imate dedicated heart failure specialiste, ili imate određene kontakt osobe, jer nekako je to mene ličilo kao korak napred u širenju hard failure mreže u zemlji, naravno u saradnji sa udruženjem za srčanu insicijenciju Srbije, da bi to, da li ste vi već o tom razmišljali, da li to već postoji? Jesmo, znači, saradnja je uspostavljena sa određenim osobama, znači određenog profila, to su kardiolozi koji su manje ili više usmereni na lečenje srčane slabosti i koji su uključeni u ovaj registar. Ono što nam ostaje svakako je da vršimo promociju ovog načina, dakle širimo mrežu ljudi, kardiologa, internista i da podižemo svest da terapijska mogućnost za ovako teške pacijente postoji. Postoje tačno kontakt osobe koje su raspoređene u regionalnim centrima i koje vrše i prijavljivanje ovih bolesnika na naš sistem. Da, a follow-up rade u matičnim ustanovama ili svih 35 bolesnika rade regularne follow-upove kod vas? Follow-up, kada pacijent uđe u naš registar, onda tad postaje naš pacijent. Emilija, ali imaš ti? S obzirom da smo se složili da što se tiče ove teške grupe pacijenata, timing jeste najbitnije za njihovu dalju prognozu, pa me interesuje u vašem registru tih 35 pacijenata, koja je najčešće Intermax grupa zastupljena? Najčešća Intermax grupa je grupa, prosečna vrednost Intermax kategorije je između 4 i 5. Znači, upućuju na vreme. Upućuju na vreme, tako je. I to je ono što predstavlja zapravo i osnovu ovog registra, da kroz praćenje sa strane naše kuće možemo da pravovremeno selektujemo pacijente koji su u određeno vreme indikovani za VAT terapiju. Nažalost, imamo i pacijente koji su kasno upućeni i zbog toga što smo još uvijek na početku, pokušavamo da tražimo idealne kandidate, ali okolnosti su takve da će pacijenti možda i sa Intermaxom 3, ponekad i sa 2 biti kandidati za VAT terapiju. Hvala lepo. Ja mislim da moramo da zaključimo sesiju. Sigurno da pitanje ima još puno, ali imat ćemo još ovakvih sastanaka. Još jednom zahvalnost kompaniji Abbott i ovako nadam se i dalje uspešnom danu. Hvala lepo. Dakle, bavit ćemo se u narednih sat vremena profesorka Šalinger, profesor Otašević, Vukčević i moja malenkost sa dva vrlo značajna leka u terapiji kardiovaskolnih bolesnika, dakle sa Forsigom i Brilikom. I bez obzira što piše Forsiga in Cardiologist Focus, a ja sam kardiohirurg, meni je palo u čast da najavim ovaj simpozijum. Pa bih ja zamolio profesorku Šalinger i profesora Otaševića da počnu sa bavljenjem lekom Forsiga. Izvolite. Hvala profesore na najavi, hvala Astri na ovom divnom sastanku i hvala Astri na Forksigi, odnosno Dapagliflazon. Dakle, da bismo pričali o DAPA-HF studiji, samo se kratko podsjetimo 
najtižih pacijenata kardiovaskularnih, dakle pacijenata sa srčanom insuficijencijom i redukovanom ekcijonom frakcijom. Nažalost, pored sve dostupne terapije, devet bolesnika od deset ima simptome srčane insuficijencije i u konačnom veliki rizik od ponavljanih hospitalizacija i kardiovaskularne smrti. Nažalost, ta spirala smrti izgleda kao spirala kod malignih bolesnika. Prosečno preživljavanje svakog pojedinačnog bolesnika se, da kažem, vrlo brzo smanjuje sa svakom posledičnom hospitalizacijom. I nažalost, u prvih pet godina od postavljanja diagnoze srčane insuficijencije 50% bolesnika umre, znači pet od deset. Prosto dugo smo već onako friendly sa uobičajnom terapijom srčane insuficijencije, dakle ace inhibitorima, te blokatorima, beta blokatorima, diureticima, handlove petlje, mineralokortikoidnim antagonistima i nakon paradigm HF studije kao još jedan stup ove terapije koja je jako važna za izuzetno vulnerabilnu populaciju bolesnika je sakubitril valsartan koji je u odnosu na enalapril smanjio rezidualni rizik za kompozitni end point kardiovaskularnog letalnog ishoda i prve hospitalizacije zbog srčane insuficijencije. Zahvaljujući endokrinolozima na čelo sa astrom, od 14. aprila 2021. godine mi imamo novi lek Forksigu za lečenje upravo ovih bolesnika. Zašto bi nas u konačnom zanimao diabetes? Prosto kako smo uspeli da preuzmemo lek od endokrinologa? U Dikler studiji je zapažena značajna redukcija hospitalizacija zbog srčane insuficijencije i kardiovaskularne smrti u odnosu na placebo da pa gliflozinom u dozi od 10 mg. 17% je redukovan relativni rizik od kompozitnog endpointa, a za ponavljane hospitalizacije 27%, a prosto te hospitalizacije te kako ubrzavaju spiralu smrti. Tako je u septembru 2019. godine Dapagliflozi napravio pravu malu revoluciju na Evropskom i Svetskom kongresu kardiologa pokazujući nam mogućnost smanjenja kardiovaskularnih događaja kod bolesnika sa smanjenom ekcijonom frakcijom ako i nemaju diabetes. I eto nas kod DAPA HF studije. Dakle, utjecaj DAPA gliflozina kod bolesnika sa srčanom insuficijencijom, redukovanom ekcijonom frakcijom bez obzira na diabetes. Primarni cilj je bio kompozitni ishod, dakle kardiovaskularni ishod, odnosno nepovoljan, odnosno letalni ishod, hospitalizacije ili poseda u urgentnom centru usled pogoršanja srčane insuficijencije, što nije tako redko. Sekundarni ciljevi su bili kompozitni ishod, kardiovaskularne smrti ili hospitalizacija, promjena kvaliteta života, kompozitni renalni ishodi i to je sve praćeno na 4744 bolesnika koji su randomizovani u dve kohorte. Jedna kohorta, jedna grupa bolesnika je bila na dapagliflozinu od 10 mg, druga na placebu i naravno obe grupe su bile na već standardnoj terapiji srčane insuficijencije. Ovo je važan slajd zato što je starostna do bila 66 godina. Prosečna ekcijona frakcija 31%, povišene vrednosti biomarkera, znači NT pro BMP-a, glomerularna filtracija 66, ali je važno da je 41% bolesnika imao glomerularnu filtraciju manju od 60 ml u minuti. I takođe ne manje važno Niha 2,67%, Niha 3,32% bolesnika. 
45% ljudi je imalo diabetes tipa 2. Dakle, ostali pacijenti nisu bili diabetičari. Hospitalizacije zbog srčane insuficijencije 47% i ne mali broj 38% atrijalna fibrilacija. Uz već standardnu i nama jako dugo poznatu terapiju srčane insuficijencije, važno je naglasiti da je u ovoj studiji 11% bolesnika dobijalo sakubitril valsarta. Šta se dokazalo u DAPA HF studiji? Dokazana je efikasnost leka koji produžava život ovim bolesnicima. Dakle, 26% relativna redukcija rizika, a apsolutna redukcija rizika, gotovo 5%, NNT 21%. Još važnije, takav efekt se ostvarivao već nakon 28 dana, odnosno 4 nedelje. Forksiga je konačno značajno smanjila i pogoršanje srčane slabosti, u odnosu na placebo za 30% i prosto došla na pijedestal jedinog SGLT2 inhibitora koji dokazano redukuje kardiovaskularni mortalitet ovih teških bolesnika, a takođe i redukuje ukupni mortalitet bolesnika sa redukovanom ekcijnom frakcijom da je relativna redukcija rizika 17%. Ne manje važno je i to kako se osjećaju u bolesnici. Dakle, prosto postoji jako važni lekovi koje propisujemo pacijentima, a ne utiču na njihov kvalitet života u svakodnevnom životu. Dakle, popunjavajući upitnike, bolesnici su dali podatke da su izgubili simptome i da je bilo značajno smanjenje pogoršanja simptoma srčane insuficijencije. E sad, kako je to kod različitih subpopulacija bolesnika, reće profesor Petar Otašević? Hvala ti, Sonja, na ovako divnom uvodu. Pa mi smo videli zapravo kako Forksiga, odnosno da pogliflozin, deluje kod celokupne populacije bolesnika koji su uključeni u studiju. Međutim, Džavos uvek kriju nekim detaljima i mi zapravo kada pročitamo rezultate cele studije, imamo određene sumnje da li se to može primeniti baš na sve različite su populacije bolesnika koje mi vidimo. Ono što je dobro vesti da je da pogliflozin zapravo efikasan nezavisno od bilo koje pridružene varijabla. Prema tome, da pa gliflozin je efikasan kod bolestnika sa srčanom slabošću nezavisno od bazalne ekcijone frakcije, nezavisno od prethodne istorije srčane slabosti, nezavisno od godina, sistemog krvnog pritiska i renalne funkcije. U sledećih nekoliko slajdova ću pokušati da elaboriram sve ove navode. Dakle, prvo i osnovno pitanje jeste da li je lek koji je primarno dizajniran za diabet i to je nešto što napominjemo, jer jednostavno kaljozi su nenadano dobili oruđe iz armamentarijuma potpuno druge subspecizacije. Znači, da li je lek koji je dizajniran primarno za diabet efikasan kod bolesnika koji ne imaju diabeta? Da, PHF studija nam je dala nedvosmislen i jasan odgovor na ovo pitanje, kao što vidite sa vaše leve strane, znači da pa gliflozin je efikasan kod bolesnika sa diabetom, relativna redukcija rizika 25%, ali isto tako efikasan je bolesnika koji ne imaju diabetu, relativna redukcija rizika čak 27%. Prema tome, slobodno možete dati fork sigu vašim bolesnicima srčnom slabošću koji imaju i još važnije onima koji ne imaju diabetu. Ja sam bio jako skeptičan kada smo prvo počeli da razgovaramo o upotrebi forksige kod nediabetičara, međutim, ovo je slajd koji me je ubedio, znači koji je praktično ovo od mene napravio verujućeg kardiologa u ovaj koncept lečenja, a to je da zapravo bolesnici koji nemaju diabetes nemaju promjenu hemoglobina 1C tokom perioda praćenja. Zašto je to tako? Pa i prostog razloga zato što forksiga zapravo sprečava resorpciju šećera koji se već nalazi u urinu. Ukoliko neće nemate šećer, nećete imati šećer u urinu i nećete praktično imati bilo kakav efekt na koncentraciju glikemije u krvi. Ono što se postavlja kao sledeće pitanje jeste dobro. Znači, rekli smo da Forksiga smanjuje mortalitet kod nediabetičara, međutim, možemo postaviti paradigmu i donekle drugačije. Znači, da li Forksiga smanjuje 
nastanak novonastalog diabeta kod bolesnika sa srčnom slabošću koji diabet nemaju? Odgovor je da. I ta relativna redukcija rizika je čak 32%. Zašto nam je to značajno? Iz prostog razloga što novonastali diabetes mellitus tip 2 kod bolesnika sa srčnom slabošću povećao kardiovaskovi mortalitet za 77%, a ukupni mortalitet za 70%. Prema tome, u apsolutnom interesu i nas kao lekara, a naravno pre svega bolesnika, da pokušamo da sprečemo nastanak diabeta. Šta se dešava sa bubrežnom funkcijom? Do sada je praktično prema stažetku karakteristika leka Forxiga se davala isključno kod bolesnika koji su imali i GFR preko 60%. I to je na neki način ograničavalo upotrebu ovog leka, značajan broj naših bolestnika sa srčanom slabošću ima i GFR ispod 60. Da PHF je praktično pomerila ovu granicu beznog davanja Forxigi na 30 ml u minuti, a da pa CKD, koja se bava pre svega bubrežnim bolestnicima, ovu granicu pomerila čak na 25 ml. Ono što je još zanimljivo jeste da ne samo da je Forxiga efikasna i bezbedna kod obopre bolesnika, nego se čini da je čak kod onih sa težom i odmaklom srčnom bubrežnom insuficijencijom još efikasnija u odnosu na bolesnike kojih je bubrežna insuficijencija očuvana. Dakle, da li je svejedno, da li naši bolesnici imaju ishemijsku ili neishemijsku kardimiopatiju, odnosno etiologiju srčnog puštanja? Da. Znači, Forxiga je podjednako efikasna kod obe bolesnika etiologije srčane slabosti. Da li je efikasnost dapaglifozina nezavisnost godina starosti bolesnika? Apsolutno. Kao što vidite na ovom slajdu, praktično u periodu od 40. do 90. godine, do 90. godine efikasnost je potpuno jednaka što se tiče kardiovalskog mortaliteta ili hospitalizacije zbog srčane slabosti ili bilo kog drugog razloga, kao i smrtnosti bilo kog uzroka. To nam posebno znači sa ove desne strane spektra, gde vidimo da i naši najstariji bolesnici zapravo imaju značajnu korist od plimene Forxigi. Sledeće pitanje koje nam se postavlja jeste da li Forxigu možemo dati kod svih bolesnika sa sniženom ejekcijnom frakcijom, odnosno da li Forxiga podjednako efikasna nezavisno od vrednosti ejekcijne frakcije. Odgovor je još jednom da. Forxigu slobodno možete koristiti praktično u celom spektru bolesnika sa strčanom slabošću sa smanjenom ejekcijnom frakcijom. Smanjenje krvnog pritiska. Naše bolesnici sa srčanom slabošću uzimaju veliki broj lekova, od kojih značajan broj smanjuje krvni pritisak i ta hipotenzija je nešto čega se zapravo jako plašimo kod naših bolesnika. Dobra vest je da tapaglifozin minimalno smanjuje sistolni krvni pritisak, kao što vidite na ovome grafikonu sa vaše leve strane, otprilike negde 3 do 4 mm živinog stuba. I ono što je još važnija vest jeste, vest, činjenica nije vest, jeste da je to smanjenje praktično zavisno od inicijalne vrednosti krvnog pritiska. Odnosno, će smanjenje krvnog pritiska biti najveće kod onih bolesnika koji su imali najveći sistolni krvni pritisak, a najmanje kod bolesnika koji su imali najmanje. Tokom vremena se vrednosti krvnog pritiska polako normalizuju. Ono što nam je takođe jako važno jeste da je praktično Forxiga efikasna kod svih bolesnika sa srčanom slabošću bez obzira na bazalne vrednosti krvnog pritiska. Ono što znamo iz kliničkog iskustva i svakodnevnog rada jeste da praktično prognoza bolesnika zavisi od koncentracije natrijudskih peptida, u ovom slučaju konkretno NT pro BMP-a. Što je veća koncentracija NT pro BMP-a, naše bolesnici će imati više događaja. Forxiga nam i tu pomaže iz prostog razloga što, kao što vidite sa vaše desne strane, primjena Forxige statistički značajno smanjuje koncentracije NT pro BMP-a koje kod bolesnika na placebo rastu. Prema tome, naše bolesnici idu u levu stranu na ovoj krivi kada su na Forxigi i imaju manje rizik od velikih nežnih krivaslovnih događaja. Da li se Forxiga koristi samo za nestabilne bolesnike, odnosno za bolesnike koji su bili hospitalizirani unutar prethodnih 12 meseci, što vidite sa vaše desne strane, odgovor je ne. Forxiga zaista ima najveće povoljno dejstvo kod te grupe bolesnika koji su imali hospitalizaciju unutar 12 meseci, međutim Forxiga značajno smanjuje mortalitet u morbiditet i kod bolesnika koji zapravo ni u jednom trenutku nisu bili hospitalizirani. Poruka je vrlo jasna, nemojte čekati da se vaše bolesnici pogoršaju, dajte im Forxigu i ukoliko koliko su njiha 1 ili njiha 2 klasa. Da li je bitno koliko imate kilograma? Ne, možete biti pothranjeni ili ekstremno gojazni, Forxiga će smanjiti vaš kardiovaskovni mortalitet i morbiditet ukoliko imate HEF-REF. I tu dolazimo do sledeće teme, a to je da li to sve 
kako je to zapravo sve moguće, da jedan lek zapravo ima zaista sve te povoljne efekte naše pozitive? Deluje magično, onako prosto, kao jedna bajka. I prosto, kada pogledamo koji su mehanizmi kako bi u stvari objasnili kako da pa gliflozi nutiče na srčanu insuficijenciju, krenut ćemo od hemodinamike, odnosno da kažem jednog mehanicističkog onako makro pristupa. Prosto smanjenje prelouda, afterlouda, smanjenje volumena cirkulišuće tečnosti, onda malo dublji mehanizam, super gorivo i na kraju povoljen efekt na remodelovanje miokarda u konačnom dovode do potencijalnih kliničkih efekata. Popravljaju se simptomi, popravlja se kontraktilnost i konačno štiti miokard od lezije i progresije srčane insuficijencije. Malo pre si pomenuo da prosto forksiga deluje na nivou proksimalnih tubula. Dakle, ona redukuje reabsorciju glukoze na nivou proksimalnih tubula i samo mali procenat, znači 10% glukoze, će se reabsorbovati zahvaljujući SGLT1 receptorima. Ta glikozurija, natriureza i osmotska diureza u konačnom smanjuje hemoglobin A1C, ali to sada nama nije point. Point je da će smanjiti telesnu težinu, dakle smanjit će taj prekomerni volumen o kome jako vodimo računa kod bolesnika sa srčanom insuficijencijom i moći da utiče na krvni pritisak. Kada se Forksiga još uvek davala samo u diabetesu, koje je jedno hronično inflamatorno stanje u kojem se dešava i hipertrofija leve komore i izlaže miokrt toj hroničnoj inflamaciji sa porastom citokina, pa usput se remodeluje ekstracelularni matriks, pa onda popušta srce, pa se onda remeti oksidativni metabolizam, pa se ćelije ne hrane adekvatno, znači nema moderne ishrane ćelija, kao i moderne ishrane kada držimo dijetu, je li tako, nema ketona, nego se više koriste ugljenih hidrati, odnosno glukoza, pa u konačnom dođe do kardiomiocitne apoptoze, da pa gliflozin dokazano deluje na sve ove celularne i subcelularne mehanizme, negde vodeći ka reverziji remodelovanja za koje su odgovorni ovi mehanizmi. S obzirom na malopređešnji slajd na kome se vidi da se sprečava reabsorpcija glukoze na nivou proksimalnih tubula, pa se podstiče natriureza, smanjuje krvni pritisak, smanjuje hemoglobina A1C, odnosno potenci radiureza, prosto postavljamo pitanje da li su oni jednaki, mislim na SGLT2 inhibitore, sa diureticima Henle ove petlje. Obe grupe lekova izazivaju i natriurezu i smanjenje intersticijalnog volumena koji je u stvari problematičan, ali ne smanjuju u toj meri intravaskularni volumen koji nam nije uvek poželjan efekat diuretika Henleove petlje. Pa tako kada poredimo DAPA gliflozin i rezultate DAPA HF studije i Emperor Reduced, odnosno EMPA gliflozin, kao dodatak već poznatoj standardnoj terapiji za srčanu insuficijenciju, kardiovaskularna smrt, rehospitalizacije, odnosno hospitalizacije ili ti samo hospitalizacije, se ne razlikuju značajno između ova dva leka. Ali, kada pogledamo kardiovaskularnu smrt i ukupni mortalitet, dapagliflozin ima značajno bolji efekt u odnosu na empagliflozin. Te tako, Forksiga jeste prvi i jedini SGLT2 inhibitor koji ima odobrenu indikaciju za srčanu insuficijenciju i redukovanu ejekcijonu frakciju nezavisno od diabeta u Sjedinjenim američkim državama, Evropskoj uniji 
i od 14. aprila u Srbiji. I to je, mislim, zaista ne samo činjenica, nego i divna vest. Hvala ti, Sonja. Samo ćemo još prebaciti na slajd. Da li ima besplatnog ručka, odnosno da li ima efikasnosti uz jako dobru bezbednost? Čini se da u konkretnom slučaju ima. Zato što vidimo da kada uporedimo bezbednostni profil dapaglifozina sa placebom u DAPHF studiji, vidimo da praktično nema razlike između dapaglifozina i placeba što se tiče većine velikih i značajnih bezbednostnih ciljeva. Prema tome, naši bolesnici koji su na Forksig imaju niza krizik od hipotenzije, nizak rizik od ureterogenitalnih infekcija, zatim nizak rizik od renalnih nežnih događaja, bi čak rekao da Forksig ima povoljno dejstvo na prezervaciju funkcije bubrega. I ono što nam je jako važno i što se pomalo plašimo kada koristimo lekove koje imaju efekte na bubreg, jeste da Forksiga zapravo izazeva hiperkalijemiju. Ono što je meni nekako najveća lepota primjera Forksiga, zato što je njeno davanje beskrajno i beskonačno jednostavno. Svi možemo da budemo jako, jako dobri doktori. Iz prostog razloga što je to jedna tableta dnevno, znači nemamo problem komplijanse i ono što nas nekako uvek sreću kvari kod bolestnika srčanom slabošću, stavno pričamo o toj titraciji, nikako te lekove distitiramo kako treba. Ovde nema titracije, znači date 10 mg Forksige i zaboravite. Jednostavno, vaši pacijenti su, bare moji pacijenti su zaista jako, jako komplijantni i zaista minimalan broj neželjenih efekata. E sad, šta nam kažu aktualne smernice? Znači, nekih šest meseci unazad, tako ću od nove godine, mi stalno pričamo šta će da nam kažu sad evropske nove preporuke i svi nešto gledamo u pasu i šta će da bude. Ali dok smo čekali te nove evropske preporuke koje izlaze za nekih 15 dana, konačno ćemo shvatiti koje mesto je SGLT2 inhibitor u tim novim preporukama. Evropsko društvo kardiologa nije čekalo, već izdalo praktično position paper o upotrebi SGLT2 inhibitora kod bolestnika sa HFRF-om, gde se jasno definiše da je dapoglifozin zapravo prvi SGLT2 inhibitor koji smanjuje rizik od pogoršanja srčane slabosti i smanjuje rizik kardiovaspolni mortalitet. Ono što je takođe važno i što je Sonja rekla, on poboljša okolitet života, jer vrlo često predsenjamo dužinu trajanja života u odnosu na kvalitet života, ali dobro, to je sad već filozofsko pitanje, nema vremena za to. Umeđu vremena, dok smo čekali evropske preporuke, američke preporuke su izašle u januar ove godine, gde praktično jasno vidimo da praktično SGLT2 inhibitori imaju svoje zasluženo mesto praktično kao, ajde da kažem, prva B linija primene kod bolesnika sa srčnom slabošću posle kombinacije beta blokatora ARNIA, odnosno AC inhibitora, i mislim da jednostavno nemamo izgovor za kasno uključivanje ovih lekova kod bolesnika, jer jednostavno ovi lekovi nisu lekovi za vađenje, što bi se reklo u žargonovic, u lekove koje treba da spreče buduće događaje i poboljšće kvalite života naših bolesnika. Još jedna rad iz januara ove godine, to je kako bi mogle možda da izgledaju nove preporuke. Ono što nikad nećemo tačno znati kako će tačno, mislim, nećemo imati nikada studije koje će porediti sekvencu davanja lekova, međutim, ono što mi se čini da će se dogoditi jeste da će praktično neće imati prvu, drugu i treću liniju lekova koje ćemo davati, već ćemo praktično sve lekove sa dokazanim smanjenjem mortaliteta, to su beta blokatori, izgledateljski hibitori, ARNI, MRA, davati u jako, jako kratkom roku. Ono što predlaže John McMurray i Milton Packer jeste da verovatno bi najbolja i najoptimalnija prva linija davanja bila beta blokatori, SGD2 inhibitori, a nakon toga ARNI i MRA. I to nas dovodi do kraja ovog, ajde da kažem, zvaničnog dela našeg dela simpozijuma. Ukoliko imamo neka pitanja, mislim da smo spremni da odgovorimo. Samo bih se vratila na slajd, upravo posle ovog poslednjeg slajda, to je upravo ovaj slajd koji smo preskočili namerno, da pokažemo stubiće koji čine dokazanu redukciju mortaliteta u srčanoj insuficijenciji, gde umesto ova dva stuba prosto biramo jedan, je li tako, za koji je potrebno titriranje, a za poslednji stup nam titriranje nije potrebno i u stvari sam zato to htela da pokažemo na kraju. Hvala ti, Pera. Hvala tebi, Sonja. 
da li imamo neka... Hvala lepo, ja predlažem da ostavimo diskusiju za kraj, da napravimo i ovaj drugi set predavanja, pa onda da napravimo jednu zajedničku diskusiju. Dakle, posle današnjeg dana, mislim da nećemo više organizovati zajedničke sastanke kardiologa i kardiohirurga, jer u vrlo kratkom vremenskom roku, u jednom danu, shvatite da nemate više kome da operišete kebić, da više nemate kome da menjate aortni zalistak zato što sve preuzima tavi, a izgleda sa ovako superiornim lekovima i omasomljavanjem njihove primjene da nećemo više imati da operišemo ni srčanu insuficijenciju. Tako da nisam siguran da ćemo nastaviti sa ovakvim zajedničkim sastancima. Ja bih pokušao nešto od toga da opovrgnem, ali mi to znanje ne omogućava, tako da ću se s druge strane možda bolje i pripremiti za ovakav sastanak. Naš, profesora Vukčević i mene, zadatak je u nekoliko drugačiji, a to je da pričamo o dvojnoj antiagregacijonoj terapiji, odnosno o briliku. To je lek koga smo se mi jako, 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 jako mnogo plašili. Kada nam se pojavi čovjek sa brilikom, a pojavljuju se jako često zato što imamo seriju bolesnika kod kojih je takozvana hibridna revaskularizacija u stvari stvarnost, Dakle, imate gotovo svakodnevno bolesnike koji su sa implantiranim stentovima, bilo u primarnoj PCI ili u hroničnom lečenju, hronične angine pectoris, koji su na dvojnoj antiagregacijnoj terapiji i onda se vi hvatate za glavu. Ali i mi smo tu dosta toga naučili pa se više ne plašimo. Dakle, šta smo naučili? Naučili smo da je dvojna antiagregacijna, agregacijona terapija, neophodno u akutnom koronom sindromu, zato što reduko iz kemijski događaj preverena, ponovni iz kemijski događaj, neophodna je kod pacijenata nakon neuspele PCI, neophodna je kod pacijenata nakon uspele PCI i neophodna je kod svih bolesnika kod kojih je urađen kebić. Ja to kažem na jutarnjem sastanku jednom u mesec dana, zato što je dalje neka otpustna lista ode sa naše klinike bez dvojne antiagregacijone terapije. Dakle, još jedna dvojna antiagregacijna terapija je obavezna kod svih pacijenata sa akutnim koronarnim sindromom koji idu na hirušku revoskovarizaciju miokarda. Zašto je to tako? Pa to je tako zato što je dokazana povećena prohodnost graftova, pogotovo vene, safene i radijalke. Arterija mamarija ima tako, tako superioran rejt prohodnosti grafta da se stiče utisak da je nemoguće popraviti njenu prohodnost i sa druge strane direktno utiče na ishemijske događaje, odnosno izazvane, odnosno mortalitet izazvane ishemijskim događajima i meis, možda ne udara akutni infarkt. Sa druge strane, vojna antitrombocitna terapija povećava rizik od krvarenja, odnosno komplikacije izazvane krvavljenjem. Šta je prednost brilika? Krećemo, eto, sa pričom o briliku direktno, pa to je praktično jedini antiagregacijone lek od koga dolazi do oporavka trombocita, već nakon tri dana je funkcija trombocita gotovo u potpunosti oporavljena. I odakle smo to naučili? Naučili smo iz platu studije, prof. Rukčević i ja smo razgovarali ko će pomenuti platu studiju ili reći u nekoliko reči o tome, pa je to palo u meni u zadatak, a ja sam opet izdvojio ono što je meni zanimljivo, a to je ovih 1800 bolesnika, što je neka kohorta od nekih 10% ogromnog broja bolesnika koji je uključeno u ovoj studiju, koji su randomizovani 1 prema 1 na tika, grelor i klopidogrel. Sve, kada pogledate rezultate ove studije, se nalazi na strani brilika, odnosno tika grelora, dakle, pojednostavljeno, redukuje kardiovaskularnu smrt, odnosno redukuje šansu za kardiovaskularnu smrću za 48% u odnosu na Plavix, redukuje ukupnu smrtnu za 51% u odnosu na Plavix, a ne povećava rizik od krvavljenja. Dakle, još jednom upotreba brilika smanjuje ukupni mortalitet, a sa druge strane ne povećava rizik od krvavljenja. Zašto je to tako velika krvarenja nakon kebiđa su perioperativno, intrakaranjno krvarenje u 48 sati, reoperacija nakon zatvaranja sternuma, masovne transfuzije krvi i velika torakalna drenaža i naravno da svako od ovih kliničkih stanja ili sindroma dovodi do masovnog, odnosno drastičnog povećanja smrtnosti kod operisanih bolesnika i svako od ovih stvari mi hoćemo da izbegnemo posle operacije, odnosno kod nas na sastanku bude žustra diskusija bilo šta od ovoga da se desi. Pa onda, ako je odgovor da je pacijent bio na dvojnoj antiagregacijnoj terapiji, morali smo da ga operišemo unutar 24 sata nakon ukidanja ovoga leka, imamo neku vrstu opravdanja, ali smo videli da ukoliko briliku ukinemo tri dana 
prehirurgije ili plaviks pet dana prehirurgije, tako krvarenje neće biti. Dakle, još jednom preporuk iz 2017. godine kod pacijenata s akutnim koronarnim sindronom, lečenik daptom koji ide na kebić i ne zaktevaju dugoročnu oralnu antikokulantnu terapiju, neophodan je nastavak terapije pacijenata. P12, Y12 inhibitora. Kod pacijenata koji su na daptu nakon neadavne implantacije, stenta u okviru mesec dana, koji su kasnije podvrknuti kardiohirurgije, neophodno je nastaviti dapt nakon operacije i to je ono što je jasno. Kako smo mi na našoj klinici shvatili da to nije tako opasno? Pa shvatili smo tako što smo sledili ove stvari koje smo malo pre pomenuli, dakle sledili smo preporuke, Koristili smo vrlo ekstenzivno testove hemostaze, donekle modifikovali operativnu tehniku i uveli upotrebu citosrba. Šta nam preporuke govore? Pa to je ovo što smo malo pre pomenuli. Ukinite brilik tri dana, plavik s pet dana pre operacije, odnosno imat ćete bolesnika koji neće krvariti. Bez obzira što je nivo preporuke 2, pardon, klasa 2B, nivo preporuke B, Za upotrebu testova hemostaze, multiplate ili rotem, se rade praktično kod svakog bolesnika koji kod nas ide na hirušku revaskovarizaciju miokarda i to je sigurno drastično uticalo s jedne strane na redukciju upotrebe transfuzija krvi, alogene krvi nakon operacije, uz još neke finese, dakle upotrebu intraoperativnog spasavanja krvi, lokalnih hemostatika u obliku fibrinskih lepkova. Dakle, korigovanje fibrinoliza postoperativne, i pokušaj uticanja na preoperativnu strategiju u pogledu narušene trombocitne funkcije su nam doveli do redukcije upotrebe alogene krvi dramatično, a kod starijih ljudi to je od ogromnog kliničkog značaja. Šta smo radili u operativnoj tehnici? Pa off-pump radimo kod svakoga ko zahteva urgentnu hirušku revoskovarizaciju miokarda, a nalazi se na dvojnoj antiagregacijnoj terapiji, dakle ovo je skeletonizovana mamarija leva i desna u Y obliku operacije koje se radi off-pump, dakle podignuto srce sa divajsima koji pomažu stabilizaciju srca tokom operativnog zahvata. I šta smo radili još ukoliko bolesnika moramo da stavimo na vantelesni krvotok, recimo ako je hemodinamski nestabilan i ne može da podnese manipulacije sa srcem, pa primetili smo da citosorbi, imate sada sve više publikacija, to je stvar koja je praktično uvedena u kliničku praksu od pre dve godine, dakle upotreba citosorba u cilju sprečavanja teške hiruške hemoragije kod bolesnika sa dvojnom antiagregacijnom terapijom i u kliničkoj praksi na našoj seriji od preko 20 bolesnika, dakle ne velikoj seriji, ali dovoljno velikoj da možemo da steknemo makar neki utisak, to radi. Dakle, još jednom hitna hirurgija, moramo čovjeka odmah operisati, koristit ćete neki od ovih trikova da sprečite krvarenje, a da se od druge strane ne dovedete u pitanje okluziju stenta ili šansu da taj čovjek doživi akutni koronarni sindrom perioperativno. Ukoliko se radi o urgentnoj hirurgiji, sačekati 3, 5 ili 7 dana i naravno za elektivne bolesnike insistirati na ukidanju tog drugog antiagregacijonog leka uz nastavak terapije aspirina. Ticaglerol je dakle lek izbora u okviru terapije dvojnom antiagregacijom i dvojne antiagregacijone terapije nakon kebidža i ticaglerol redukuje opšti mortalitet kao i kardiovaskularni mortalitet kod kebidža koronarnih bolesnika nakon akutnog koronarnog sindroma. Ali ja bih još jednom naglasio, hard team kod svakog bolesnika, koliko god to nekad bilo teško, a pogotovo kod bolesnika kod kojih imamo bilo kakvu dilemu, je od neprocenjivog značaja. Dakle, telefon profesora Vukčevića je stalno uključen, pozovete ga, pitate ga i on vam kaže, e, e, nemoj to da radiš, možda to mogu da uradim ja ili obrnuto. Hvala lepo. Vlado, izvoli. Zahvaljujem profesoru Putniku na uvodu. Moj zadatak će biti da pričam malo o prodoženoj primjeni dvojne antiagregacijone terapije kod koronarnih bolesnika. Vi znate da po preporukama mi dajemo dvojnu antiagregacijonu terapiju u akutnom koronarnom sindromu 12 meseci, bez obzira da li je bolesnik dobio stent ili nije dobio stenta, a nakon ugradnje stenta kod elektivnih bolesnika u stabilnoj bolesti dajemo dvojnu antiagregacijonu terapiju najmanje 6 meseci. Ta dvojna terapija ima za cilj da prevenira trombozu stenta dok se ne završi takozvana endotelizacija stenta. Znači, cilj ove terapije je da u vreme dok se stent ne prekrije, dok se stent ne prekrije endotelom, koga trombociti prepoznaju kao svoju 
prirodnu sredinu i dok trombociti mogu da dođu u kontakt sa metalom na površini stenta, da blokiraju agregabilnost trombocita i na taj način sačuvaju krvni sud od tromboze. Nakon što prođe ovih 6 ili 12 meseci, takođe postoji rizik od oboljevanja, ali posle toga rizici su uglavnom posljedica tromboze krvnih sudova kako na mestu ugradnje stente i to pre svega zbog neoateroskleroze, a ne zbog neendotelizacije, tako i na drugim koronarnim i moždanim krvnim sudovima koji takođe mogu da imaju aterosklerotične plakove, sklone rupturi plaka. I neka je procena da u periodu od prve do pete godine nekih oko 25% bolesnika to živi novi trombotični događaj bez obzira na primenu terapije ukoliko se ne daje dvojna antiagregacijona terapija. U tom periodu, posle godinu dana, trombotične komplikacije po svojoj učestvalosti nadilaze tzv. hemoragijske komplikacije. Preporuke za primenu dvojne antiagregacijne terapije su takve da ona treba da bude potpuno individualizovana, odnosno da treba da se proceni kod svakog pojedinačnog bolesnika u svakom trenutku koliki je njegov hemoragijski, a koliki je trombotični rizik. Svaki pojedinačni bolesnik će u različitim periodima svog života imati povećan hemoragijski ili povećan trombotični rizik zavisno od mnogih faktora primene oralne antikoagulantne terapije, primene drugih antiagregacijonih lekova, pogoršanja, bubrežne funkcije i sl. Da bismo mogli taj rizik da procenimo, koriste nam različiti skorovi i oni pomažu da se odredi koji bolesnici mogu da dobiju dužu dvojnu antiagregacijnu terapiju kod kojih ona mora da bude prekinuta. Zvanične preporuke kažu da čak i kod ljudi koji imaju povećan hemoragijski rizik u prvoj fazi akutnog koronarnog sindroma u prvih mesec do tri meseca dajemo dvojnu antiagregacijnu terapiju, a kod onih koji imaju nizak hemoragijski rizik dvojnu antiagregacijnu terapiju ili single antiagregacijni lek dajemo i u produženoj terapiji primeni s tim što preporuke kažu da posle 12 meseci možemo da dajemo kombinaciju aspirina i tikagrelora, a kao jedini antiagregacijoni lek koji može da se daje i posle 12 meseci je tikagrelor ili aspirin. Kako pogledamo analizu bolesnika koji su procenjivani pomoću takozvanog precise DAP skora, vidimo da čak i kod bolesnika koji imaju povećan hemoragijski rizik, možemo da imamo benefit ukoliko im uskratimo dvojnu antiagregacijnu terapiju. Međutim, kod ovih koji imaju visok trombotični skor, a niza hemoragijski rizik, znači kod ljudi kod kojih je precise DAP skor manji od 25, imamo uglavnom benefit od produžene antiagregacijne terapije. Da bi dokazali tu hipotezu, Timi grupa je sa Harvard univerzitete dizajnirala studiju Pegasus Timi 54, koja je imala za cilj da kod bolesnika koji imaju visok trombotični anizak hemoragijski rizik primjena dvojne antiagregacijone terapije i posle perioda od godinu dana može da donese koristi u smislu smanjenja neželjenih događaja. I u tu svrhu oni su nekih 21.000 bolesnika randomizovali u tri grupe. Jedna je posle godinu dana od akutnog koronarnog sindroma dobijala samo aspirin uz aspirin i placebo. Druga grupa je uz aspirin dobijala 60 mg tikagrelora dva puta dnevno i treća grupa je dobijala 90 mg tikagrelora, odnosno brilika dva puta dnevno. I praćeni su sledećih 12 meseci do 3 godine sa primarnim ciljama efikasnosti s birnom pojavom kardiovaskularne smrtnosti, infarta, miokarda ili šloga, a sa primarnim ciljem bezbednosti definisano po tim i kriterijuma veliko krvarenje. Kriterijum za uključivanje su bili znači povećan trombotični rizik, odnosno bolesnici stariji od 50 godina koji su u pre trenutka randomizacije imali srčani akutni koronarni sindrom za više od jedne do tri godine i koji su bili stariji od 50 godina su bili randomizovani ukoliko su imali bar još jedan od trombotičkih rizika ili starost preko 65 godina ili drugi prethodni infart miokarda, više subodomu koronarnu bolest, diabetes koji zahteva lečenje i smanjen klirens kreatinina, dok su bolesnici koji su imali povećan rizik od krvarenja bili isključeni iz studije. I studija je pokazala nakon praćenja od godinu pa potom i od tri godine, da je pojava 
zbirnog primarnog cilja praćenja, odnosno trombotičnog događaja zbirne pojave kardiovaskularne smrti, infarta, miokarda ili šloga, bila značajno smanjena kod bolesnika koji su dobijali priliku u odnosu na bolesnike koji su dobijali placebo i to je sa relativnom redukcijom rizika od 20%, dok je relativna redukcija mortaliteta bila 30%. Tako da je posle plato studije, koja je bila prva studija koja je dokazala da jedan antiagregacioni lek, brilik, može da smanji mortalitet kod bolesnika sa akutnim koronarnim sindromom, ovo je bila prva studija koja je dokazala da produženo davanje antiagregacionog leka može da dovede do smanjenja mortaliteta. Najveću korist su imali bolesnici koji praktično nisu prekidali primjenu dvojne antiagregacijone terapije, odnosno oni kod kojih je dvojna antiagregacijona terapija nastaljena sa pauzom manje od 30 dana, dok oni koji su imali dužu pauzu su imali nešto manji korisni efekat ove terapije, a cena u smislu pojave velike krvarenja nije bila velika, odnosno nije bilo značajno veće učestalosti fatalnih ili intrakranijalnih krvarenja. Bilo je nešto veće učestalosti tim i velikih krvarenja, ali oni nisu bili životno ugrožavajući, tako da je i bezbednost bolesnika bila zagarantovana. I na osnovu tim i Pegasus tim i 54 studije dati je preporuka da svi bolesnici koji imaju visok trombotični rizik a niza hemoragijski rizik treba da nastave sa primjenom dvojne antiagregacijone terapije, konkretno to su bolesnici stariji od 65 godina koji su imali jedan ili više prethodnih infarta miokarda, diabetes koji zahteva terapiju, hroničnu brubržnu insuficijenciju i višesudovnu koronarnu bolest. Uz to interventni kardiolozi su definisali proceduralne karakteristike PCI i procedure koje su podizale rizik od trombotičnih događaja. Prva takva studija je bila studija Justina, jedna od veoma citiranih studija koja je kao kriterijume za povećani rizik od tromboze isticala lečenje tri krvna suda, više od tri ugrađena stenta, više od tri lečenje lezije, bifurkacije sa više od dva ugrađena stenta, ukupnu dužinu stentova veću od šest santimetra i hronične totalne okluzije, a kasnije su istraživači u sve to dodali i intervencije na venskom aortokoronarnom bajpasu, intervencije na visokotrombotičnim lezijama i intervencije sa korišćenjem rota blatora. I dokazano je da što je više tih proceduralnih protrombotičnih rizika prisutno, to je korist od produžene dvojne antiagregacijone terapije bila veća. Tako da, op, izvinite, tako da ovaj, na osnovu, na osnovu, preskočio sam zaključni slajd sa preporukama, znači preporuke koje su ovaj, adaptirane i koje kažu koje kažu da posljednje preporuke za lečenje koronarne bolesti, preporuke za non-stemi, kažu da svi bolestnici koji imaju visok ili umereno visok trombotični rizik treba da dobiju produženu dvojnu antiagregacijnu terapiju. Oni sa visokim trombotičnim rizikom imaju klasu 2A indikacije, oni sa umereno visokim rizikom imaju klasu 2B Veoma visok rizik su bolesnici koji pored ovih kliničkih karakteristika imaju proceduralne karakteristike, dok je umereno visok rizik imaju bolesnici koji imaju kliničke karakteristike visokog rizika od tromboze, a ugrađen im je jedan kratak stent. Hvala vam na pažnju. Hvala Vlado puno. Sada je otvorena diskusija i na jednu i na drugu temu. Ja sam i zaboravio Marka da pitam da li nam stižu neka pitanja ako ima publike koja je uživo. Ako ne, meni se čini da nisam to, odnosno da sam to shvatio, ali ajde samo onako da proverim, a mislim da je važna stvar. U kom trenutku treba Forsigu uključiti, jer to nikad nije dovoljno rano, ako sam dobro razumio, ali treba da je uključimo kod manje bolesnih ljudi u terapiju ili ih rezervišemo za praktično predvorje terminalne srčane insuficijencije? Pa prosto, kao što smo videli u DAPA HF studiji, znači u samoj studiji je bio veliki procenat pacijenata koji su imali i NIHA klasu 2 njiha klasu 3 takođe i naravno 1% imao njiha klasu 4. 
Dakle, ako već neko ima redukovanu ekcijnu frakciju i srčanu insuficijenciju, on je bolestan poprilično. Znači, prosto ne možemo reći da nije puno bolestan i treba sprečiti napredovanje bolesti, pogoršanje stanja, hospitalizacije. I šta nam je u stvari ova indikacija pružila da ne moramo, čekamo hospitalizaciju, nego jednostavno doziranje i mogućnost dobre komplijanse i adherence, pružena mogućnost da ovaj lek damo i u ambulanti. Tako da prosto ne treba čekati da budu jako, jako dekompenzovani da bi smo razmišljali. Baš naprotiv, treba preduprediti pogoršanje bolesnika. Ne znam, Pero, slažeš? Pa... Nikad nije dovoljno rano i to nam prikazuje ovaj praktično predlog kako će možda nove smernice izgledati, znači jednostavno ne treba da čekamo, treba da budemo proaktivni, da je treba čekamo se stvari desi, već treba krenuti stvarima u susret, tako da praktično mislim da ovo četiri dokaza na grupe lekova koje smo imaju mortalitet, među kojima naravno je zgled jedna inhibitorna stoforksiga, zapravo treba uvesti odma ili u jako kratkom roku, vremenskom roku, čim zapravo diagnostikom osrčanu slabost, odnosno kod onih bolestnika koji imaju diagnostikom osrčanu slabost, a nemaju sve grupe lekova, naravno u zavisnosti od eventualnih kontraindikacija, treba i za izdreba, da, da, znači treba praktično uvesti sve četiri grupe lekova, s tim što kaže metaforkiga se zaista ekstremno lako uvodi, tako da tu nema mnogo opravdanja da to ne uredimo čim pre. Možda je hiruški ovako nedovoljno inteligentno pitanje, je li vama treba endokrinolog da bi uveli forsigu u terapiju ili ne? Nema potrebe. Bilo je u početku, jeste bilo problematično s dve strane, jel tako prvo, izmišljen za endokrinologe, odnosno za lečenje diabetičara i drugi nama takođe veliki problem je bila upravo ta glomerularna filtracija, dakle 60, o čemu smo jako vodili računa u početku. Međutim, sa obzirom da to da se nekako nekim čudom ispostavilo da možemo da dajemo taj lek mnogo široko, ne treba nam endokrinolog u konačnom i perad je pokazao da se rasplašio, je li tako? Utice na hemoglobin na jedan C. U da strah je bio veliki. Da, apsolutno. Pa zato što dobijete u ruki neko oruđe o kome ne znate zapravo toliko mnogo, barem na početku. Ja se nikad neću zaboraviti kad je došao mlada, nastrijen saradnik od mene i kaže čujte ima jako dobar lek kao za srčanu slabost, kao možete ga dajete kod nidebetičari, kod diabetičari i tako dalje. Ja sam bio zaista onako potpuno zapošen, kao pa ja mislim da to ja neću biti u stanju i tako dalje. Međutim, onda vremenom dobijete jako puno dokaza da počete sami da dajete lek i jednostavno na kraju verovatno samo glupi ljudi nemaju pravo da promene mišljenje. Znači ja sam zaista i najiskrenije od potpunog skeptika u konce postao zaista, mogu kažem, slobodno vatrni zagovornik, ne ja, nego jednostavno podaci koji smo pokazali, mislim da ovdje govore za sebe, da jednostavno i kod ne diabetičara ovi lekovi deluju i da jednostavno kardiolozi neće upropastiti kontrol glikemije i ugroziti život bolesniku koliko ove leke uvedu i kod bolesnika koji su na diabetu, a koji imaju dobro regulisanu glikemiju, znači jednostavno on neće, nećemo davati taj lek od tih bolesnika u smislu regulacije glikemije, već u smislu smanjenja kardiovaslovnog rizika. Mislim da je to jako važno znati da je to smanjenje kardiovaslovnog rizika zapravo nezavisno od recimo vrednosti hemoglobina 1C. I lečenja srčane insuficijencije, u stvari to je poenta. A dodatna poenta je upravo ta glomerlorna filtracija koja se kod ovih bolesnika i tekako pogoršava prirodnim potokom bolesti, čak i davanjem većih doza diuretika i tako. Tako da je jako važna ta terapijska širina koju nam pruža ovaj lek. Pa prosto, eto, rasplašili smo se. Da, način na koji smo došli do terapijskog efekta tog leka podsjeća malo na onaj drugi lek kod koji je bio lek za plućnu hipertenziju, a posle se ispostilo da ima neke druge efekte, ali nema veze. Tako je, tako je. Tako je. Pa dobro, Vlado, ili imaš ti još neko pitanje, možda sad ne znam? Pa ja bih možda pitao šta je to što možemo da uradimo da se malo primjena ove terapije proširi u opštoj populaciji, uopšte kod bolestnika koje srčane slabosti. Šta su glavni razlozi što se kod nas još uvek nedovoljno daje forksiga u lečenju srčane slabosti? Mi smo malo pre komentarisali to, kod nas je jedan od problema, osim ovih 
stvari, diabetes, glomerularna filtracija, to smo već usvojili i raščistili, bila i finansijska da strana, ali na sreću, na sreću od novih lekova koji su na našem tržištu, nekako se Forksiga onako podvukla sa manjom cenom i mislim da smo krenuli da je dajemo mnogo slobodnije i da pacijenti nekako imaju mnogo više mogućnosti da kupe ovaj lek, mislim da nije preskupa, a i ne boje se mnogo nežljenih efekata i nije potrebno doziranje, odnosno praćenje, prosto je jednostavna za terapiju. Slaži se? Apsolutno se slažem, ali mi tek manje od dva meseca imamo indikaciju za prezrčanu slabost, tako da mislim da su mi zapravo jako dobri, usvajamo generalno, znači, te neke nove smernice i ja sam, kad sam pravio neko drugo predavanje, recimo za Verice Gort, to je prva velika studija za srčanu slabost gde se saopštava broj bolesnika koji su bili na SGLT2 inhibitorima srčanu slabost. To je studija koja je izašla prošle godine, rađena u Zapadnoj Evropi, 2,7% bolesnika je bilo na SGLT2 inhibitorima. Prema tome, sada postoji indikacija, postoji, mislim, dobra volja pre svega nas, lekara, da dajemo lekove koje su efikasni kod bolesnika nika srčnom slabošću, ali kažem jednostavno sve treba neko vreme, znači jednostavno treba biti strpljiv, treba pričati, treba raditi i mislim da rezultati definitivno neće izostati. Dobro, ili imamo još neko pitanje? Ako ne, ja predlažem da zaključimo sesiju, jer čeka nas još jedna do kraja dana. Još jednom zahvalnost kompanije Astra Zeneka na ovako lepo organizovanom simpozijumu i nadam se da smo nešto svi zajedno naučili. Hvala vam. Hvala.